chapter one of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed chapter one green and blue first night at fellsgarth was always a festive occasion the holidays were over and school had not yet begun all day long from remote quarters fellows had been converging on the dear old place and here they were at last shoulder to shoulder delighted to find themselves back in the old haunts the glorious memories of the summer holidays were common property so was not a little of the pocket money so by rule immemorial were the contents of the hampers and so as they discovered to their cost were the luckless new boys who had to-day tumbled for the first time headlong into the whirlpool of public school life does some one tell me he never heard of fellsgarth i am surprised where can you have been brought up that you have never heard of the venerable ivy-clad pile with its watch-tower and two wings planted there where the rivers shale and shargle mingle their waters a mile or more above hawkswater my dear sir fellsgarth stood there before the days when henry the eighth of whom you may have possibly heard in the history books abolished the monasteries and some wicked people do say annexed their contents there is very little of the old place standing now a piece of the wall in the headmaster's garden and the lower buttresses of the watch-tower that is all the present building is comparatively modern that is to say it is no older than the end of the civil wars when some lucky adherent to the winning side built it up as a manor-house and disfigured the tower with those four pepper casters at the corners successive owners have tinkered the place since then but they cannot quite spoil it who can spoil red brick and ivy in such a situation not no fellsgarth have you never been on hawk's water then with its lonely island and the grey scree swooping down into the clear water and have you never seen hawk's pike which frowns in on the fellows through the dormitory window i don't ask if you have been up it only three persons to my knowledge guides and natives of course excepted have done that york was one mr stratton was another and the other but that's to be part of my story first night as i have said was a specially go-as-you-please occasion at the school masters having called over their roll disappeared into their own quarters and discreetly heard nothing dames having received and unpacked the night-bags retired elsewhere to wrestle with the big luggage the cooks having passably satisfied the cravings of two hundred and fifty hungry souls and having removed out of harm's way the most perishable of the crockery shrugged their shoulders and shut themselves into the kitchens listening to the noise and speculating on the joys of the coming term what a noise it was niagara after the rains or an express train in a tunnel or the north wind in a gale against the hawk's back might be able to beat it but then fellsgarth was not competing each of the fellows was merely chatting pleasantly to his neighbours it was hardly a fair trial and yet it was not bad for the school when dangle who owned the longest ear in the school could not hear a word which brinkman who owned the loudest voice shouted into it it spoke somewhat for what fellsgarth might do in the way of noise if it tried the only two persons who were not actively contributing to the general clamour were the two new boys who sat wedged in among a mass of juniors at one of the lower tables they may have considered that the beating of their hearts was noisy enough but people in this world are slow at hearing other people's hearts beat no one seemed to notice it it is due to the stouter of these two young gentlemen to say that the beating of his heart and the general state of amaze in which he found himself did not interfere greatly with his appetite he had brought that accomplishment if no other from home and not being engaged like those around him in conversation he contrived to put away really a most respectable meal indeed his exploits in this direction had already become a matter for remark among his neighbours 
it's all right said one of the juniors who answered to the name of d'arcy his buttons are sewn on with wire they'll hold i suppose he's made of gutta percha observed another he'll stretch a little more before he's done i say what a bill he's running out by the way what do they charge for this kind of pudding it is a dear kind and nothing like as good as the sort we get for regular i never could understand why they make fellows shell out for what they eat first night it is a swindle said d'arcy solemnly i've had to make a very light meal because i've only half a crown and i'm afraid there won't be much change left out of that the new boy was just laying butter on a roll and preparing to close the proceedings of the meal with a good square turn of bread and butter but as d'arcy's words fell on his ears he suddenly stopped short and looked up i say said he isn't this dinner charged in the house bill then d'arcy laughed derisively well you most be a muff don't you know school doesn't begin till to-morrow they give you dinner to-night but you're not obliged to eat it the new boy took a gulp of water which he calculated would be gratis under any circumstances and then grasped i say i didn't know that d'arcy looked solemn jolly awkward said he what have you had whereupon master ashby the new boy entered on a detailed confession which d'arcy evidently an expert at mental arithmetic totted up as he went along how many times pudding did you say he asked towards the end twice and a bit three and ten i dare say he won't be stiff about the bit three and ten and that roll and butter i've not eaten them no but you've touched them you'll be charged unless you can get a fellow to take them off your hands will you have them asked ashby whereupon there was a laugh at d'arcy's expense which annoyed that young gentleman i don't want your second-hand grub you'd better take it round and see what you can get for it ashby looked at the bread and then glanced round the table no said he i'll have it and pay for it if it comes to that that'll be four bob ashby gave a gulp of despair i've not got so much then you'll get in a jolly row could you lend me one and six i say asked the new boy again d'arcy got the worst of the laugh didn't you hear me say i'd only just got enough to pay for my own but i tell you what you can hide under the table you're not known ashby looked round and felt about with his foot under the table to ascertain what room there might be there then he flushed up no i shan't said he i'd get into the row instead as his eye travelled round and marked the curious smile on every face it suddenly dawned upon him that he had been done his first sensation was one of immense relief he should not have to pay for his dinner after all his second was a cunning device for getting out of the dilemma i thought you'd begin to laugh soon said he to d'arcy i knew you couldn't keep it up d'arcy turned very red in the face and glared at this audacious youngster in deserved wrath what do you mean you young ass you know you've swallowed it all he swallowed all the grub anyhow said another no i've not said master ashby i'd have another go in now i knew he'd have to laugh in the end it was hopeless to deal seriously with a rebel of this sort d'arcy tried to ride off on the high horse but it was not a very grand spectacle and ashby munching up the remains of his roll was generally held to have scored the relief with which he hailed the discovery of his mistake was so genuine and the good spirits and appetite the incident put into him were so imperturbable as to disarm further experiment at his expense and he was left comparatively free to enjoy the noise and imbibe his first impression of fellsgarth in his own way the other new boy meanwhile was not altogether without his difficulties fisher minor to which name this ingenuous young gentleman answered would probably have been the first to pour contempt on the verdure of his companion he had come up to fellsgarth determined that in whatever respect he failed no one should lightly convict him of being green he had wormed out of his brother in the sixth a few hints of what was considered the proper thing at fellsgarth and these with the aid of his own brilliant intellect and reminiscences of what he had read in the books served as he hoped 
both to forewarn and forearm him against all the uncomfortable predicaments into which the ordinary new boy is apt to fall it must be confessed that as he sat and listened to the noise and marked how little fellsgarth appeared to recognize his existence he felt a trifle uneasy and nervous he wasn't sure now that he knew everything all these fellows seemed to be so thoroughly at home and to know so exactly what to do he wished he could do the same he wished for instance he could spin a fork round with his first finger and thumb while he talked as york the captain was doing he did once privately try while he was not talking but it was a dismal failure the fork fell with a great clatter to the floor and attracted general attraction his way he picked the weapon up with as easy an air as he could assume whistling sotto voce to himself as he did it so as to appear unconcerned look out i say you mustn't whistle at meal-times it's bad manners said a voice at his side he turned round and perceived a pleasant-looking youth of the species junior in a red tie and wrist studs to match this youth evidently knew what was what at fellsgarth and a further glance at him convinced fisher minor that he had met him in a good hour for all dinner time he had been exercised as to whether it was the thing to wear the jacket opened or buttoned york wore his buttons so did a good many of the sixth and fisher minor had consequently buttoned up too but his new friend who was pronounced in all his ways and evidently an authority on etiquette wore his open fisher minor therefore furtively slipped his fingers down and opened his coat you're a new kid i suppose said he of the red necktie yes i'm fisher minor what son of fisher the boat builder i didn't know he had one so old no oh no that's my brother up there talking to the duck the who i don't see any ducks i mean york you know the captain why ever do you call him ducks you'd better let him catch you calling him names like that oh you're a brother of old fisher you look it fisher minor was alarmed at the tone in which this observation was made it seemed to imply that fisher major was not quite all that could be desired and yet the younger brother did not exactly know what it was in the elder which called for repudiation however he was spared the pain of deciding by a new voice on his other side what's that wally does this kid say he belongs to fisher oh my stars what form we're coming to fisher minor glanced round and experienced a shock as he did so for the new speaker was so like the last that he was tempted to suppose the latter had suddenly changed seats and contrived to substitute a blue necktie for a red and button his jacket during the feat but when he looked back the owner of the red tie was still in his place after considerable wagging of his head he was forced to admit that he was seated between two different persons why he can't help that said the gentleman addressed as wally fisher minor laughed feebly and really wished his brother would pay a little more attention to the form of course said wally talking across to his twin brother fellows can't tell what asses they look until they're told don't you remember the chap last term who always wore his trousers turned up till the prefects made him turn them down or go on the modern side catch us taking any of your cast-off louts on our side retorted the other brother who evidently belonged to the slighted side yes shocking bad form it was and when he turned them down at last they found seventy-four nibs fifty matches and nobody knows how many candle ends all this time fisher minor with panic at his heart was furiously trying to turn down his trouser ends with his feet what a lucky escape for him to get this warning in time during the walk round the grounds he had turned his ends up and had quite forgotten to put them down again when he came in now no coaxing would get them down without manual assistance he sat clawing with one foot after another lacerating his shins and his garments in vain at length in despair he dropped his fork again and under cover of this diversion attempted to stoop and adjust the intractable folds 
in his flurry he naturally forgot the fork so that when after a minute and a half he emerged without it into the upper world his two companions were not a little perplexed what have you been up to down there do you generally eat your grub under the table asked wally all i can say is it's the best place for him if he wears his hair like that said the other in tones of alarm young kid i never noticed that before what ever induces you to part it on the right did you ever hear of a fellsgarth fellow oh i say what a wigging you'll get look at me and wally and york and all of em phew it makes one ill to see it just look round for yourself as more than half of those present appeared to have no parting at all and most of the rest parted on the left fisher minor realized with horror that he had been guilty of a terrible solecism the alarm depicted in the faces of both the twins was proof enough that the matter was a critical one it was no time for a shuffling he had had enough of that over his trouser ends he must throw himself on the mercy of his critics i quite forgot of course said he hurriedly i i look here said wally hurriedly shoving a pocket comb into his hands you'd better go downstairs again and change it sharp or you'll be spotted cut along so fisher minor began with shame to look once more for his fork and in doing so crawled well under the table and sitting down proceeded nervously and painfully to open up a parting on the left side of his head it was an arduous task and not made easier by the unjustifiable conduct of the twins who having got their man safe under hatches began to kick out in an unceremonious fashion and basely betray his retreat to their friends and neighbours pass him on hack it through where cats was the cry in the midst of which the luckless fisher minor finding a return to his old place effectually barred and wearying of the ceremony of running a gauntlet of all the legs along the table before it was half over made a hasty selection of what seemed to him the mildest pair within reach and clutching at them convulsively hung on for dear life the owner of the limbs in question was ranger a prefect of his house and more or less of a grandee at fellsgarth as he was unaware of the cause of the excitement around him this sudden assault from below took him aback and he started up from his chair in something as near a panic as a fellsgarth prefect could be capable of naturally his parasite followed him to ranger's credit he took in the situation rapidly and did not abuse his opportunities what's this he demanded lifting up fisher minor with his hair all on end and the pocket comb still in his hand by the coat collar who does this belong to no one in particular owned the object in question what are you asked the prefect i'm fisher minor i got under the table somehow so i should suppose afraid of the draughts i suppose it was wally and his brother put me there i didn't mean oh wally was it here young wheatfield you shouldn't leave your property about like this it's against rules here hook on and don't go chucking it about any more all serene said the twin come along kid done with my comb you look ever so much better form now doesn't he you chaps how came you to lose your way downstairs fisher minor owned himself utterly unable to account for the misadventure and discreetly remained silent until the signal was given to return thanks and separate every boy to his own house as he was wandering across the court very dismal and apprehensive of what more was in store for him a lean youth with a pale face and very showily attired accosted him hello kid are you a new chap yes replied fisher minor eyeing the stranger suspiciously what side are you on fisher stared interrogatively well then are you modern or classic i don't know really said fisher minor wishing he knew which he ought to proclaim himself then making a bold venture he said i believe modern good job for you said the youth saves me the trouble of kicking you can you lend me a bob i'll give it you back to-morrow as soon as i've unpacked it did strike fisher minor as queer that any one should pack shillings up in a trunk but he was too pleased to oblige this important and fashionable-looking personage to raise any question yes can you give me change out of a half-crown or you can pay me the lot back to-morrow i shan't be wanting it till then said he 
all serene kid i'm glad you are our side i shall be able to give you a leg up with the fellows whose house are you in wakefield's the same as my brother what then you must be a classic they're all classics at wakefield's why can't you tell the truth when you're asked instead of a howling pack of lies i didn't know really i thought come that's a good one any idiot knows what side he's on at fellsgarth fisher minor was greatly confused to stand convicted thus of greenness you see said he putting on a little side to cover his shame i was bound to be stuck on the same side as my brother you know nice for you not a gentleman among them all paupers and prigs said this young modern waxing eloquent you'll suit them down to the ground considering that fisher minor had just lent the speaker half a crown these taunts struck him as not exactly grateful at the same time he writhed under the reproach and felt convinced that classics were not at all the form at fellsgarth why pursued the other pocketing his coin in order to release his hands for a little elocution we could boy em up twice over the workhouse isn't in it with wakefields there's not a day but they come cadging to us wanting to borrow our tin or our grub or something there look at that chap going across there he's one of em regular casual ward form about him he's the meanest stingiest lout in all fellsgarth why exclaimed fisher minor looking in alarm towards this prodigy of baseness why that's that's fisher my brother the modern youth's jaw fell with a snap and his cheeks lost what little colour they had what why didn't you tell me look here you needn't tell him what i said it was quite between ourselves you know i must be cutting i say see you again some day and he vanished leaving fisher minor considerably more bewildered and poorer by a cool half-crown than he had been five minutes ago End of chapter one chapter two of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot bain reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two lamb's singing wakefield's house as fisher minor entered it under his brother's wing hardly seemed to the new boy as disreputable a haunt as his recent modern friend had led him to expect nor did the sixty or seventy fellows who clustered in the common room strike him as exactly the lowest stratum of fellsgarth society york the captain for instance with his serene well-cut face his broad shoulders and impressive voice hardly answered to the description of a lout nor did ranger of the long legs with speed written in every inch of his athletic figure and gentleman in every line of his face look the sort of fellow to be mistaken for a cad even fisher major about whom the younger brother had been made to feel decided qualms could hardly have been the hail fellow well met he was with everybody had he been all the new boy's informant had recently described him indeed fisher minor when presently he gathered himself together sufficiently to look round him was surprised to see so few traces of the casual ward in his new house true most of the fellows might be poor which of course was highly reprehensible and some of them might not be connected with the nobility which showed a great lack of proper feeling on their part but as a rule they held up their heads and seemed to think very well of themselves and one another while their dress if it was not in every case as fashionable as that of the temporary owner of fisher minor's half-crown was at least passably well fitting fisher minor for all his doubts about the company he was in could not help half envying these fellows as he saw with what glee and self-satisfaction they entered into their own at wakefield's they were all so glad to be back to see again the picture of cain and abel on the wall to scramble for the corner seat in the ingle bench to hear the well-known creak of the middle landing to catch the imperturbable tick of the dormitory clock to see the top of hawk's pike 
looming out down the valley clear and sharp in the falling light fisher minor and ashby as they sat dismally and watched all the fun wondered if the time would ever come when they would feel as much at home as all this it was a stretch of imagination beyond their present capacity to their alarm master wally wheatfield presently recognized them from across the room and came over patronizingly to where they sat hello new kids thinking of your maws and the rocking horses and nurse jane and all that never mind have a good blub it'll do you good considering how near in strict secrecy both the young gentlemen addressed were to the condition indicated by the genial twin this exhortation was not exactly kind they tried to look as if they did not mind it and fisher minor naturally did his best to appear knowing i don't mind said he with a snigger they're all milksops at home i'd sooner be here i wouldn't put in the sturdy ashby i think it's horrid not to see a face you know there you are what did i say screaming for his mammy gibed wally and if i was retorted master ashby warming up she's a lot better worth it than yours so now master wally naturally fired up at this such language was hardly respectful from a new junior to an old i'll pull your nose new kid if you cheek me and i'll pull yours if you cheek my mother boo boo poor baby who's cheeking your mother i wouldn't cheek her with a pair of tongs something better to do i say are both you kids classics yes they replied i thought you must be moderns you're both so precious green all right there'll be lambs singing directly then you'll have to sit up what's lambs singing said ashby don't you know replied wally glad to have recovered the whip-hand it's this way every new kid has to sing in his house the first night you'll have to oh faltered ashby i can't i don't know anything can't get out of it you must said the twin charmed to see the torture he was inflicting so must you hair parting fisher minor was too knowing a hand to be caught napping he had had the tip about lamb singing from his brother last term and was prepared he joined in therefore against ashby what didn't you know that kid you must be green i knew it all along that's all right said wheatfield now i'm going i can't fool away all my evening with you by the way mind you don't get taking up with any modern kids it's not allowed and you'll get it hot if you do my young brother each twin was particularly addicted to casting reflections on his brother's age is a modern don't you have anything to do with him and whatever you do don't lend any of them money or there'll be a most awful row that's why we always call up subscriptions for the house clubs on first night it cleans the fellows out and then they can't lend any to the moderns you'll have to shell out pretty soon as soon as lamb singing is over ta ta this last communication put fisher minor in a terrible panic he had evidently committed a gross breach of etiquette in lending that modern boy whose name he did not even know a half-crown and now when the subscriptions were called for he would have to declare himself before all wakefields a pauper i say said he to ashby dropping the patronizing for the pathetic could you ever lend me half a crown i've i've lost mine i'll pay it you back next week faithfully i've only got five bob said ashby to last all the term and half a crown of that will go in the clubs to-night but you'll get it back in a week really you will pleaded fisher minor and i'll but here there was a sudden interruption every one from the captain down looked towards the new boys and a shout of lamb singing headed by wally wheatfield left little doubt as to what it all meant pass up the new kids down there called one of the prefects whereupon fisher minor and ashby rather pale and very nervous were hustled up to the top of the room where sat the grandees in a row round the table on which the sacrifice was to take place 
for the benefit of the curious it may be explained that lamb singing the name applied to the musical performances of new boys at fellsgarth on first night is supposed to have derived its title from the frequency with which these young gentlemen fell back upon mary had a little lamb as their theme on such occasions isn't one of them your minor asked york of fisher senior yes said the latter rather apologetically the one with the light hair he's not much to look at the fact is i only know him slightly they say at home he's a nice boy does he spend much of his time under tables as a rule asked granger recognizing the lost property which had hung on to his legs at dinner-time if so i'll take the other one for my fag he's bagged already said denton fisher and i put our names down for him an hour ago well that's cool if fisher wanted a fag he might as well have taken his own minor fisher major knew better said the gentleman in question it might raise awkward family questions if i had him wouldn't it be fairer to toss up suggested the captain or i don't mind swapping wally wheatfield for him if you really ranger laughed no thank you i draw the line at wally i wouldn't deprive you of him for the world i suppose i must have this youngster let's hear him sing first yes lamb singing now you two one at a time who's first alphabetical order ashby with an inward groan mounted the rostrum if anything could have been more cruel than the noise which greeted his appearance it was the dead silence which followed it fellows sat round staring him out of countenance with critical faces and rejoicing in his embarrassment what's the title demanded some one i don't know any songs said ashby presently and i can't sing ho ho we've heard that before come forge ahead i only know the words of one that my con somebody i know sings called the vigil i don't know the tune that doesn't matter out with it so ashby pulling himself desperately together plunged recklessly into the following appropriate ditty which failing its proper tune he manfully set at the top of his voice and with all the energy he was capable of to the air of the vicar of bray the stealthy night creeps o'er the lee my darling haste away with me beloved come i see where i stem with arms outstretched upon the strand the night creeps on my love is late o oh, love my love i wait i wait the soft wind sighs mid crag and pine haste o oh, my sweet be mine be mine this spirited song the last two lines of which were aught up as a chorus fairly brought down the house and ashby much to his surprise found himself famous he had no idea he could sing so well or that the fellows would like the words as much as they seemed to do yet they cheered him and encored him and yelled the chorus till the roof almost fell in bravo shouted every one the captain himself included as he descended from the table that's a ripping song that sends up the price of our fag i fancy said denton to his chum your young brother won't beat that next man in shouted wheatfield hustling forward fisher minor now kid lamb it on and show them what you can do title title cried the meeting now if truth must be told fisher minor had come to fellsgarth determined that whatever else he failed in he would make a hit at lamb's singing he had made a careful calculation as to what sort of song would go down with the company and at the same time redeem his reputation from all suspicion of greenness and he flattered himself he had hit upon the exact article oh said he with an attempt at off-hand swagger in response to the demand it's a comic song called oh no it disconcerted him a little to see how seriously everybody settled down to listen and how red his brother's face turned as he took a back seat among the seniors never mind wait till they heard his song that would fetch them 
he had carefully studied not only the song but the appropriate action as he knew perfectly well there is one invariable attitude for a comic song the head must be tilted a little to one side one eyebrow must be raised and the opposite corner of the mouth turned down one knee should be slightly bent the first finger and thumb of one hand should rest gracefully in the waistcoat pocket and the other hand should be free for gesture all these points fisher minor attended to now as carefully as his nervousness would permit and felt half amused at the thought of how comic the fellows must think him do you he began but at this point ranger unfeelingly interrupted and put the vocalist completely out did you say oh no or how now oh no repeated the singer you mean how now oh no it's oh no thanks sorry to interrupt fire away fisher tried to get himself back into attitude and began again in a thin treble voice do you think i'm just as green as grass oh no do you take me for a silly ass oh no do you think i don't know a from b do you think i can't tell he from she do you think i swallow all i see oh no not me he was bewildered by the unearthly silence of his audience no one stirred a muscle except wheatfield who was apparently wiping away a tear was the song too deep for them or perhaps he did not sing the words distinctly or perhaps they had laughed and he had not noticed at any rate he would try the next verse which was certain to amuse them he looked as droll as he could and by way of heightening the effects stuck his two thumbs into the armholes of his waistcoat and wagged his hands in time with the song do you think i lie abed all day oh no do you guess i skate on ice in may oh no do you think i can't tell what is what do you think i don't know pepper's hot or whereabouts my eyes to dot oh no no rot as he concluded fisher minor summoned up enough resolution to shake his head and lay one finger to his nose in the most approved style of comedy and then awaited the result fellows apparently did not take in that the song was at an end for they neither cheered nor smiled so fisher minor made an elaborate bow to show it was all over the result was the same a gloomy silence prevailed in the midst of which the singer never more perplexed in his life descended from the table and proceeded to look out for the congratulations of his admirers beautiful song said wally still mopping his face i never thought i could be so touched by anything we generally get comic songs on first night this is a comic one said fisher minor go on said wheatfield tell that to d'arcy here he'll believe you eh d'arcy d'arcy looked mysterious it's no laughing matter young wheatfield said he in a loud whisper evidently intended for the eager ears of fisher minor i heard york just now ask denton if he thought fisher's minor was all there denton seemed quite cut up and said he hadn't known it before but it must be a great family trouble to the fishers it accounted for fisher major's frequent low spirits you know continued d'arcy confidentially i can't help myself thinking it's a little rough on fisher major for his people to send a minor who's afflicted like this to fellsgarth they might at least have put him on the modern side he'd have been better understood there this speech fisher minor listened to with growing perplexity was d'arcy in jest or earnest he seemed to be in earnest and the serious faces of his listeners looked like it too had the captain really made that remark to denton suppose there was something in it suppose without his knowing he was really a little queer in his head his people might have told him of it and fisher major his brother even he hadn't heard of it oh dear oh dear how was he ever to recover his reputation for sanity whatever induced him to sing that song poor fisher minor devoutly wished himself home again within reach of his mother's soothing voice and his sister's smiles they understood him these fellows didn't they knew he was not an idiot these fellows didn't 
further reflection was cut short by a loud call to order and cheers as york the captain rose to his feet every one liked york as captain of the school even the moderns looked up to him and were forced to admit that he was a credit to fellsgarth in wakefield's his own house he was naturally an idol prodigious stories were afloat as to his wisdom and his prowess examiners were reported to have rent their clothes in despair at his answers and at football rumour had it that once in one of the outmatches against ridgemore he had run the ball down the field with six of the other side on his back and finished up with a drop at the goal from thirty yards but his popularity in his own house depended less on these exploits than on his general good nature and incorruptible fairness he scorned to hit an opponent when he was down and yet he would knock down a friend as soon as a foe if the credit of the school required it a few indeed there were whose habit it was to sneer at york for being what they called a saint the captain of fellsgarth would have been the last to claim such a title for himself yet those who knew him best knew that in all he did even in the common concerns of daily school life he relied on the guidance and help of a divine friend and was not ashamed to own his faith the one drawback to his character in the eyes of certain of his fellow prefects and others at wakefield's was that in the standing feud between classics and moderns he would take no part he demanded the allegiance of all parties on behalf of the school and if any man refused it york was the sort of person who would make it his business to know the reason why now as he got up and waited for the cheers to cease no one could deny that he wasn't as fine a captain as wakefield's could expect to see for many a day and for the first time some of those who even feared him realized with a qualm that this was the last first night on which he would be there to make the usual speech gentlemen he said we are all glad to be back in the old place cheers at any rate i am loud cheers on first night as you know we always combine business with pleasure we have just had the pleasure laughter in the midst of which fisher minor pricked up his ears and wondered if his song wasn't going to be appreciated after all the lambs have bleated and done their level best i'm sure renewed laughter and cries of how now now for the business gentlemen the house clubs demand your support fisher minor turned deadly green as he remembered the modern boy and his half-crown he looked round wildly for ashby but ashby was standing between wally and darcy and the proximity was not encouraging for fisher's purpose the idea occurred to him of appealing to his brother but fisher major pen in hand sat at the receipt of custom and he dared not approach we hope there will be no shirking every fellow in the house is expected to back up the clubs if the house clubs are not kept up to the mark the school clubs are sure to go down cheers we don't ask much the seniors pay five shillings the middle boys three shillings sixpence and the juniors two shillings sixpence fisher minor glanced frantically in the direction of the door and began to edge that way now gentlemen one word more you know last term there was a lot of bad blood between classics and moderns great cheers and three groans for the moderns of course it's open to any idiot who likes to make a fool of himself and quarrel with anybody he likes he's welcome to do it up to a certain point if it gives him pleasure but i want to say this and i'd say it if the whole of the school was here that if these rows once begin to interfere with the honour of the school in sports or anything else as they nearly did last term the fellows who indulge in them will be dropped on pretty heavily no matter what side or what house they belong to the captain looked so uncommonly like meaning what he said that darcy who had already made an appointment to fight lickford a modern boy at the three oaks before breakfast to-morrow quailed under his eye and wondered if he could with dignity scratch the engagement a general movement towards the table at which fisher major sat with his pen and account book followed the captain's speech of all the company present only one failed to enroll himself 
he was a new boy called fisher minor who evidently worn out by the fatigues of the day and unversed in the etiquette of first night had sought the dame at a somewhat early hour and received her permission to go to bed such at least was that lady's version when fisher major having missed his minor made inquiries respecting his absence best thing he could do to make himself scarce after such a performance said the elder brother to denton who accompanied him yes indeed i envy ranger his fag it's a lucky thing we bagged the other one in time the young donkey couldn't be in better hands said fisher but i say den didn't the captain come down rather heavy with his thunder to-night what does it all mean rouse i expect said denton he's not going to stand what went on last term and i'm jolly glad of it we must back him up if he means i'm not to feel inclined to kick dangle whenever i see him i can't promise him much dangle's a good quarter mile man and a good long stop if your kicking him prevents his playing for the school you'll have to mind your eye my boy that's what he means oh grunted fisher major i suppose the rows will begin to-morrow when we elect the officers for the school clubs those fellows are sure to want to stick their own men in at any rate you're safe enough for treasurer old man but come i'm dead sleepy to-night time enough for rows to-morrow and the next day End of chapter 2chapter three of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot bain reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three canvassing when fisher major woke early next morning he had the curious sensation of something on his mind without knowing what it was he was not out of sorts the private supper of which he ha and denton and ridgeway had partaken last night in ranger's study had been wholesome if miscellaneous ranger's people had given him a hamper to bring back containing a good many good things cake biscuits potted meats jam worcester sauce pickles coffee and other groceries intended to diversify the breakfasts of the half by some error of judgment this valuable article of luggage had come from town in the van where it had apparently been placed at the very bottom of the baggage the consequence was that when it came to be opened its several ingredients were found to have got loose and fused together in a most hopeless way jam and pickles and liebig's extract and moist sugar were indistinguishable the only thing seemed to be to attack the concoction en masse without needless delay and to that end ranger had summoned the assistance of his friends and neighbours fisher major was unable to attribute any part of the weight on his mind to this perfectly wholesome and homely refreshment what was it it was not denton he had come back as loyal and festive as ever threatening to work hard this half and determined to have fisher major as his guest at the rectory on the lake for the christmas back nor was it the captain's speech last night that bothered him true it was not altogether conciliatory to those who like fisher major were resolved to have no truce with the enemy of course it was the right thing for york to say but york knew as well as anybody that the classics meant to keep their house cock house at fellsgarth nor was it the accounts although fisher minor had to own to himself he was not a grand hand at finance and that if he was appointed treasurer of the school clubs as well as of his house clubs he would have his work cut out for him to keep both funds clear and solvent what then was it his young brother he supposed it must be the young donkey had made a bad beginning at fellsgarth which was bad enough but had the elder brother done quite the decent thing in half disowning him and letting him run on his fate in the way he had 
a little brotherly backing up a word or two of warning and if needs be a little timely intimidation might have made all the difference to the youngster and would not have done the senior much harm yes it was the precious minor of his who was on fisher major's mind it was too late of course to pick up the milk already spilled but it might be worth while to give him a word of admonition as to his future conduct with this view he sent ashby who with all the alacrity of a brand-new fag punctually presented himself for orders before getting up bell had ceased ringing to summon fisher minor to his brother's room well kid said the elder brother commencing his toilet how did you get on sleep well middling said fisher minor some of the fellows had put pepper on the blankets and it got into my eyes that's all it's a good job they did nothing worse well said fisher minor who was evidently in a limp state and had not at all enjoyed his night they did tease a good deal humph who did well there was that boy they call stop said fisher major turning round fiercely in the middle of brushing his hair do you mean to say you don't know that it's only cads who sneak about one another but you asked me of course i did and made sure you wouldn't let out i hope they'll give you a few more lively nights to teach you better the young brother's lips gave an ominous quiver at this unfeeling speech and he horrified fisher major by betraying imminent symptoms of tears look here joy said the senior rather more soothingly you've made a jolly bad start and that can't be helped the mistake you made is in thinking you know everything whereas you're about as green as they make them why ever do you pretend not to be look at that other new kid the other one who sang he's green too but bless you it's no crime and all the fellows take to him because he doesn't put on side like you why that song you sang oh my stars what on earth put that rot into your head this finished up poor fisher minor the recollection of his performance last night was more than he could stand and he began to whimper come old chap said fisher major kindly patting him on the shoulder perhaps it is not all your fault i suppose i ought to have given you a leg up and prevented you making a fool of yourself you'll get on right enough if you don't swagger and in any case don't blubber i shall never get on here said the new boy all the fellows are against me besides i didn't know it was wrong and oh tom i lent a fellow half a crown and now i've nothing to pay for the clubs fisher major laughed i thought from your tones you were going to confess a murder at least you'd better look alive and get the half-crown back that's just it i lent it in the dark to a a, a modern chap and i don't know his name upon my honour joey you are a well it's no good saying what you are i hope you'll see your money again that's all fisher minor groaned would you ever mind lending me half a crown for the clubs just this once he pleaded very convenient arrangement i suppose i shall have to at least i'll mark you as paid and if you've not got back what you've lent your friend before i have to shell out i shall have to pay it for you thanks tom you're an awful brick said the younger brother brightening up rapidly i say i wish i could be your fag couldn't i rangers bragged you you'll get on better with him than me he won't stand as much nonsense as i might there he is calling cut along and don't go making such an ass of yourself again you'll have to get on the best you can with your fellows i can't interfere with them unless they break rules you know you can come in here of course any time you like and if you want a leg up with preparation and rangers busy you may as well do your work here after this fisher major felt a little easier in his conscience and was able to face the tasks of the day with a lighter mind than if he had had the care of his minor upon it all the time the school-work of the day was not particularly onerous 
dr ringwood the headmaster held a sort of reception of the sixth and delivered as was his wont a little lecture on the work to be taken up during the ensuing half interspersed with a few sarcastic references to the work of the previous half and one or two jokes which scoffers like ridgway used to say must have cost him many serious hours during the holidays to develop aristophanes said the headmaster after calling attention to the particular merits of the greek play to be undertaken did not write solely for the sixth form of a public school i am afraid some of you last term thought that euripides did he will require more than usual attention i am sure he can easily receive it i would not if i were you boys be too chary this term of extra work some of you are almost painfully conscientious in your objection to overdo a particular study aristophanes is an author with whom liberties may safely be taken in this respect the test of a good classical scholar remember is not the work he is obliged to do but what he is not obliged to do his extra work i advise you not to be afraid to try it the sanatorium has been unusually free of cases of over pressure lately a quarter of an hour's extra work a day by the sixth is not at all likely to tax its capacity etc this was the doctor's pleasant style delivered with a severe face and downcast eyes then ensued a little lecture to the prefects on their duties and responsibilities which was respectfully listened to to judge by it such a thing as any rumour of dissensions between rival sides and houses in the school had never reached his ears and yet the knowing one said the doctor knew better than the captain himself everything that went on in fellsgarth and could at any moment lay his hand on an offender but he preferred to leave the police of the place to his head boys and on the whole it was perhaps better for the school that he did to a larger or less degree the other forms classic and modern were lectured in similar strains by their respective masters the new boys among the junior division were perhaps the only ones who listened attentively to what mr stratton the young cheery athlete who presided over their studies had to say and even the irrespectful admiration was a good deal distracted by the babble of voices which was going on all around them never mind him said d'arcy he's a kid of a master and don't know any better it's all rot bless you we get the same thing d'arcy said the master suddenly i was recommending the value of extra work especially for clever boys perhaps you will try the experiment with fifty lines of virgil by this time to-morrow there you are said d'arcy appealing to his neighbours didn't i tell you he talked rot did you ever hear such a stale joke as that the two new boys were tremendously impressed by this sudden swoop of vengeance and gazed open-mouthed at the master for the rest of the class stealing only now and again a hasty glance at d'arcy to see how he was bearing up against his sore afflictions d'arcy to do him justice appeared to be bearing up very well he was in truth engaged in a mental calculation as to how he could most economically job out the impositions which usually fell to his share if his countenance now and then brightened as he met the awestruck gaze of the two new boys it was because in them he thought he discerned a lively hope of solving the problem creditably to himself and not unprofitably to them come along said he as soon as the class was released let's get out into the fresh air and have a cool hullo wally as the owner of that name trotted up what's up up said wally in tones of injured innocence one would think you didn't know it was school club elections on in an hour and all the chaps to whip up if the moderns turn up in force it'll be touch and go if they don't carry every man i can't stop now mind you bring those kids and off he went with all the importance of captain's fag on his electioneering tour wally's right said d'arcy it'll be a close shave to carry our men you see kids added he condescendingly it's just this way 
the moderns are going to try to carry the clubs to-day and if they do the whole of us aren't going to stand it and there'll be such a jolly row in fellsgarth as well wait till you see this sounded very awful fisher minor would have liked to know what sort of clubs were to be carried but did not like to ask ashby however more honest demanded further particulars i don't know what you mean said he don't suppose you do whose fault is that all you've got to do is to yell for our side and vote for our men that seems simple enough if darcy would only vouchsafe to tell them when to begin come along said the latter we've half an hour yet to canvass you know wally's and my study yes all right now you pointing to ashby you hang outside that door that's the modern miners class collar one of them as they come out or two if you can and fetch em up to my room you pointing to fisher minor go and prowl about the kids gymnasium and fetch any one with a blue ribbon on his hat as many as you can bag i'm going to see if i can find some of em near the tuck shop kick twice on my door and say bulbous so that i shall know it's you go on off you go don't muff it whatever you do or it'll be your fault if fellsgarth goes to pot ashby whose uncle was an m p had had some little experience in general elections but he never remembered canvassing of this kind before however darcy had an authoritative air about him and as the school was evidently in peril and there was no suspicion of practical joking in the present case he marched off sturdily to the modern miners classroom and sheltering himself conveniently behind the door waited the turn of events he had not to wait long he could hear the master announcing the lesson for preparation and the general shuffle which precedes the dismissal of a class then his heart beat a little faster as he distinguished footsteps and heard the unsuspecting enemy approaching his way now ashby although a new boy was man enough to calculate one or two things one was that his best chance was either to attack the head or the tail of the procession and secondly that as the head boys in a form are usually those nearest the front and conversely the lowest are usually nearest to the door the smallest boys would probably be the first to come out for all of which reasons he decided to make his swoop at once and if possible abscond with his booty before the main body arrived on the scene the event justified his shrewdness the moment the door opened two small moderns scampered out clean into the arms of the expectant kidnapper who before they had time so much as to inquire who he was or what he wanted had a grip on the coat collar of each and was racing them as hard as their short legs could carry them across the grass let go you cad squeaked one presently what are you doing it's only fun said ashby encouragingly come along the other prisoner was more practical he tried to bite his captor's hand and when he failed in that he tried to kick but though he succeeded better in this the pace was kept up and the grip on his collar if anything tightened whereupon he attempted to sit down but that though it retarded the progress was still insufficient to arrest it the pace dropped to a quick walk and in due time greatly to ashby's relief the portal of wakefield's was reached here of course all was safe if any of the few boys hanging about had been inclined to concern themselves in the affair the colour of the ribbon on the victim's hats was quite sufficient reason for allowing the law to take its course and ashby who began to grow very tired of his burden which insisted on sitting down on either side all the way upstairs arrived at length at messrs darcy and wally's door without challenge he had no need to knock or say bulbous as the room was empty the other canvassers had evidently not yet returned with a sigh of relief he deposited his loads on the carpet and locked the door let us go you cad yelled the prisoners what do you want bringing us here into this place for fun said ashby you'll know presently 
if you don't let us out we'll yell till a master comes will you we're used to yelling here yell away it'll do you good to the credit of the two voters they did their best and made such a hideous uproar that ashby began to grow uneasy and was immensely relieved when presently he heard outside a sound as of coals being carelessly carried up the staircase some one was evidently coming up with a good load ashby was prudent enough not to open the door till an irregular double kick and a breathless cry of bulbous look sharp apprised him that another of the electioneering agents had returned he then cautiously opened the door and in tumbled d'arcy gasping yet triumphant under the weight of three fractious youngsters bully for us said he surveying the harvest five for our side jolly well done of you kid you're a stunner two of mine are new kids they came easy enough but the others a regular badger the badger in question seemed determined to maintain his reputation for he flew upon his captor calling upon his fellow-prisoners to do the same all but the new boys obeyed and the two canvassers were very hard put to it for a while and might have fared yet worse had not d'arcy astutely hung out a flag of truce look here said he i never knew such idiots as you modern kids are here i've done my best to be friends and invited you to a spread in my room and now you won't even let me go to the cupboard and get out the black currant jam and cake you're telling crams that's not why you brought us here you're a howling yes really said d'arcy in quite a friendly tone cry pox for one minute and if i don't hand out the things you may go honour bright i've a good mind to kick you out without giving you anything the caged animal sullenly fell back and eyed the cupboard which d'arcy leisurely opened a row of half a dozen pots on a top shelf a segment of a plum cake and something that looked very like honey in the comb met their greedy eyes there you are said d'arcy what did i tell you they belong to wally he'll be here directly you'll be all right all except you said he singling out his principal assailant you don't know how to behave like these other kids i shall advise wally not to waste any of his stuff on you i didn't know it was a feast said the youth much softened i thought you were only humbugging really i did i've a good mind to do what you think you'd better mind your eye i can tell you i wish wally would come there's five o'clock striking i'll go and look for him ashby you see if he's in the library you kids stay here and lock the door and don't let anybody in but wally do you hear if you do you'll get it pretty hot for being out of your house and look here if wally doesn't come by half-past you can help yourselves thanks awfully said the party mind honour bright you don't touch a thing till the clock strikes the half when you've done stay here till one of us comes to fetch you and we'll see you safe out don't go without as our chaps are awfully down on moderns this term and you'll get flayed alive if they've seen you come in they'll try to get at you be sure so lock yourselves in whatever you do and don't make the room in too great a mess come along ashby let's look for wally cut hard said he as soon as they stood outside and had heard the lock within duly turn we've only just time to get over that's five votes lost to their side real good business i wonder where the other new kid is he was bound to make a mess of it that's why i sent him to the gymnasium it's closed to-day hooray for the cock-house shouted ashby as side by side with his now admiring patron he entered the school hall where the ceremony of club elections was just beginning at the door they encountered wheatfield such games whispered d'arcy clapping him joyously on the back we've got five modern kids boxed up in our room waiting for the clock to strike the half hour before they have a tuck in at our empty jam pots ha ha said wheatfield splendid joke and vanished d'arcy's countenance suddenly turned pale as he gripped his companion by the arm what's the matter inquired ashby alarmed for his friend's health what's up it's all up we're regularly done my that is a go whatever do you mean why you blockhead didn't you see that was the wrong wheatfield not wally but the modern one and now he's gone to let those chaps out and we're clean done for phew what is to be done 
groaned ashby almost as pale as his friend end of chapter three chapter four of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four a close election ever since certain well-meaning governors two years ago had succeeded in forcing upon fellsgarth the adoption of a modern side the school had been rent by factions whose quarrels sometimes bordered on civil war when people squabble about the management of a school outside the boys are pretty sure to quarrel and take sides against one another inside the old set consisting mostly of the classical boys felt very sore on the question it was a case of sentiment not argument if boys said they wanted to learn science and modern languages let them but don't let them come fooling around at fellsgarth and spoiling the reputation of a good old classical school there were plenty of schools where fellows could be brought up in a new-fangled way let them go to one of these and leave fellsgarth in peace to her dead authors the boys who used such arguments it is fair to say were not always the most profound classical scholars most of them like darcy and wally wheatfield had a painful acquaintance with the masterpieces of old-world literature in the way of impositions but their their interests frequently ended the upper classical boys however though not so noisily hostile had their own strong opinions about the new departure and when it was discovered that the new modern side had not only alienated one or two of their old comrades but so far from being apologetic were disposed to claim equal rights with and in certain cases superior privileges to the old boys the relations became strained all round as it happened the modern set consisted of a number of moderate athletes who could not be wholly ignored in the school sports and had no intention of being ignored and to add to their crimes they numbered among them a good number of rich boys who boasted in public of their wealth with a freedom which was particularly aggravating to the classical seniors who were for the most part boys to whose parents money was an important consideration as has been said the rivalry had been growing acute all last term and but for york's determined indifference it might long ago have come to a rupture now every one felt that at any moment the peace might be broken and civil war break out between the two sides at fellsgarth the school clubs offered a rare opportunity for an exhibition of party feeling for they were the common ground on which every one was bound to meet every one else on level terms by an old rule every member of the house clubs was a member of the school clubs and had the privilege of electing the committee and officers for the year it was this business which brought together the crowd that flocked into the hall to-day and it was in view of this critical event that mr darcy had carefully shut up five voters of the other side in his study until the election should be over whatever's to be done asked ashby with blank countenance nobody but a born idiot would begin to ask riddles just now retorted darcy surlily shut up that's what's to be done i expect it will be all right persisted the dogged ashby venturing on a further remark they won't let him in if he's not wally or if they do they'll go for him i hope they will anyhow we've done our best stick near the door we may be able to bundle a few of em out before the voting comes on look out york speaking yell as hard as you can whereupon ashby lay his head back and yelled until darcy kicked him and told him it was time to shut up 
york was moving a resolution that the captains vice-captains secretaries and treasurers of each house should form the school sports committee whose business it would be to arrange matches keep the ground make rules and generally organize the athletics of fellsgarth he hoped every one would agree to this clapperton the modern captain and head of forder's house rose to second the motion howl away said d'arcy nudging his protege whereupon ashby held on to a desk and howled till the windows shook that'll do shouted d'arcy in his ear after a moment or two and ashby thankful for the relief shut off steam and awaited his next orders clapperton was a big smirking fellow rather loudly dressed with a persuasive voice and what was intended to be a condescending manner some fellows could never make out why clapperton did not go down in fellsgarth he tried to be civil he was lavish with his pocket-money and always disclaimed any desire to quarrel with anybody and yet no one oared for him while of course the out-and-out champions of the rival side hated him he seconded with pleasure the motion of his friend york cheek exclaimed d'arcy sotto voce what business has he to call our captain his friend this was the old rule of fellsgarth and a very good rule it meant hard work but he was always glad to do what he could for the old school it always riled the classics to hear a modern talking about the old school and their backs went up at this he had been on this committee two years now and had had the pleasure in a humble way of helping the clubs through one or two of their financial difficulties and he should be glad to serve again he seconded the motion it was a trial to one or two who had listened to see that the names were being put to the vote by york en bloc without giving them the chance of voting against anybody never mind their chance for that would come the next business was the election of captain of the clubs and of course york was chosen by acclamation no one dared oppose him even his friend clapperton who had the pleasure of proposing him was sure every one would be as glad as he would to see his fellow-captain oh how the classics squirmed and ground their teeth at the expression at the head of the clubs the pent-up feelings of d'arcy and those of his way of thinking found some relief in the demonstration which accompanied the carrying of this resolution it was too good a chance to be lost and for three minutes by the clock the classics stood on their feet and cheered their champion glaring defiantly as they did so at the moderns who having held up their hands and cheered a little relapsed into silence and left the noise in the hands of the other side then followed the election of vice-captain which of course had to go to clapperton this time the moderns had their demonstration amid the silence of the classics who thought they had never in their lives seen fellows make such asses of themselves it was twenty minutes past the hour and d'arcy and ashby were both getting uncomfortable and impatient what did these modern idiots want to waste the time of everybody by standing there and bellowing it was scandalous shut up go on to the next vote they cried but in vain the moderns were going to have their full share if not a little more of the row and to stop them before their time was hopeless disgusting exhibition isn't it said d'arcy never mind hello i say there's some one at the door it's those chaps no it was only fisher minor who having waited meekly all this time outside the deserted gymnasium now ventured like a degenerate casa bianca to desert his post and come and see what was going forward in the hall as he tried to enter a modern boy seeing by his ribbon that he was on the wrong side put his foot against the door and tried to turn him back but his little plot dismally failed for d'arcy and ashby shocked and horrified witnesses of this scandalous act of corruption came to the rescue with a hubbub which even made itself heard above the shouting let him in howling cheat he's trying to shut out one of our side yaboo that's the way you elect your men is it come in fisher minor let him in do you hear all right come on you fellows and kick this modern chap out for a wretched sneak that'll be seven off their side counting wheatfield and one more to us bully ya cheats turn em out amid such cries of virtuous indignation fisher minor was hauled in and his obstructor by the same coup de main excluded 
fisher minor might have had his head turned by this triumphal entry had he not recognized in the ejected modern boy the gentleman to whom he had lent his half-crown on the previous evening any reminder of yesterday's misfortunes was depressing to him and his joy at finding himself on the right side of the door now was decidedly damped by the knowledge that his half-crown was on the wrong however there was no time for explanations as the shouting had ceased and an evidently important event was about to take place this was the appointment of treasurer for whom each of the rival sides had a candidate that of the classics being fisher major and that of the moderns brinkman of forder's house a particular enemy of the other side and reputed to be rich and no gentleman both candidates were briefly proposed and seconded by boys of their own side and both having declared their intention of going to the vote a show of hands was demanded the excitement of our young friends at the end of the hall while this tedious operation was in progress may well be imagined the captain had sternly ordained silence during the voting so that all they could do was to hold up their hands to the very top of their reach and keep a wild lookout that they were being counted and that none of the enemy was in any way moral or physical circumventing them as for fisher minor he simply trembled with excitement as he cast his eyes round and calculated his brother's chances he could not comprehend how any one could dare not to vote for fisher major and absorbed in that wonder he continued to hold up his hand long after the two tellers had agreed their figure and the captain had ordered hands down fisher major one hundred and twenty-seven votes now hands up for brinkman phew said d'arcy fanning himself with his handkerchief it'll be a close shave i say we'd better lean up hard against the door it'll keep out the draughts they've got it i'm afraid said ashby looking round at the forest of hands we hadn't as many as that i say that cad brinkman is voting for himself said some one what a shame my brother didn't he's too honourable said fisher minor hullo how now you there cried wally whereupon amid great laughter fisher minor retired modestly behind the rest the counting seemed interminable and every moment to the guilty ears of ashby there seemed to be a sound of footsteps without at last however the cry hands down came once more and you might have heard a pin drop fisher major one hundred and twenty seven votes brinkman one hundred and twenty two fisher is elected amid the terrific classic cheers which greeted this announcement d'arcy and ashby exchanged glances those five voters waiting patiently in wally's room for the clock to strike the half hour would have turned the scale ashby wished the majority had been greater or less but he tried to be jubilant and in response to d'arcy's thumps on the back yelled and roared till he was black in the face as he did so he caught sight through the window of a small procession of five or six boys emerging from the door of wakefield's house and starting at a trot in the direction of the hall i say shouted he in d'arcy's ear here they come d'arcy abruptly ceased shouting and descended from his form come and squash up near the front said he hurriedly more room you know up there hoo hoo nearly licked that time shouted a modern youth near the door as they moved forward served you right never mind we'll take it out of you next vote retorted d'arcy come on kid squash up then a happy thought struck him the boys immediately near the door were mostly moderns what a fine bit of electioneering if he could get them to shut out their own men so he shouted look out our side mind they don't keep out any of our chaps just the sort of dodge they'd be up to whereupon the moderns set their backs determinedly against the door and wagged their heads at one another and were obliged to d'arcy for the tip that'll do for em said that delighted schemer they won't let em in you bet look out they're going to vote for secretary now the classical side candidate for this important office was ranger almost as great an idol in his house as the captain himself his modern opponent was dangle a clever senior reputed to be clapperton's toady and man of all work it was felt that if he were secretary there would be a strong modern bias given to the clubs which in the opinion of the classic partisans would be disastrous the show of hands had been taken for ranger and every one was silent to hear the figures when a hideous clamour arose at the door with shouts of open the door let us in cheats fair play to 
d'arcy's satisfaction as from the safe shelter of a front place he peered down that way the moderns held their post at the door and refused to let it open for a minute it looked as if they would succeed when suddenly the irate wally appeared on the scene followed by fisher minor and shouting cheats cads let our fellows in went for the obstructionists stupid ass growled d'arcy it's all up now why couldn't he have let them be a short and sharp melee followed the classics were reinforced rapidly and the moderns seeing their plot detected and fearing the intervention of the seniors sullenly raised the blockade and allowed the door to open whereat in tumbled percy wheatfield with five young moderns at his heels the very five who had been waiting for the clock to strike in wally's study what do you mean by keeping us out demanded percy of his brother who chanced to be the first person he encountered what are you talking about retorted wally extremely chagrined to discover who it was he had been helping we were the chaps who let you in it was your own cads who were keeping you out ask them we thought you were classics said one of the offenders letting the cat out of the bag oh you beauty wait till i get some of you outside bellowed the outraged percy order shut up you kids down there was the cry from the front shut up you kids down there echoed d'arcy and ashby on their own account ranger one hundred and twenty three hands up for dangle and if the youngsters down there don't make less noise i'll adjourn the meeting said the captain this awful threat secured silence while the counting proceeded d'arcy's face grew longer and longer and wally at the back began to breathe vengeance on the world at large hands down the captain turned and said something to clapperton and fisher major who overheard what was said looked very glum every one knew what was coming ranger one hundred and twenty three votes dangle one hundred and twenty four dangle is the shouts of the moderns drowned the last words and the captain had to wait a minute before he could finish what he had to say the votes are very close said he if any one would like we can count again no no cried ranger it's all right i don't dispute it that concludes the election said the captain and amid loud cheers and counter cheers the meeting dispersed the prefects of wakefield's house met that evening in york's study to talk over the events of the afternoon the captain was the only person present who appeared to regard the result of the elections with equanimity after all said he though i'm awfully sorry about old ranger it seems fairer to have the officers evenly divided there's much less chance of a row than if we were three to their one that's all very well said fisher whose pleasure in his own election had been completely spoiled by the defeat of his friend if we could count on fair play you know dangle as well as i do i'd sooner resign myself than have him secretary what rot said ranger you'd probably only give them another man no we shall have to see we get fair play and give it too said the captain they simply packed the meeting said dalton and fetched up five juniors at the very end who turned the scale if our fellows had done the same we should have been all right i don't see the use of growling now it's well over said york the great thing is to see we get the best men into the teams and that they play up we hardly need go outside wakefields for that said fisher major they've not a man worth his salt in a football scrimmage look out that they haven't more than we have that's all said the captain gloomily i tell you what you fellows added he with a touch of temper in his voice if our house is to be cock-house at fellsgarth we can't afford to make fools of ourselves the school's a jolly sight more important than any one house and as long as i'm captain of the school clubs i don't intend to inquire what house a man belongs to so long as he can play we can keep all our jealousy for the house club if you like but if it's to be carried into the school sports we may as well dissolve the clubs and scratch all our matches at once i wonder if clapperton is giving vent to the same patriotic sentiments to his admirers said ridgway laughing fancy him and dangle and brinkman conspiring together for the glory of the school why not said the captain testily why won't you give anybody credit for being decent outside wakefields i'm afraid old york hardly gives any one credit for being decent in it for pity's sake don't lecture any more to-night old man said dalton i'll agree to anything rather than that there's just one more thing said york which you may take as lecture or not as you like clapperton said something about helping out the clubs with money 
fisher major you are the treasurer don't have any of that don't take more than the regular subscription from anybody and don't take less if there's a deficit let's all stump up alike we don't want anybody's charity this sentiment was generally applauded and restored the captain in the good opinion of every one present after all old york's bark was always worse than his bite he wasn't going to be put upon by the other side however much he seemed to stick up for them ranger waited a few minutes after the others had gone look here ranger said the captain you must back me up in this you can afford to do it because you've been beaten i only wish you were in my place i know you hate those fellows and are cut up to have lost the secretaryship i'm not going to break my heart about that said ranger of course not you're going to do what will be a lot more useful you're going to work as hard for the school as if you were secretary and captain in one and you're going to back me up in keeping the peace aren't you would you if you were in my shoes said ranger i might find it hard but i almost think i should try and if i had your good temper i should succeed too ranger laughed i didn't think you went in for flattery york anyhow i believe you are right i'll be as affectionate as i can to those modern chaps ugh good night after the day's excitement fellsgarth went to bed early but no one dreamed least of all the heroes of the exploit themselves how much was to depend during the coming months on those five small voters who had waited patiently in wally wheatfield's study that afternoon to hear the clock strike five thirty end of chapter four chapter five of cock house at fellsgarth by talbert baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five percy wheatfield envoy extraordinary the misgivings of the classics were justified the moderns did not accept their victory at elections with a meekness which augured harmony for the coming half on the contrary they executed that difficult acrobatic feat known as going off their heads with jubilation for many terms they had groaned under a sense of inferiority partly imagined but partly well founded in their relations with the rival side the classics had given themselves airs and what was worse proved their right to give them in its early days the modern side was not in it at fellsgarth its few members were taught to look upon themselves as altogether a lower order of creation than the pupils of the old foundation and had accepted the position with due humility then certain rebellious spirits had arisen who dared to ask why their side wasn't as good as any other the answer was crushing what can you do only french and bookkeeping and stinks the strictly classical name for chemistry you can't put a man into the cricket or football field worth his salt your houses are rowdy your men do nothing at the university two out of three of you are not even gentlemen whereupon the moderns went in desperately for sports and claimed to be represented in the school clubs they maintained that they were as good gentlemen as any who talked latin and greek and to prove it they jingled their money in their trouser pockets and asked what the classics could do in that line the classics could do very little and fell back on their moral advantages by degrees the new side grew in numbers and made themselves heard rather more definitely they put into the field one or two men who could not honestly be denied a place in the school teams and they began to figure also among the school prefects the present seniors clapperton and his friends carried the thing a step further and insisted on equal rights with their rivals in all the school institutions to their surprise they found an ally in york who as we have already said hurt the feelings of many of his admirers by his quixotic insistence on fair play all round the proceedings yesterday had been the most recent instance of the flow in the tide of modern progress at fellsgarth reinforced by an unusual influx of new boys they had aimed at and succeeded in winning 
their level half of the control of the school clubs and york had looked on and let them do it no wonder they went off their heads as they discoursed on their triumph and no wonder they already pictured themselves masters of fellsgarth it never does occur to some people that the mountain is not climbed till the top is reached really you know said brinkman i felt half sorry for those poor beggars they did look so sick when dangle was elected it's my opinion said clapperton you'd have been in too if all our fellows had turned up i saw four or five of our youngsters come in at the last moment yes by the way said dangle that ought to be looked into it's fishy to say the least of it and would have made all the difference to brinkman's election do you know who the fellows were asked clapperton i believe your fag was one of them percy whitfield catch him being shut out of anything but i'll ask about it fancy poor york's feelings if we were to demand a new election i tell you what said dangle i don't altogether understand york he tries to pass off as fair and just and all that sort of thing but one can't be sure he's not playing a game of his own we shall easily see that when it comes to choosing the football fifteen against rendlesham i mean to send him in a list of fellows on our side it's only fair we should have half of them our men half fifteen is seven and a half said fullerton a melancholy senior who had not yet spoken how will you manage about that shut up you ass i only asked said fullerton it doesn't matter to me i don't mind going as the half-man if you like if you send seven names you'll be in a minority in the fifteen and if you send eight you'll be in a majority it doesn't matter to me a bit just like fullerton always asking riddles that haven't got an answer said dangle i wonder how fisher will manage the treasurership said brinkman who was evidently sore at his defeat i shouldn't have thought accounts were much in his line he can't have very hard work doing his own said clapperton laughing but that's not his fault poor beggar only i think it would be much better to have a fellow for a treasurer who wasn't in a chronic state of being hard up i suppose you mean said fullerton who had a most awkwardly blunt way of putting things he'd have less temptation to steal i hope fisher's not a thief what an idiot you are fullerton said clapperton who ever said he was i didn't i only asked what you thought it doesn't much matter to me except that it wouldn't be creditable to the school of course it wouldn't it's hardly creditable to our side to have a jackass in it said clapperton oh all right i'll go i dare say you'll get on as well without me the others presently followed his example and clapperton left to himself proceeded to draw up his list dear york he wrote you will probably be making up the fifteen for the rettlesham match shortly please put down me brinkman dangle fullerton west harrowby and ramshaw major to play from our side this will give your side the odd man yours truly g o clapperton this important epistle accomplished he shouted for his fag to come and convey it to its destination it was not till after several calls on an increasing scale of peremptoriness that master percy condescended to appear when he did he was covered with dust from head to foot and his face what could be seen of it was visibly lopsided why don't you come when you're called whatever have you been up to fighting rather not said percy only boxing you see it was this way coddle brought a pair of gloves up this term and young lickford had an old pair so we three and ramshaw have been having an eight-handed mill it was rather jolly only ramshaw and lickford had the old gloves on and they've all the horsehair out so coddle and i got it rather hot on the face but we took it out of them with our body blows above the belt you know not awfully above i couldn't come when you called because we were wrestling out one of the rounds it's harder work an eight-handed wrestle than four hands just when you called first i nearly had coddle and lickford down but you bit me off my trip and ramshaw had me over instead all very interesting said clapperton but you'll have to come sharp next time or i shall trip you up myself take this note over to york stop while he reads it and if there's any answer bring it if not don't wait 
can't cash take it we're not nearly finished no cut off sharp awful shame growled the messenger to himself as he departed i hate clapperton he always waits till i'm enjoying myself and then routs me out i shan't stand it much longer what does he want with york perhaps it's a challenge yes by the way very good chance i'll see what that cad wally's got to say about those kids i found in his room yesterday nice old games he gets up to wally's all very well when he's asleep or grubbing or doing impositions but he's a sight too artful out of school like all those classic kids one's as bad as another as if to emphasize this sentiment a classic kid at that moment came violently into collision with master percy's waistcoat it was fisher minor who had once more caught sight in the distance of the mysterious borrower of his half-crown and was giving chase where are you coming to you kid you've nearly smashed a button i'll welt you for that i beg your pardon wally i wally what do you mean by calling me wally exclaimed percy well wheatfield i beg your pardon i was in a hurry to catch a fellow up and i didn't see you didn't you well you'll feel me take that fisher minor meekly accepted the cuff and full of his half-crown essayed to proceed but percy stopped him you're that new kid fisher's minor aren't you it astonished fisher minor that the speaker whom he supposed he had seen only ten minutes ago should so soon have forgotten his name yes but i say wally i mean wheatfield humph i suppose you held up both hands for your precious brother yesterday no only one i was nearly late though i waited an hour at the gymnasium you know and no modern chaps came out at all percy began to smell rats waited at the gymnasium did you who told you to do that oh you know it was part of the canvassing oh you were in that job were you my boy all serene i'll i say cried fisher minor turning pale aren't you wally wheatfield i thought me wally what do you take me for i'll let you know who i am you're a beauty you are some of our chaps'll tell you who i am mr canvasser now look here you stop there till i come back from york's if you move an inch whew, you'll find the weather pretty warm i can tell you canvassing you'll get canvassed i fancy before you grow much taller and off stalked the indignant percy promising himself a particularly pleasant afternoon as soon as his errand to the captain was over york was at work with his lexicon and notebooks on the table when the envoy entered well is that you or your brother inquired he not my brother if i know it said percy that's not much help he says exactly the same when i put the same question to him he does does he i owe wally one already now thanks then you're not wally what do you want this note clapperton said i was to wait while you read it and bring an answer if there was one york read the note and smiled as he did so percy wished he knew what was in it he didn't know clapperton could make jokes any answer he demanded yes there's an answer said the captain he took out a list of names from his pocket and compared it with that on clapperton's letter then he wrote as follows dear clapperton the fifteen against Reddlesham is already made up as follows here followed the list you will see it includes six of the names you sent we must play the best team we can and i think we shall have it yours truly cecil york there's the answer take it over at once i like his style growled percy to himself he don't seem to have a please about him catch me hurrying myself for him i've got this precious canvasser to look after and he returned at a leisurely pace to the rendezvous no fisher minor was there that young gentleman when left to himself found himself in a perspiration of doubt and fear he had made a most awkward blunder and confessed the delinquencies of his comrades to the very last man they would wish to know of them that was bad enough but to make things worse he was to be let in for the blame of the whole affair and with master percy's assistance was shortly to experience warm weather among the moderns happy thought he would not stay where he was he would retire as the latin book said into winter quarters and entrench himself in the stronghold of wally and darcy and ashby if he was to get it hot he would sooner get it from them than from the barbarians in forders 
with which desperate conclusion and once more devoutly wishing himself safe at home he made tracks at a rapid walk to wally's room his three comrades were all there what's up said they as he entered with agitated face oh i say it's all because you and your brother are so alike i met him just now and he's heard about that canvassing you know and i thought you'd like to know you mean to say you blabbed said wally jumping to his feet it's your fault said d'arcy i've made the same mistake myself why can't you grow a moustache or something to distinguish you why can't you get your brother to be a classic then it wouldn't matter either of you would do suggested ashby ashby was beginning to feel quite at home in wakefield's i'll let some of you see if it won't matter retorted wally if they've got wind of that affair the other side there'll be a fearful row they'll want another election oh you young idiot that comes of trusting a new kid that sings comic songs and parts his hair the wrong side with a secret d'arcy's nearly as big an ass as you are yourself to trust you after this philippic wally felt a little better and was ready to consider what had better be done he's bound to come here you chaps said he you cut leave him to me i'll tackle him fisher minor considered this uncommonly good advice and obeyed it with alacrity the other two followed less eagerly they would have liked to stay and see the fun as wally expected his affectionate relative being balked of his prey outside came to pay a fraternal visit what cheer said he i say have you seen a kid call fisher minor the new kid you know that we had a lark with at dinner on first night oh that chap bless you he messes in our study what about him i want him i want to say something to him i'll tell him all right he's come and told you has he and you're hiding him never mind i'll bowl him out the beauty i know all about that little game of yours yesterday you know what little game as if you didn't know do you suppose i didn't find five of em shut up here yesterday being kept out of the way at elections yes and do you suppose if it hadn't been for me they'd have got into the hall at all don't be a beast percy if you can help they stayed here of their own accord no one kept em in i say have some toffee got any rather a new brew this morning i say you can have half of it thanks awfully wally you see oh take more than that these new kids are such born asses they boss everything you should have heard that fisher minor at lamb singing the other night like the toffee i say don't be a sneak about those chaps you'd never have got them in without me i backed you up and got the door open i say would you like a turkish stamp i've got one to swap but you can have it if you like thanks old man yes new kinds are rot well ta-ta better make it up i suppose i say i shan't have time to write home to-day you write this time and i'll do the two next week all serene if you like here you're leaving one of your bits of toffee ta-ta old chappie and these great twin brethren whose infirmity it was always to be fond of one another when they were together and to scorn one another when they were apart separated in a most amicable fashion well asked the three exiles putting in their heads as soon as the enemy had gone choked him off said wally fanning himself jolly hard work but he came round percy meanwhile having suddenly remembered his errand hastened back to the house as he did so he observed notices of the fifteen for the rendlesham match posted on wakefield's door on the school board and at forder's he solaced himself by writing in bold characters the word beast against each of the names which belonged to a classic boy and discovered when his task was done that he had inscribed the word nine times out of fifteen on each notice whereupon he made off at a run to his seniors well said clapperton evidently anxious didn't i tell you to come back at once any answer yes this said percy producing the captain's letter i say york grinned like anything when he read yours did he replied clapperton opening the envelope evidently york in his reply had not been guilty of a joke for the face of the modern captain was dark and scowling as he read it cool cheek muttered he dangle was right after all you can go youngster all right 
i say they've got the fifteen stuck up on the board six of our chaps in it we ought to lick them this year but as clapperton did not do him the favour of heeding his observations he retired and tried vainly to collect his scattered forces to conclude the eight-handed boxing match which had been so unfeelingly interrupted an hour ago clapperton to do him justice could not deny to himself that the team selected by the captain was the best fighting fifteen the school could put into the football field but having advanced his claim for half numbers his pride was hurt at finding it almost contemptuously set aside it would never do for him to climb down now the moderns after all had a right to have their men in and he had a right to assume they were better players than some of the selected classics it was easy to work himself into a rage and talk about favouritism and abuse of privilege and all that his popularity in his own house depended on his fighting their battles and he must do it now so he wrote a reply to york dear york i do not agree with you about the fifteen i consider the men on our side whom you have omitted are better than the three i have marked on your list if we are to make the clubs a success we ought to pull together and let there be no suspicion however groundless of favouritism yours truly geo clapperton to this letter which he sent over by another junior more expeditious than his last he received the following reply dear clapperton sides have nothing to do with it if the best fifteen names were all on your side i should have to select them but they are not the fifteen i have chosen are undoubtedly the best men we have and the team most likely to win the match i suppose that is what we play for yours truly cecil york this polite correspondence clapperton laid before his friends the general feeling was that the moderns were being unfairly and disrespectfully used it's the old story over again said dangle if we don't look after ourselves nobody else will at any rate as long as he's captain i suppose he has the right to pick the team said fullerton i shouldn't be particularly sorry if he were to leave me out it wouldn't matter to me who cares whether it matters to you it matters to our side said brinkman and we oughtn't to stand it End of chapter five chapter six of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six rollitt rollitt of wakefield's was a standing mystery at fellsgarth though he had been three years at the school and worked his way up from the junior form to one of the first six no one knew him he had no friends and did not want any he rarely spoke when not obliged to do so and when he did he said either what was unexpected or disagreeable he scarcely ever played in the matches but when he did he played tremendously although a classic he was addicted to scientific research and long country walks his study was a spectacle for untidiness and grime he abjured his privilege of having a fag no one dared to take liberties with him for he had an arm like an oak branch and a back as broad as the door all sorts of queer stories were afloat about him it was generally whispered that his father was a common workman and that the son was being kept at school by charity any reference to his poverty was the one way of exciting rollitt but it was too risky an amusement to be popular his absence of mind however was his great enemy at school of him the story was current that once in the fourth when summoned to the front to call over the register he called his own name among the rest and receiving no reply looked to his place and seeing the desk vacant marked rollitt down as absent another time having gone to his room after morning school to change into his flannels for cricket he had gone to bed by mistake and slept soundly till call bell next morning have you heard rollitt's last came to be the common way of prefacing any unlikely story at fellsgarth and what with fact and fiction the hero had come to be quite 
a mythical celebrity at fellsgarth his thrift was another of his characteristics he had never been seen to spend a penny unless it was to save tuppence if fellows had dared they would have liked now and then to pay his subscriptions to the clubs or even hand on an old pair of cricket shoes or part of the contents of a hamper for his benefit but woe betide them if they ever tried it the only extravagance he had ever been known to commit was some months ago when he bought a book of trout flies which rumour said must have cost him as much as an ordinary classics pocket money for a whole term to an impressionable youth like fisher minor it was only natural that rollitt should be an object of awe for a day or two after his arrival when the stories he had heard were fresh in his memory the junior was wont to change his walk to a tiptoe as he passed the queer boy's door if ever he met him face to face he started and quaked like one who has encountered a ghost or a burglar after a week this excess of deference toned down finding that rollitt neither hurt nor heeded him he abandoned his fears and instead of running away stood and stared at his man as if by keeping his eye hard on him he could discover his mystery it was two or three days after elections that fisher minor having discovered by the absence of everybody from their ordinary haunts that it was a half-holiday took it into his head to explore a little way down the shargle valley he believed the other fellows had gone up and he thought it a little unfriendly that they should have left him in the lurch he was not particularly fond of woods unless there were nuts in them or of rivers unless there were stones on the banks to shy in still it seemed to be half holiday form at fellsgarth to go down valleys so he went quite indifferent to the beauties of nature and equally indifferent as to where this walk brought him a mile below fellsgarth as everybody knows the shargle tumbles wildly into the shale with a great fuss of rapids and cataracts and narrows to celebrate the fact and a mile further the united streams flow tamely out among reeds and gravel islands into hawk's water fisher minor had nearly reached the junction and was proceeding to speculate on the possibility of picking his way among the stones towards the lake when he caught sight of a boat in the middle of the rapid stream it was tied somewhat carelessly to the overhanging branch of a tree which bent and creaked with every lurch of the boat in the passing rapids standing in the stern as unconcerned as if he was on an island in a duck pond was rollitt with his fishing rod casting diligently into the troubled waters for the first time the junior enjoyed an uninterrupted view of the object of his curiosity he found it hard to recognize at first in the eager sportsmanlike figure with his animated face the big shambling fellow whom he had so often eyed askance in the passages at wakefields but there was no mistaking the shabby clothes the powerful arms the broad square back rollitt the sportsman was another creature from rollitt the classic and fisher minor was critic enough to see that the advantage was with the former there was no chance of being detected rollitt was far too busy to heed anything but the six-pounder that struggled and plunged and tore away with his line to the end of the reel had all fellsgarth stood congregated on the banks he would never have noticed them ah he was beginning to wind in now gingerly and artfully and the fish sulking desperately among the stones was beginning to find his master it was a keen battle between those two now the captive would dive behind a rock and force the line out a yard or two now the captor would coax it on from one hiding-place to the next and by a cunning flank movement cut off its retreat then yielding little by little the fish would fain surrender till just as it seemed within reach twang would go the line and the rod bend almost double beneath the sudden plunge 
then the patient work would begin again the man's temper was more than a match for that of the victim and exhausted and despondent the fish would sooner or later have to submit to the inexorable how long it might have gone on fisher could never tell for once when victory seemed on the point of declaring for the angler and the shining fins of the fish floundered despairingly almost within his reach a downward dash nearly wrenched the rod from his hands and sent him sprawling on to the thwarts the sudden lurch of the boat was too much for the ill-tied rope and to fisher's horror the noose gave way and sent boat and fisherman spinning down the rapids at five miles an hour rollitt either did not notice the accident or was too engrossed to heed it he still had his fish though as far off as before and once more the tedious task of coaxing him out of his tantrums was to begin over again it was useless to shout the roar of the water among the stones above and over the rocks below was deafening and fisher's piping voice could never make itself heard above it he tried to throw a stone but its little splash was lost in the hurly-burly of the rapids it was hopeless to expect that rollitt would see him he had no eyes but for his rod the last glimpse fisher minor caught of him as the boat side on swirled round the turn towards the falls below he was standing on the seat craning his neck for a glimpse of his prize and winding in gingerly on the reel as he did so then he disappeared with a groan of panic the small boy started to follow the boulders were big and rough and it was hard work to go at ordinary rate still more to run happily however after a few steps he stumbled upon a path which though it seemed to lead from the river would take him he calculated back to it above the falls at the end of the bend in which the boat was it was a tolerable path and fisher minor never got over ground so fast before or after a few seconds brought him out of the wood on to the river bank where the stream deepening and hushing gathers itself for its great leap over the falls had the boat already passed and was he too late no there it came sidling along on the swift waters the angler still at his post leaning over with his landing-net within reach at last of his hard-earned prize what could fisher minor do the stream was fairly narrow and the boat sweeping round the bend was if anything nearer the other side where the banks were high his one chance was to attract the angler's attention had that angler been any one but rollitt it might have been easy arming himself with a handful of stones fisher minor waited till the boat came within a few yards then with a great shout he flung with all his might at the boat the sudden fusillade might have been unheeded had not one stone struck the angler's hand just as he was manoeuvring his landing-net under the fish in the sudden start he missed his aim and looked up look out screamed fisher you're adrift catch the branch and he pointed wildly to the branch of an ash which straggled out over the water just above the fall rollitt took in the situation at last he cast a regretful glance at the fish as it gave its last victorious leap and vanished then standing on the gunwale and measuring his distance from the tree he jumped for a moment fisher minor thought he had missed for the branch yielded and went under with his weight but in a moment just as the boat with a swoop plunged over the fall he rose clutching securely and hauling himself inch by inch out of the torrent to fisher who watched breathlessly it seemed as if every moment the branch would snap and send the senior back to his fate but it held out bravely and supported him as he gradually drew himself up and finally perched high and dry above the water fisher minor's difficulties now began having seen his man safe he would have liked to run away for he was not at all sure how rollitt would take it besides he wouldn't much care to be seen by fellows like wally or d'arcy walking back in his company to fellsgarth on the other hand it seemed rather low to desert a fellow just when he was half drowned and might be hurt what had he better do rollitt decided for him he came along the bow to where the boy stood and dropped to the ground in front of him thanks he said and held out his hand fisher was horribly alarmed the tone in which the word was spoken was very like that which 
giant blunderbore may have used when dinner was announced however he summoned up courage to hold out his hand and was surprised to find how gently rollitt grasped it i didn't mean to hurt you with the stones he said you didn't come and look for the boat fisher minor he knows my name then soliloquized the minor beginning to recover a little from his panic i hope nobody will see me the boat was found bottom upwards a wreck with its sides stove in entangled in a mass of flotsam and jetsam which had gathered in one of the side eddies below the waterfall haul in fisher minor growled rollitt surveying the wreck with difficulty they got it ashore and turned it right side up rod flies net all gone said rollitt half angry and fish too it was such a beauty the trout you hooked i wish you'd got it you nearly had it too when you had to jump out ventured fisher rollitt looked down almost amiably at the speaker had the boy studied for weeks he could not have made a more conciliatory speech can't be helped said the senior might have been worse thanks again come and see mrs wisdom mrs wisdom was a decent young widow woman in whom the fellsgarth boys felt a considerable interest her husband late gamekeeper at shargle lodge had always had a civil word for the young gentlemen especially those addicted to sport by whom he had been looked up to as a universal authority and ally in addition to his duties at the lodge which were very ill paid he had eked out his slender income by the help of a boat which he kept on the lower reach below the falls and which was in the season considerably patronized by the schoolboys when last season he met his death over one of the cliffs of hawk's pike every one felt sympathy for the widow and her children who were thus left homeless and destitute an effort was made chiefly by the school authorities to get her some laundry work and find her a home in one of the little cottages on the school farm near the river while the boys made it almost a point of honour never to hire another boat down at the lake if mrs wisdom's was to be had last week the boat had been brought up to the cottage on a cart to be repainted for the coming season and while here rollitt had begged the use of it for this particular afternoon to fish from in the upper reach take care of her master rollitt said the widow she's a'most all i've got left except the children my john he did say the upper reach was no water for boats i'll take care said rollitt as the two boys now walked slowly towards the cottage fisher minor could see that his companion's face was working ominously he mistook it for ill temper at the time for he did not know mrs wisdom's history or what the wreck meant to her she was at her door as they approached and as she looked up and saw their long faces the poor woman jumped at the truth at once don't say there's anything wrong with the boat master rollitt don't tell me that rollitt nodded almost sternly it went over the fall said fisher feeling that something ought to be said rollitt only just got out in time over the fall then it smashed cried she bursting into tears it was to keep our body and soul together this season now what'll become of us oh master rollitt i did think you'd take care of my boat it was all i had left bar the children what'll they do now rollitt stood by grimly silent till she had had her cry and looked up i'm sorry said he in a voice that meant what it said what was it worth worth everything to me what would a new one cost more than i could pay or you either my john gave five pound for her and oh how we scrimped to save it where is it to come from now and she relapsed again into tears rollitt waited a little longer but there was nothing more to add and presently he signalled fisher to come away he was silent all the way home the junior did not dare to speak to him scarcely to look up in his face yet it did occur to him that if any one had a right to be in a bad temper over that afternoon's proceedings it was mrs wisdom and not rollitt as they neared the school fisher minor began to feel dreadfully compromised by his company rollitt's clothes were wet and muddy his hands and face were dirty with his scramble along the tree 
his air was morose and savage and his stride was such that the junior had to trot a step or two every few yards to keep up what would fellows think of him suppose ranger were to see him or still worse the modern wheatfield or at this moment fate solved his problem for just ahead of him turning the corner of fowler's wall was the cadaverous individual who owed him half a crown oh excuse me rollitt said he there's a fellow there i want to speak to good-bye rollitt did not appear either to hear the words or notice the desertion but stalked on till he reached wakefield's the house seemed to be empty evidently none of the half-holiday makers had returned study doors stood open an unearthly silence reigned in wally's quarters even the tuck-shop was deserted the only person he met was dangle the club secretary who had penetrated into the enemy's quarter in order to confer with his dear colleague the treasurer as to calling a committee meeting and was now returning unsuccessful ah rollitt said he tell fisher major will you i want to see him as soon as he comes in i'd leave a line for him but i don't know his room whether rollitt heard or not he had to guess at any rate he hardly felt sanguine that his message would be delivered as for rollitt he shut himself into his study with a bang and might have been heard by any one who took the trouble to listen pacing up and down the floor for a long time that evening he did not put in an appearance in the common room and although york sent to ask him to tea he forgot all about the invitation and even if he had remembered it would have forgotten whether he had said yes or no the next morning sunday just as the chapel bell was beginning to ring widow wisdom was startled by a loud knock at her door oh master rollitt said she and her eyes were red still is the boat safe after all no but i've got you another farmer gaze was for sale on the lake i've bought it it's yours now farmer gaze mine oh go on master rollitt how could you buy a boat any more than me you've no money to spare i know it's yours here's the receipt said the boy with almost a scowl but master rollitt but master rollitt had gone to be in time for chapel end of chapter six chapter seven of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven trial by jury fisher minor's hopes rose high within him as he stalked his debtor across the school green three times already he had encountered him but fate had stepped in to prevent the collection of his dues now he had arrived at this stage when a voice at his side sent a cold shiver down his back hello kid got you at last then that's what you call waiting where i left you do you i didn't promise to wait said fisher you told me to it's the same thing now you'll come along with me my beauty had fisher minor been anything but a raw hand it might have occurred to him that it would take percy wheatfield all his time to convey a boy his fisher's size against his will into forder's house but such is the force of innocence on one side and authority on the other that the new boy laid down his arms and followed his captor meekly into the enemy's citadel just as they were entering a posse of the enemy appeared on the scene consisting among other supporters of the modern cause of ramshaw cottle lickford and cash here's a game rammy cried percy got him at last this is the villain this is the murdering highway forger come on you kid you're in for it it did occur to fisher minor at this juncture that a change of air might be refreshing but it was too late now the enemy had him fast there was no getting out of the warm weather which had been promised him come on we'll have a regular old bailey of it cried percy go and tell the fellows and collar some witnesses do you hear and tell the hangman he'll be wanted in half an hour this promise of judicial dispatch was not consoling to the prisoner who had grave doubts as to the impartiality of the tribunal before which he was to be arraigned he wondered if ashby or darcy or any of his friends would appear among the witnesses the trial took place in the room jointly owned by percy ramshaw cottle and lickford a chair was planted on the bed for the accommodation of the judge the fender was brought out in front of the chest of drawers for a witness-box 
while rix minimus who officiated as jury sat on a footstool on the table as for the prisoner a dock was provided for him in the form of a washstand out of which the basin had been removed to make room for his uneasy person in the vacant hole now you chaps said percy who had naturally appointed himself in addition to his other offices usher of the court no larks shut up this is a big job this young cad cheated at elections here the door opened and dangle looked in what on earth is all this row he said a trial i say dangle will you be judge it's a classic kid that cheated at elections no really i didn't said fisher painfully aware that so far the trial was going against him dangle who fancied something might come of this was condescending enough to say he didn't mind playing at judge if they liked whereat amid cheers he was voted to the chair on the bed where he sat rather precariously and ordered silence in the court who is the prisoner go on kid tell him your name said percy encouragingly fisher minor really i didn't do anything said the prisoner what's the charge said the judge you see it's this way said percy forgetting to go inside the fender bam and cot and lick and i were having a ripping eight-handed mill in here the other day the prisoner thought over all his crimes and could recall nothing that was even remotely connected with an eight-handed mill cod and lick had got gloves with no horsehair in them you know so they lambed it pretty hard but ram and i were just scrunching them up crams you never got near us my nose wasn't hit once said coddle no but we had you in the ribs under the belt ejaculated lickford no it wasn't i say dangle said the witness it was just on his waistcoat pocket and he says that's below the belt if he likes to wear his belt round his neck of course he gets hit under and if you wear yours round your ankle there's not much room for your bread-basket retorted coddle and where does fisher minor come in asked the judge was he in the middle of the mill no you see we were just in the middle of it and these jolly cheats were beginning to cave in ho ho it would take a lot more than you to make us order in the court go on wheatfield there you are shut up you chaps beginning to cave in when clapperton yelled for me and i had to go lucky job for you growled coddle you wouldn't have been able to go at all five minutes later whereupon percy appealed to the court to keep order fire away said the judge that's nothing to do with the prisoner oh hasn't it you see clapperton wanted me to take a letter to york it must have been a screamer for york yelled when he read it i wanted him to let me finish our mill first but who york no clapperton if there'd been time for another round now then don't let's have any more of that mill said the judge that's just what they felt at the time wasn't it lick ejaculated coddle did we wait till you see my beauty said the witness i wish you wouldn't interrupt oh so i had to go and this kid came and caught me a jolly crack in the stomach which side of your belt inquired lickford the side you'll get it hot my boy next time i catch you retorted percy that'll be under you bet said lickford i didn't mean to hurt you said the prisoner who began to hope that the charge against him was to prove much less serious than he had at first feared i apologize shut up don't talk to me talk to the jury as the jury at this moment was struggling manfully to protect his hassock from the depredations of cash who was anxious to investigate its interior it was not much use addressing him so fisher subsided and wished the whole of percy's washstand had been at least so much easier in diameter as to allow him room to sigh fire away said the judge we shall be all night at this well you see continued percy it's this way i've got a brother you know called wally a seedy classic chap and up to no end of low tricks we know him echoed the court generally not got such a rummy shaped waist as his brother though whispered coddle all right young coddle i'll take it out of you you'll see what'll you take i keep mine outside replied coddle order in the court forge away wheatfield i should like to know how i'm to forge away with these two asses fooling about down here why can't you raise them to the bench to keep them quiet oh yes well you see this kid being new and green and about as high old an idiot as they make em did you fellow see him on first night i say oh my look here wheatfield said the judge sternly if you aren't done in three minutes i'll call the next witness he wouldn't know anything about it bless you said percy you see it was like this this kid thought i was wally what do you think of that cheek jolly rough on wally remarked cash 
the witness looked at the interrupter and tried to make out whether his remark was a compliment or the reverse he decided that as he had only three minutes left he had better defer thinking the question out till afterwards so of course he began to swagger about his big brother no you ask me began the prisoner shut up cried percy sternly how am i to get done in three minutes if only two left now said ramshaw go on ram i've not been a minute yet yes you have sixty-five seconds said ramshaw who held his watch in his hand i never did believe in those waterbury turnips they always stop when you oh yes swaggered about his big brother and all those fellows over there and blabbed out there'd been a regular plant among em to rig the elections and he and a lot of em have been out canvassing and bagged a lot of our kids and locked them out and if it hadn't been for that brinkman would have pulled off the treasurership and if it hadn't been for me getting wind of it and going and fetching them out and bringing them into hall in the nick of time ranger would have got the secretaryship and our side would have been jolly well out of it and i mean to say it's a howling swindle and hope there'll be a jolly good row kicked up and you needn't say i let out about it because wally asked me to keep it mum and i said time's up said ramshaw no side whereupon the witness stopped short triumphantly like an athlete who has just won his race by neck come said the judge this is getting interesting who's the next witness are any of our fellows who were collared here rather young ricks is one please dangle said the prisoner i didn't touch anybody i was that is don't tell cram said percy it's a bad habit ricks had better go into the witness box said the judge what about the jury asked that functionary oh i'd keep the place warm volunteered percy whereupon ricks quitted his hassock and entered the fender i and slingsby got nailed by a classic cad outside our form door i kicked him on the shins though said he what classic cad oh i don't know a new kid with sandy hair a horrid lout it was wally's room we were taken to and they fooled us about high tea and that sort of thing the place was swarming with our chaps who had been collared how many asked the judge fifty not quite so many there were four or five next witness another of the captives gave similar evidence after which lickford deposed that he had seen the troop come in to elections just in time to vote for dangle yes and who tried to keep us out i'd like to know said percy there you are it was you i thought you were on the other side did you i'm very glad wally gave you a welting for it i wish he'd do it again he hits above the belt that's how i know him from you retorted lickford order what's the prisoner got to say cram said percy it's no use asking him wait a bit said the judge fisher minor how many of our chaps did you collar none really said the prisoner i waited by the gymnasium oh what for well i was canvassing what did you wait at the gymnasium for this was awkward fisher minor found himself getting into a tight corner tighter even than the washstand i was told to who by your brother i suppose oh no my brother wouldn't do such a thing what sort of thing why try to collar fellows off the other side oh that was your little game was it whose idea was it york's oh no it was darcy spoke to me oh darcy and who spoke to him whose fag is he ridgeway's and what did ridgeway tell him i don't think ridgeway told him anything the only one i heard speak to him was wally wretched young sneak said percy i'll let wally know that wally he's york's fag who else was there only me and ashby who does ashby fag for my brother fisher major i thought you said just now your brother wasn't in it you'd better be careful youngster for the life of him fisher minor in his bewildered state could not make out how ridgeway and york and fisher major all seemed to have got mixed up in the affair you mean to say said the judge you don't know what the orders to the fags were no really i only heard of it from darcy your brother never said anything to you direct oh no has he said anything since oh no that is he only said it was a pity ranger got beaten did he say how it happened he said if the five modern chaps hadn't turned up at the last moment he'd have won was he angry about it he was rather in a wax did he tell you you were an ass not that time another time yes once or twice cute chap your brother said percy aside shut up wheatfield now tell me this young fisher minor said dangle with an air of importance which intimidated the prisoner what was it your brother said about the election it wasn't to me it was to ranger my senior he said it was a regular sell and he'd have given a lot to see you beaten because he knew you couldn't play fair at anything even if you tried some of the court were rude enough to laugh at this very candid confession but the judge himself failed to see any humour in it oh that's what he said 
and yet you mean to tell me after that that your brother had nothing to do with trying to get ranger elected instead of me i suppose he had but i'm sure he didn't mean to do anything fishy any more than i did i thought it was only a joke you've a nice notion of a joke that'll do you can cut what exclaimed percy aghast aren't you going to hang him no i must go you can finish the trial yourselves as soon as the judge had quitted the bench percy mounted it and proceeded to sum up you're a nice article you are said he addressing the prisoner what do you mean by sneaking on my young brother wally eh you'll get it hot for that i can tell you you're to be hanged drawn and quartered then you're to be kicked all round our side then you're to be ducked in the river then you're to kneel down and lick every chap's boots then you're to be executed then you're to be burnt alive then you're to write out fifty greek verbs then you're hallo who's there come in what do you want this abrupt curtailment of the prisoner's doom was occasioned by a modest tap at the door probably some belated witness come to add his evidence to the rest come in can't you repeated percy whereupon the door opened with a swing and in rushed wally d'arcy ashby and three or four other classic fags how they had got wind of the capture of their man it would be hard to say but now they had come to fetch him the only thing is visible in percy's room for several minutes was dust out of which proceeded yells and howls and recriminations which would have done credit to pandemonium as the cloud rolled by the classics might be seen in a firm phalanx with their man in the middle backing on to the door signs of carnage lay all around lickford was struggling head downward in the washstand cash was leaning up in a corner with his hand modestly placed over his nose ramshaw and cottle were engaged in deadly strife on the floor each under the fond delusion that the other was a classic while the twin brothers armed with the better pair of boxing gloves were having a friendly spar in the middle it was a victory all along the line for the invaders and when a moment afterwards they stampeded in a body and marched with shouts of victory down the passage carrying the late prisoner among them there was no mistake about the ignominious defeat of the besieged garrison that evening fisher major received a polite note from his colleague the secretary dear fisher it is only right to tell you that we have discovered that five of our fellows were prevented from voting at elections by boys of your side apparently acting under orders from their seniors we don't profess to know who were at the bottom of it but it is a fact that the election for treasurer would have gone differently but for this very shady trick clapperton and most of us are not disposed to claim a new election now everything is settled and you have already got in most of the subscriptions but it makes us think that even the virtuous classics at fellsgarth are not absolutely perfect even yet which is a pity yours truly r dangle this pleasant letter fisher major raging carried to the captain york pulled a long face when he read it there's no truth in it surely said he i can't answer for any foolery the juniors have been up to but apart from that it's a sheer lie and the fellows deserve to be kicked much better offer them a new election said the captain what they'll get their man in my dear fellow suppose they do you'll still belong to fellsgarth they mustn't have a chance of saying they don't get fair play well perhaps you're right i don't care tuppence about the treasurership but i wouldn't like to be beaten by brinkman i hope you won't be old man said the captain next morning when fellows got up they found the following notice on the boards elections a protest having been handed in against the recent election for a treasurer notice is given that a fresh election will be held for this office on friday next at three c y captain end of chapter seven chapter eight of cock house at fellsgarth by talbert baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight one too many the seniors of forder's house were by no means gratified at the captain's prompt reply to dangle's accusation indeed that active and energetic official had written to fisher on his own responsibility and was now a little hurt to find that his colleagues were half inclined to repudiate his action why ever couldn't you speak about the thing before you wrote like that said clapperton we don't want another election you weren't going to sit down meekly and let those fellows cheat without saying a word were you retorted dangle no rather not but that wasn't the way to do it it would have paid us much better to stand on our 
dignity in other words said fullerton in his melancholy voice to have a grievance and nurse it well you idiot said clapperton i don't want you to tell me what i mean i wasn't i was telling the others said fullerton but i agree with you if we have another election and get beaten we shall be far worse off than if we were able to take heaven and earth to witness we had been wronged and were too noble to seek revenge if fullerton could have translated cicero as well as he translated clapperton what a good classic he would have been we'd better decline the new election at once said brinkman it concerns me more than anybody else and i agree with clapperton why ever not have the new election said dangle we're bound to get our man in better decline it first said clapperton they'll be glad enough not to let it go to a trial i expect hurrah for injured innocence said fullerton it's the best paying thing i know the result of this conference was that dangle went across after school next morning to the captain's study where fisher and ranger happened to be calling at the same time look here york said the secretary adopting his most civil tones you quite misunderstood my letter to fisher major we don't want another election we'd just as soon let things stop as they are it was rough on us of course but it divides the offices up more fairly to have them as they are thanks said york that's not good enough we'll have another election on friday dangle's face fell you're fools if you do said he those five votes will make all the difference i don't care if they've five hundred said york oh all right you've no messages about the cheats who kept our men out have you probably they've been promoted to prefects you took care not to commit yourself to any names but as you wrote to fisher major you probably include him as one of the cheats if so i dare say he'll be glad to discuss the matter with you outside i never said it was he said dangle hurriedly but i know who it was three of our juniors i understand said york the fags of three of your prefects yes fisher said the captain will you fetch ashby darcy and fisher minor here the young gentlemen in question were not far away busily engaged in their joint study with wally's assistance in getting up a stock of impositions which should serve as a common fund on which to draw daring the term the idea was darcy's you see he had said we're bound to catch it some of us and it's a jolly fag having to do the lines just when they're wanted my notion is if we just keep a little stock by us it'll be awfully handy why suppose young ashby were to get fifty lines at morning school next saturday what about his chance of getting into the fifty eighth fifteen it's the sixth fifteen not the fifty eighth said ashby well there's not much difference it would be jolly awkward said ashby yes and you always do get potted just when it is jolliest awkward said darcy that's why it's such a tip to have your impots written before you get them pennywise pound foolish you know it was not at all clear what this valuable aphorism had to do with the subject in hand but it impressed the two new boys considerably and just fancy continued wally driving home his chum's nails with considerable industry just fancy if young fisher was to have to sit up here swatting over lines just when his brother wants his vote in hall on friday why one vote will make all the difference fisher immediately called for pens ink and paper which wally and darcy promptly supplied for him and ashby and a scene of unparalleled industry ensued even darcy insisted on doing his share which consisted of drawing niggers in various stages of public execution labelled with the names of clapperton dangle and brinkman while wally generally superintended and assisted by playing fives against the wall 
i say said he presently i suppose it's all out about your precious canvassing that beast percy has gone and blabbed after me giving him toffy too never mind said d'arcy we rather took it out of them i fancy yesterday they won't mess about with us in a hurry again no we did pull that off pretty well i'm sorry for our seniors you know we did our best for them and we shan't be able to give them the same leg up on friday they ought to be pretty civil to us this term anyhow said wally whereupon fisher major entered the room york wants d'arcy ashby and my minor come at once he's waiting don't he want me said wally evidently afraid lest his services were going to be overlooked i was in it too you know fisher were you oh you'd better come too then thanks and the four disposing themselves meekly for their coming honours followed single file into the captain's room wally wished to come too explained fisher he says he was in it it perplexed the four heroes to see dangle there what did he want and why did the captain look so stern and oh horrors what was that switch on the table for gradually it dawned upon them that the honours in store for them would fall rather thicker than they were prepared for and wally for one wished he had stayed at home you youngsters said the captain it is said that you four behaved unfairly last election by keeping out five boys from voting is that true yes said ashby they were only modern kids explained d'arcy they wouldn't have got in for the second vote if it hadn't been for me remarked wally i didn't catch any boys i couldn't find any said fisher minor you see york said d'arcy who began to realize that he was boss of this show these two kids are new kids they oughtn't to be licked it's wally and me me exclaimed the injured wally i like your style young d'arcy what did i do all right it's me then if you like i don't mind being in it to give you a leg up said wally touched by the heroism of his friend but you might let a chap bowl himself out you know all right york it was me and d'arcy you should say i and d'arcy said ranger what were you in it good old no you young ass it's bad grammar to say me and d'arcy were in it i never knew you were it's the first we've heard of it isn't it you chaps the chaps most emphatically agreed that it was let them be ranger said the captain there'll be time enough for a grammar lesson after can't do it to-day we've got syntax this afternoon said d'arcy now you youngsters look here said the captain you may think you're very clever but this sort of thing is cheating and cheating is what cads do we don't want any of it inside fellsgarth dangle here are the youngsters and here is the switch will you lick them or shall i i don't want to lick them let them off growled dangle the hopes of the culprits rose for a moment but they went down below zero when york picked up the cane wheatfield come here wally held out his case hardened hand and received half a dozen cuts for which it is saying a good deal that they made the recipient dance d'arcy followed and received his six with meek indifference if he had come first he would probably have danced but as wally had done that he stood firm ashby received three cuts only which astonished him dreadfully it was his first acquaintance with the cane he had never realized before what a venomous instrument it can be still he bore it like a man poor fisher minor had a similar experience with his brother looking on and his messmates to watch how he bore it he passed through the ordeal creditably his three o's varied in cadence from anguish to surprise and from surprise to mild expostulation oh eo ow after which he felt very pleased on his brother's account that he had not shed tears now cut said the captain and if 
you're bowled out in that sort of thing again you won't be let off so easy yorke's a beast said wally when the shattered forces mastered once more in his study but he's a just beast he gave it us all hot alike no one disputed the proposition i thought he'd let you new kids off but he didn't it's just as well it'll do you good and make you sit up jolly sell for that cad dangle said d'arcy he thought yorke was going to shirk it he can't say that now said ashby rubbing the palm of his hand up and down his thigh dangle meanwhile had returned to his quarters with the unsatisfactory report of his mission bother them said clapperton they take advantage of us whenever there's a chance now they've offered a new election and licked the youngsters the wind is out of our sails when it comes to the time i shall decline to be nominated said brinkman that won't be much good you'll get some of our fellows voting for you whether you stand or not and if some vote all must we shall have to see all our men turn up said dangle it was a tight enough shave for the secretaryship yes if we don't carry it now we'd much better have left it alone i only wish we had there's this to be said said dangle anxious to make the best of his mistake if we do get three officers to their one there should be no doubt about our getting properly represented in the fifteen next week ah yes we've still that bone to pick with them as the friday approached signs of excitement in the coming conquest were plainly visible by tacit agreement the return match between percy's adherents and wally's was postponed till after the election absentees at the last election were diligently looked up by their respective prefects and ordered to be in attendance minute calculations were made by the knowing ones which decided within one or two what brinkman's majority would be even in wakefield's it was admitted that the classic chance was a slender one i wish it was all over said fisher major i'm getting sick of these precious accounts already and shall be glad to hand them over you won't lose them said dalton if we can help you may have to vote for yourself though catch me i've come to the conclusion i wasn't born a treasurer and i couldn't conscientiously vote for myself i only wish i could back out you can't do that now said his friend bless you we can keep the accounts for you we couldn't for brinkman when morning school was over on the friday there was a general stampede for the hall where boys crowded up for good seats a quarter of an hour before the time and enlivened the interval with cheers and demonstrations for their favourite candidate wally and his friends were particularly active in their corner and addressed the meeting generally in favour of fisher major back up you classy kids shouted wally standing on his seat and apostrophizing a group of the sixth who were standing near fisher's your friend won the mile in four thirty eight batting average thirty four point six five eight seven four two point three bowling twelve wickets an inning and three runs and over never tells lies or cheats always comes home sober and gives silver in the collection he won't waste your money or cook your accounts like some chaps and he'll run the ball up the field instead of sitting down in the middle of the scrummage like the modern chaps to keep warm walk up walk up vote for fisher and economy hooray for fisher down with the swell mob amid such torrents of eloquence the cause of fisher major was not likely to go by default brinkman too was not without his champions who however avoided set speeches and confined themselves to personalities and generalities such as who cheats at elections oh my hands what a licking how now not me here fisher minor coloured up look out you chaps here's a classic cad blushing no where won't he want a rest after it here comes brinkman hooray for honesty and fair play hooray for the moderns down with wakefield's kids 
send em home to their ma's shut up there sit down you youngsters whereupon there fell a lull fisher minor surveyed the scene with anxious trepidation if his brother were to lose now it would be his fisher minor's fault he would never be able to hold up his head again how he wished he had a dozen votes strong muster he heard some one say near him i expect every fellow's here except rollitt of of course said the other with a laugh no one ever expects him why not said fisher minor to himself why shouldn't rollitt come and vote he quite shuddered at the audacity of the idea and yet when he looked up to the front and saw his brother standing there worried and uneasy and realized that in a few minutes he was to stand his ordeal the younger brother's courage rose within him and he edged towards the door in due time yorke arose this time amid the vociferous cheers of his own side a few of the moderns ventured to mingle howls they soon discovered their mistake for not even their own side was with them as a body they were hooted down with execrations and the result of this interposition was that the captain was cheered for twice the usual time you fellows said he as soon as there was silence you probably understand from the notice why this meeting is called the last election was very close and i am sorry to say there was not fair play i am still more sorry to say the offenders were juniors in wakefields terrific yells and hoots from the moderns who ought to have known better and who i hope are thoroughly ashamed of themselves terrific cheers during which darcy wally and ashby who had been standing on a form modestly took seats and exchanged defiant signals with the youth of the modern side through the chinks of the crowd they have had the licking they deserve not half of it and laughter as dangle here who was present at the time will testify dangle scowled at this reference what right had the captain to score off him of course under the circumstances it was necessary to have a new election fisher here tremendous cheers amidst which the culprits considering that the storm had blown over remounted their perches would scorn to be treasurer of the clubs and everybody would scorn him too if there was any suspicion of foul play about his election he has resigned like an honest man and our business is now to elect a treasurer cheers and vote for fisher major from wally dalton rose and proposed his friend fisher major which ranger briefly seconded dangle thereupon proposed brinkman he was sorry the school was being put to the trouble of this new election they hadn't wanted it on their side and his friend had been very reluctant to stand but of course as the election was to take place he hoped brinkman would win by a majority which would show the school what fellsgarth thought about the foul play which had been tried on at the last election clapperton seconded the nomination and assured his friends that now the offence had been acknowledged and atoned for by the castigation of the offenders they would try to forget it and feel to the other side as if it had not occurred clapperton of course was cheered by his side and yet his chief admirers did not feel as proud of him as they would have liked his tone was patronizing and fellsgarth could not stand being patronized even by its captain just as the meeting was settling down for the important business of the vote a sensational incident took place the door swung open and in strode rollitt with fisher minor panting and pale at his heels the newcomer heedless of the astonishment caused by his appearance strode negligently up to the front where the other prefects were while his escort modestly slipped into the arms of his admiring friends for a moment the meeting looked on with amused bewilderment then it suddenly dawned on everybody that this meant a new voter and terrific shouts of jubilation went up from the classics during which fisher minor had his back thumped almost in two for once in his life he was a hero how he wished his young sisters could have seen him then never mind shouted percy across the room he's bound to vote the wrong side or forget to vote at all order those who vote for brinkman hold up your hands it was far too serious to humbug now even darcy was grave as he surveyed the force of the enemy 
two tellers had been appointed from either side so that the votes were counted four times and the total was not allowed till all were agreed on the result brinkman has one hundred and twenty-eight votes loud and long were the cheers which greeted this announcement the knowing ones felt that it practically meant victory for the moderns for it was one more vote than fisher major had won with last time now hands up for fisher major amid dead silence the classic hands went up anxious eyes were cast in rollitt's direction but he strange to say was all there and held up his hand with the rest fisher major himself at the last moment kept his own hand down he had decided that if brinkman voted for himself he would do the same brinkman had voted but when it came to following his example the candidate's pride went on strike and whether it lost the election or not he declined to vote three of the tellers evidently agreed but the other had to count again before he made the figure right then the written paper was handed up to york brinkman one hundred and twenty eight fisher major one hundred and twenty nine fisher is elected end of chapter eight chapter nine of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine carried nem con it must not be supposed that in the midst of the excitement of school politics the intellectual side of the fellsgarth juniors life was being quite neglected on the contrary they complained that so far from being neglected it was rather overdone the classic juniors for instance suffered many things at the hands of the cheerful mr stratton who really worked hard to instil into their opening minds some rudiments of those studies from which their side took its name he took pains to explain not only when a thing was wrong but why and unlike some of his calling he devoted his chief attention to his most backward boys this was his great offence in the eyes of darcy and wally and some of their fraternity because under the arrangement they came in for the special attention alluded to that kid said wally one day sotto voce as class was proceeding has no more idea of teaching than my hat we don't get a chance to do things ourselves with him always messing about and looking over it's rude to look over i mean to mark my exercise private in future the thing is said d'arcy if he'd anything original to say it wouldn't matter so but he's always talking the same old rot about roots what's the use of a root i should like to know if you can't bury it eh kid fisher minor to whom the question was addressed did not know and remarked that they didn't teach latin here the same way as when he learned from a governess at home he regretted this admission almost as soon as he had made it for wally and d'arcy immediately got paper and began to draw fancy portraits of fisher minor learning latin under the old regime the point of these illustrations was not so much in the figures as in the conversation the figures were more or less unlike the originals at least fisher minor declared that the three isosceles triangles piled by wally one on the top of the other were not a bit like his governess while the plum pudding on two sticks with a little pudding above for a head which emitted four huge tears the size of an orange from either eye he regarded as a simple libel on himself in one sense the likenesses were speaking that is a gibbous balloon proceeded from the mouth of each figure wherein the following dialogue was indicated governess naughty little tommy wommy didn't know his latin tommy must have a smack when he goes by by tommy boo hoo how bow yow wow oh my i'll tell my ma bring up that paper wheatfield said mr stratton wally made a wild grab at ashby's exercise and was proceeding to take it up when the master stopped him not that the other wheatfield bring it immediately whereupon wally with shame had to rejoice ashby's heart by restoring his exercise and take up in its place the fancy portrait mr stratton gazed attentively and critically at this work of art 
not at all well done wheatfield said he sit down at my table here and draw me thirty copies of it before you leave this room next boy go on wally confessed in later life that of all the impositions he had had in the course of his chequered career none had been more abominable and wearisome than this oh how he got to detest that governess and her ward and how sickening their talk became before the task was half over he sat in that room nearly three hours by the clock groaning over this task when at last he went in search of mr stratton with the original and thirty copies in his hand he felt as limp and flabby bodily and mentally as he had ever done in his life mr stratton who was having tea in his own room examined each picture in turn and rejected two as not fair copies of the original do these two again here said he wally meekly obeyed he had not a kick left in him that's better said the young master when they were done now sit down and have some tea it was a solemn meal mr stratton went quietly on with his meal looking up now and then to see that his guest was supplied with bread and butter and cake and biscuits wally was equally silent he felt sore against the master but he liked his cake and the tea was tip-top the ceremony came to an end about the same time as the cake and then mr stratton said pointing to the papers you can put them in the fire now wheatfield wally obeyed with grim satisfaction banks you can go now you must come another day and bring your friends good-bye and he shook hands i wonder if the chap's all there said wally to himself as he limped over to his quarters he forgot to jaw me wonder if i ought to have reminded him wonder who he gets his cake from i wouldn't care for many more impots like that it was pretty civil of him asking me to tea when you come to think of it not sure i shan't back him up a bit this half and make the chaps do so too wonder if he meant all four of us to come to tea one cake wouldn't go round besides there's no saying how that young cad fisher minor would behave this little episode was not without its effect on all the occupants of wally's study for that young gentleman had not the slightest intention of turning over a new leaf by himself no bother it if he was going to back up stratton the other fellows would have to back up too his one grief was that the stock of impositions stored up by the industry of the two new boys would not be likely to be wanted now which would be wicked waste d'arcy had already occasionally drawn on them and one day nearly spoiled the whole arrangement by taking up to mr wakefield fifty lines of virgil precisely five minutes after they had been awarded fortunately however his hands were exceedingly grimy at the time so that mr wakefield sent him back for ablutions before he would communicate with him and in the interval he fortunately discovered his error and instead of taking up the imposition with his clean hands he delighted the master with a knotty inquiry as to one of the active tenses of the latin verb to be however there was no saying when the impositions might not come in useful and meanwhile ashby and fisher minor were taken off the job and ordered to sit up hard with their work for stratton you know said wally propounding his scheme of moral reform in a little preliminary speech you kids are not sent up here to waste your time no more's d'arcy how do you know what i was sent up here for said d'arcy it wasn't to hear your jaw shut up i've just been having tea with stratton and we were talking about you chaps him and i i mean he and me you didn't get on to english grammar did you while you were about it asked ashby no look here you chaps no larks it would be rather a spree if we put our back into it this term wouldn't it beastly sell you know for the others and rather civil to stratton too for asking us to tea this last argument was more impressive than the first and the company said they supposed they might all right of course we may have to shut off a lark or two but unless we stick hullo i say look at those modern chaps down there punting a football on our side of the path cheek why it's cash and my young brother i say let's go and drive them off you fellows so the four descended and a brisk scrimmage ensued which resulted in the complete rout of the invaders and the capture of their football with which tremendous prize the victorious army returned to quarters and continued their discussion on moral reform yes as i was saying we shall have to stick to it a bit but young stratton all make it worth our while i fancy this hidden allusion to the tea and cake completed the speaker's argument and the party forthwith sat down with one ink-pot among them for preparation as it happened the preparation for the day was an english essay 
on your favourite animal with special attention to the spelling and the stops it was always a sore point with the classic juniors to be set an english lesson they could understand being taught latin but they considered they ought to be exempt from writing and spelling their own language it wasn't classics and they didn't like it and they oughtn't to be let in for it however it was no use growling and as the subject apart from the spelling and points was a congenial one it seemed a fair opening for the commencement of their reformed career look here said wally don't let's all have the same beast i'm going to have a dog oh i wanted a dog said fisher minor can't he's bagged have a cat no i don't like cats can't i write about a dog too that would be rot haven't you got the whole of noah's ark to pick from lions tigers ants hippopotamuses cobra de capellos how much asked d'arcy are they good to eat uncommon good will you take cobra de capellos all right said d'arcy i don't mind i shall take pigs said ashby there you are said wally there's lots left you have cows kid no if you won't let me have the dog dog in the wheat-field joke laugh you chaps interjected d'arcy i shall have rabbits said fisher minor good old rabbits did you ever keep any what were their names said wally don't you know said ashby solemnly one was called how and the other now weren't they fisher minor whereupon there was mirth at the expense of fisher minor silence having been procured d'arcy began to write cobrer de capillars is my favourite what is it bird beast or fish wally shut up bird of course bird continued the essayist it was in nor's ark and it's good eatin that's all i know about it tell us something more wally there's a good chap oh bother don't go disturbing it spoils everything the cobra ort not to be disturbed for it spoils everything it spoils your clothes and wire in wally what else does it do you might tell a chap what i'll do to you you cad and that's pull you your nose if you don't shut up retorted wally who was busy over his own theme and puis your nose if you're a cad and don't shut up there bother it that ought to do twelve lines good enough for him stuck in the stops asked ashby no by the way glad you reminded me i suppose about every four words eh something about that said ashby so d'arcy sprinkled a few stops judiciously through his copy and having done so began to abrade his partners for their slowness some time was lost in suppressing him but he was eventually disposed of under the bath which was turned upside down to accommodate him and sat upon by the other three who were thus able to continue their work in peace ashby was done first he had a congenial subject and wrote con amore i shall now say something about the pig which is my favourite animal the pig is a quadruped sometimes he is male in which case he is called a hog sometimes he is a female in which case he is called a sow pigs were rings in their noses and are fond of apple peel their young are called litter and are very untidy in their habits pig's cheek is nice to eat and pork in season is a treat the writer it was very proud of this little outbreak of poetry it is preferablest roast with sage and apple sauce i hope i have now described the pig and told you why he is my favourite fisher minor on the uncongenial topic of the rabbit found composition difficult and punctuation impossible i like rabbits next best to dogs which wally has taken mine were black and white one was one and the other the other with the white one died first of snuffles he had low beers the other had the same peculiarity and was swoped for two white mice who escaped the first night owing to the size of the bars there is a kind of rabbit called welsh rabbit that my father is fond of he says it goes best on toast but i give mine oats and bran it is a mistake for boys to keep rabbits because first they give them too much and burst them and then they give them too little and starve them which is not right and makes the rabbit skinny to eat if a boy feeds rabbits while well, he can get his mother to give him half a crown apiece to make pies of them which is very agreeable so i therefore on this account consider rabbits favourites before this conclusion had been reached wally with a complacent smile had laid down his pen flattering himself he had made a real good thing of the dog he scorned commonplace language and mindful of the eloquent periods of certain newspapers of his acquaintance had let out considerably on his favourite theme which if the spelling and punctuation had been as good as the language would have been a fine performance the dog is the sublimest gift of beficent nature to the zoogra 
speeches he has been the confidential playmate of man since before the creation he is compounded of the most pleasing traits and generally answers to the endearing name of carlo if he put his noses at the extremity of a rat-hole he will continue there ad libitum till he has his man in barbarous lands there is an exorable law ordaining muscles but it can be invaded by a little dispersion and sang for and as one side of the street is not unfrequently outside the rules so that if you take him that side the politician cannot run him in which is the walger for lagging him for not wearing muscles i have occasionally done bobies this way myself so that i am convinced of my voracity the lesson we learn from this is that dogs should be treated kindly and not injected to unkind treatment there was ice a dog with the patronymy of dogness who lived in a tub but tubs are not healthy kennels because they row all when you don't stick bricks under which teaches to be kind to our fellow animals and please our master i will only include by adding that dogs like cake which shews how like they are to boys who have kind masters that they strive to please in every way in their incapacity as the writer of this essay strives ever to endeavour that ought to fetch him said the delighted author as he dotted his last i and released d'arcy from under the bath now i vote we stow it and here there was a loud knock at the door and a senior's voice calling open the door you youngsters the intruder was dangle at sight of whom the backs of our four heroes went up what do you youngsters mean by bagging one of our balls said the modern senior give it me directly it doesn't belong to you said wally it's my young brother's do you hear give it to me said dangle he can fetch it if he wants it you're not our prefect retorted wally none of the four were more astounded than wally himself at the audacity of this speech it must have been due to the exhilarating effect of his tea and essay combined dangle was evidently unprepared for defiance of this sort and became threatening if you don't give me that ball at once i'll give the lot of you the best hiding you ever had in your lives try it we're not going to give up the ball there if percy wants it let him come for it back up you chaps in a tussle between one big boy and four small ones the odds are usually in favour of the former but dangle on the present occasion did not find his task quite as easy as he expected the juniors defended themselves with great tenacity and although the seniors blows came home pretty hard he could only deal with them one at a time it got to be a little humiliating to discover that he would have to fight hard to gain his end and his temper evaporated rapidly seizing his opportunity when fisher minor who had been fighting perhaps the least steadily of the four yet doggedly enough was within reach he struck out at him wildly determined to get him disposed of first it was a cruel blow even for a fellow in dangle's plight the small boy recoiled half stunned and uttered a yell which for an instant startled the bully before dangle had time to recover the three survivors were upon him tooth and nail at the same moment the door opened again and rollitt of all persons stood in the room he took in the situation at a glance the big boy white with rage his three assailants with heads down and lips tight pounding away and fisher minor leaning against the wall with his handkerchief to his face stop said he in a voice which suspended hostilities at once then turning to dangle he said get out dangle glared defiantly and remained where he was whereupon rollitt without another word lifted him in his arms like a child and slinging him across his shoulders marched forth wakefield's boys were just trooping up the staircase from the fields and at this strange apparition stood still and made a lane for it to pass dangle's struggles were futile the giant if he was aware of them heeded them no more than the kicking of a kitten and proceeded deliberately down the stairs past everybody juniors middle boys prefects and all and walked with his burden out at the door there every one expected the scene would end but no he walked on sedately across the green indifferent as to who saw him or what they said until he came to the door of forder's house where he entered up the stairs he stumped amid gaping juniors and menacing middle boys until he reached his captive's study where without ceremony he deposited him and not vouchsafing a word turned on his heel 
strangely enough no one had the presence of mind to challenge him or demand reparation for the insult to their house he neither dawdled nor hurried at the door a bodyguard of classics had assembled to meet him and escort him back but he had no need of their services he made his way through them as coolly as if he was coming from class and utterly indifferent to the rising clamour and shouts behind him for the moderns had by this time recovered breath enough to use their tongues reached wakefield's where without a word to any one he proceeded to his own study and shut himself in to continue the scientific experiments which had only been interrupted a few minutes before by the sudden cry of distress from the one boy in fellsgarth to whom he owed the least obligation End of chapter nine chapter ten of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten how percy got back his football it was not to be expected that in the present state of party feeling at fellsgarth the incident recorded in the last chapter would be confined to a personal quarrel between dangle and rollitt if it be true that it takes two to make a quarrel there was not much to be feared in the latter respect for rollitt was apparently unaware that he had done anything calling for general remark and went his ways with his customary indifference when dangle egged on by the indignation of his friends had gone across to find him and demand satisfaction rollitt had told him to call again to-morrow as he was busy dangle therefore called again i've come to ask if you mean to apologize for what you did the other day if you don't get out said rollitt going on with his work if you don't continued dangle you'll have to take the consequences get out if you funk it rollitt you'd better say so get out said rollitt rising slowly to his feet dangle reported when he got back to his house that argument had been hopeless yet he meant to take it out of his adversary some other way but if the principals in the quarrel were inactive their adherents on either side took care to keep up the feud the modern juniors especially who felt very sore at the indignity put upon their house took up the cudgels very fiercely secretly they admitted that dangle had cut rather a poor figure and that they could have made a much better job over the impounded football than he had by his interference but that had nothing to do with the conduct of the enemy whom they took every opportunity of defying and deriding there go the sneaks shouted lickford as the four classic juniors paraded arm in arm across the green who got licked by our chap and had to squeal for a prefect to come and help them oh my water spouts ya yeah, how now oh no not me percy shouted for the special benefit of fisher minor look at them they daren't come our side cowards daren't come on to our side of the path chimed in cash look at their short legs called ramshaw only useful for cutting away when they see a modern who got licked on the hands for cheating at elections and blubbed like anything put in coddle the four heroes walked on hearing every word and trying to appear as if they did not they spoke to one another with forced voices and mechanical smiles and did their best not to be self-conscious in the matter of their legs but as the defiance grew bolder in proportion as they walked further wally said i say this is a drop too much we can't stand this eh no the cads chimed in the other three tell you what said wally it wouldn't be a bad joke to have a punt about with their football right under their noses would it how if they bag it bother we must chance that i say said ashby if we could bag their boots first can't do that but we might wait till they're in their class after breakfast in the morning they go in half an hour before us i know they all sit near the window and are squinting out at everybody that passes won't they squirm next morning therefore at early school as percy and company sat huddled at their desks in the modern classroom biting their pens groaning over their sums and gazing dismally from the window all at the same time they had the unspeakable anguish of beholding wally darcy ashby and fisher minor with their ball 
having a ding-dong game of punt about on the sacred modern grass under their very eyes how these four enjoyed themselves and kicked about the ball nodding and kissing their hands all the while at the mortified enemy who sat like caged beasts glaring at them through their bars and gnawing their fingers in impotent fury sometimes to add a little relish to the sport they invited a passing prefect of their own house to give the ball a punt and once a neat drop kick from darcy left a muddy splotch on the face of the sundial above border's door this was too much and when a few minutes later they caught sight of the marauders waving to them and calling attention by pantomimic gesture to the fact that they were carrying off the ball once more to their own quarters percy could contain himself no longer beasts he ejaculated wheatfield said mr forder who was in charge of the class write me out fifty lines of the paradise lost and a letter of apology in latin for using bad language in class percy was conducted home by his friends that morning in a critical state he felt it necessary to kick somebody and therefore kicked them and they entirely misunderstanding his motives kicked back consequently a good deal of time was occupied in arranging matters all round on a comfortable footing by the end of which time the fraternity though marred in visage felt generally easier in its mind it was no use appealing to the modern prefects they had made a mess of it so far and weren't to be trusted nor did the course of lodging a complaint with york commend itself to the company it might be mistaken for telling tales how would it do to here entered robert the school porter with a letter addressed wheatfield minor mr forders in a scholarly hand wheatfield minor snarled percy that's not me bob what do you take me for here take it over to wakefield's and look about for the dirtiest ugliest beastliest kid you can see that's wheatfield minor you'll be sore to know him by his likeness to percy added cash by way of encouragement but wakefield's ain't forders observed the sage robert look what the envelope says true it must be meant for percy after all you go and tell him it's like his howling cheek to call me minor whoever it is and when i catch him i'll welt him do you hear very good sir i'll tell him said the porter with a grin meanwhile percy had opened the letter and caught sight of the signature he uttered a whistle of amazement hullo he cried it's from stratton whatever oh i say bob it doesn't matter about that message do you hear won't be no trouble sir said the porter if i want to give it i'll do it myself said percy whatever's it about said his friends dear wheatfield minor cheek read percy mrs stratton and i will be glad to see you and three or four of your friends to tea this evening at six i will arrange with mr forder to give you exits from preparation humph grunted percy rather civil i hear he gives rather good grub i vote we go may as well it gets us off preparation too said cash who said you were in it replied percy catch me taking you unless you behave i've a good mind to take clapperton and brinkman and dangle and fullerton this threat reduced the clan to obedience at once and percy sat down presently and wrote in his most admired style we'd feel major the major was heavily underlined is much obliged to mr stratton for his invitation to him to tea in his room and he will be glad to bring the following of his friends if he has no objection with him viz lickford ramshaw cash and cottle with kind regards from p w and sent the note over by the hand of the youngest of the modern juniors this diversion served for a time to heal the mental ravages of the morning and to occupy the attention of the company most of the afternoon case of sunday go to meeting isn't it said lickford rather mind you tog up well you chaps i'm not going to take four louts out to tea with me i promise you whereupon ensued great searchings of hearts and wardrobes to see what could be done in the way of appropriate decoration the invitation came at an awkward time for it was friday afternoon and mrs wisdom rarely sent home the washing before saturday consequently it was a work of some difficulty to muster five clean collars among the party still less as many shirt-fronts 
lickford spent at least an hour over his last sunday's shirt with ink eraser trying to get it to look tidy while cottle more ingenious neatly gummed pieces of white paper over the dirty spots on his a great discussion took place as to chokers percy who had won threatened to leave behind any one not similarly adorned it was only by adroit cajolery and persuading him that he as personal conductor of the party had a right to be sweller than the rest that he could be induced to waive the point the same argument had to be urged with regard to boots as none of the others had patent leathers which percy insisted was the first thing any one looked to see if you had on at a party it was urged that as most of the time would be spent with the feet under the table this though sound in law was not in the present case of such vital importance in equity objection waived once more finally when all was ready percy held a full dress parade of his forces and looked each of them up and down as minutely and critically as an officer of the guards inspecting his company he objected to cash wearing white gloves as he had none himself and he nearly cashiered cottle for having a coloured handkerchief because he himself had a brand-new white one at length however all these little details were arranged and as the school clock began to chime the hour the order to march was given and the company proceeded at the double to mr stratton's house mr stratton was more or less of a favourite with both sides at fellsgarth he had a small house in which were representatives of both factions but most of them of the quieter sort who being obliged to live together under one roof did not see so much to quarrel about out of doors mr stratton too took the juniors divisions of each school and so kept fairly well in touch with both and to this that he was a good all-round athlete that he had a serene and cheerful temper and what is of scarcely less importance a charming young wife and you have several very good reasons why he was one of the most popular masters at fellsgarth the juniors on the whole appreciated him when he was down on them they forgave him on account of his youth and when he complained that he could not get them to understand his precepts they asked one another whose fault was that occasionally he condoned all his offences by an act of hospitality and for once in a way betrayed that he recognised the merits of a select few of his pupils by asking them to tea this was evidently the case now and as our five young moderns trotted across the green they wished their enemies in wakefields could only have looked out and witnessed their triumph little they dreamed that at that moment wally ashby darcy and fisher minor resplendent in shirts and collars fresh from the wash with their eight hands encased in white kid and their eight feet in patent leather were standing about in mr stratton's drawing-room wondering who on earth it was whose non-arrival was preventing the ringing of the tea-bell when presently percy and his party were ushered in and discovered who were their fellow-guests it did some credit to their breeding that they remembered to go up and shake hands with mr and mrs stratton and did not immediately fly at the enemy's throat the enemy however were equally taken aback and were fully entitled to half the credit for the self-control with which the discovery was received there's no need to introduce you to one another i'm sure said mr stratton by the way wheatfield you i mean pointing to percy i must apologize for calling you minor it was very kind of you to put me right wally glared up at this and would have liked to put the matter right there and then but mrs stratton said it isn't fair to number twins at all is it unless suggested darcy blushing to find himself talking unless you reckon them half each this only mended matters to the extent of raising a laugh at the expense of the twins who felt mutually uncomfortable the tea-bell however relieved the tension come said the hostess you must take one another in no that won't do all mr wakefield's boys together two of you come this side that's right and cottle and ramshaw you go over there now you're beautifully sorted edward dear you mustn't talk till you've handed round the tea-cake to our guests lickford do you take cream and sugar and you two twins oh really dear you don't call those slices do you do let ashby cut up the cake i'm sure he knows better than you what a slice is don't you ashby apparently ashby did and the party thus genially thrown together and set to work soon began to experience the balmy influences of a convivial high tea very little was spoken at first except by mr stratton who gave a brief account of a university cricket match in which he had once played a narrative which served as a most soothing refrain to the silent exercise in which his listeners were engaged 
presently a few questions were put in by the boys followed by a few observations which gradually by the adroit piloting of the host loyally backed up by his wife developed into a discussion on the use and abuse of third man up in modern cricket after this knotty point was disposed of the talk grew more general and wally became aware that his brother was handing him the apricot jam the act simple in itself meant a great deal to wally he liked apricot jam and had not been able to get at it all the evening as he now helped himself he admitted to himself that percy was not quite such a lout as he had occasionally thought him thanks awfully percy did you like that toffee i gave you the other day rather it was spiffing said percy i say i don't mind riding home this week if you like oh don't you grind i will really i don't mind no more do i i say can you reach the butter rather better rinse this dish up here between us there's another down there similar scenes of reconciliation were taking place elsewhere cottle was asking ashby his riddle d'arcy was laying down the law in the admiring hearing of ramshaw and lickford as to the cooking of sprats on the shovel while fisher minor was telling the sympathetic mrs stratton all about the people at home mr stratton was wise enough not to disturb this state of affairs by talk of his own when however the meal began to flag and his guests one by one abandoned the attack he proposed an adjournment to the drawing-room i want the advice of you youngsters said he presently about something i dare say you all know something about i mean the old school shop the party looked guilty didn't they know the tuck shop it seems to me said mr stratton it's rather in a bad way just now don't you think so robert hasn't time to look after it and wants to give it up he says it doesn't pay and really some of his things aren't particularly nice i went and had a jam tart there this morning it was like shoe leather and the jam was almost invisible wally laughed he knew those tarts well i think it would be a pity if it was given up don't you we all want a little grub now and then besides it's an old school institution robert charges three halfpence apiece for those tarts said d'arcy yes think of that i've no doubt you could get them for half that price at penchurch what i was thinking was why shouldn't some of us carry on the shop ourselves the boys opened their eyes the idea of carrying on a tuck shop on their own account opened a vista of such endless possibilities that they were quite startled it ought to be easy enough if we manage properly said mr stratton suppose now we who are here were to form a committee and decide to run the shop how should we begin it depends on what robert left behind said percy oh we wouldn't take over any of his stuff no the first thing would be to reckon up how much we should want to start with and either club together or get some one to advance it how many tarts do you suppose are sold a day hundreds said ashby well according to robert about eighty but say one hundred that at a penny each would be about eight shillings for tarts then the ginger beer would twenty bottles do that would be three shillings fourpence supposing they cost twopence each that's eleven shillings fourpence what next apples suppose we put them down at two shillings sixpence thirteen shillings tenpence sweets well say two shillings sixpence more sixteen shillings fourpence nuts one shilling seventeen shillings fourpence it mounts up you see we ought at least to have twenty-five or thirty shillings to start with well i happen to know somebody who would lend that amount to the shareholders for a little time if we should want it now suppose we've got our money we ought to send to some of the best shops and market people in the town to see what we could get our things for as it happens mrs stratton when she was in penchurch this morning did inquire and this is her report the tarts that we should sell for a penny we could get for three farthings each so that on a hundred tarts we should make a profit of two shillings one penny and the confectioner would send his cart up every day with fresh tarts of different kinds of jam and take back yesterday's stale ones at half price that would be a great improvement wouldn't it rather said everybody then the ginger beer would you believe it if we undertake to take not less than twelve bottles a day during the half we can get them for a penny each and might sell them for three halfpence that would make a great increase in the demand i fancy in every bottle we can sell we make a dear halfpenny profit the same with the sweets 
you can get most sorts for nine or ten pence a pound and if we sell at a penny an ounce you see we get seven or eight pence profit i should vote for only getting the best kind of sweets and making rather less profit than that at any rate you see if we are careful we ought pretty soon to be able to pay back what we owe and after providing for the expense of a person to mind the shop and do the selling put by a little week by week which will go to the school clubs or anything else the fellows decide what do you think of the plan they all thought it would be magnificent i see no reason why you youngsters should not manage it splendidly by yourselves as soon as you get once started you'll have to draw up strict rules of course for managing the shop and make up the accounts and look out sharp that you aren't selling anything at a loss remember the cheaper you can sell provided you get a fair profit the more customers you'll have and the better your stuff is the more it will be liked mrs stratton says she will act as banker and take care of the money at the end of each day and pay out what you want for stores don't say anything about it out of doors at present talk it over among yourselves during the week and if you think it will work tell me and we'll have a regular business meeting to settle preliminaries now suppose we have a game of crambo when the party broke up moderns and classics strolled affectionately across the green arm in arm deep in confabulation as to the projected shop when they reached the door of wakefield's wally said by the way have any of you chaps lost a football there's one kicking about in our room hang outside and i'll chuck it to you out of the window which he did and the ball proved to be the very one the moderns had lost a week ago how curious end of chapter ten chapter eleven of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven fellsgarth versus rendlesham how it came that rollitt played after all in the rendlesham match no one could properly understand his name was not down on the original list yorke had given up asking him to play as he always either excused himself or what was worse promised to come and failed at the last moment after the defeat of the moderns at the second election the question of the selection of the fifteen had been allowed to drop and those who were keen on victory hoped no further difficulty would arise two days before the match however brinkman was unlucky enough to hurt his foot and to his great mortification was forbidden by the doctor to play the news of his accident caused general consternation as he was known to be a good forward and a useful man in the scrimmage clapperton increased the difficulty by coming over to say that as brinkman was laid up he had arranged for corder to play instead corder as it happened was a modern senior a small fellow and reputed an indifferent player he wouldn't do at all said yorke decisively why not surely we've got a right to find a substitute for our own man said clapperton testily what do you mean by your own man who cares tuppence whose man he is as long as he plays up the fifteen are fellsgarth men and no more yours than they are mine if they were as much mine as yours no one would complain you mean to say that if you were captain of the fifteen you'd put quarter in the team for a first-class match why not there are plenty worse than he there are so many better that he is out of the question that means only five of our men are to play against ten of yours you're talking rot clapperton and you know it if i'm captain i'll choose my own team if you don't like it or if the best fifteen men in the school aren't in it you are welcome to complain i hope you will it strikes me pretty forcibly our fellows won't fancy being snubbed like this it would be a bad job if they showed as much on the day of the match it would be a bad job for them said the captain when yorke repeated this disagreeable conversation to his friends later on they pulled long faces i suppose he means they don't intend to play up said dalton if that's so said fisher major why not cut them all out 
and make up the fifteen of fellows you can depend on that wouldn't do said yorke i expect when the time comes they'll play up all right after all clapperton and fullerton are two of our best men but what about the vacant place i've four or five names all better than corder said the captain but none of them as good as brinkman the company generally it is to be feared did not lament as honestly as york did the accident to their rival they did not profess to rejoice of course still they bore the blow with equanimity next morning to the astonishment of everybody the notice-board contained an abrupt announcement in the captain's hand that in consequence of brinkman's inability to play rollitt would take his place in the fifteen yorke himself could not account for this sudden act of patriotism rollitt he said had looked into his room last night at bedtime and said i'll play on saturday and vanished fisher minor was perhaps of all persons better able to explain the mystery than any one else he had overheard in ranger's study a general lamentation about the prospects for saturday and a wish expressed by his brother that rollitt were not so unsociable and undependable everybody agreed it was utterly useless to ask him to play and that they would have to get a second-rate man to fill the empty place and so most probably lose the match fisher minor heard all this and when presently on his way to his own den he passed rollitt's door a tremendous resolution seized him to take upon himself the duty of ambassador extraordinary for the school rollitt appeared to owe him no grudge for throwing stones the other day and had already come to his relief handsomely at the time of the second election and in the affair with dangle on the whole fisher minor thought he might venture rollitt was reading hard by the light of one candle when he entered please rollitt said the boy would you ever mind playing for the school on saturday rollitt looked up in such evident alarm that fisher minor put his hand on the latch of the door and made ready to bolt i'll see get out said rollitt and fisher minor did get out it was really too absurd to suppose that rollitt was going to play in the fifteen to oblige fisher minor so at least thought that young gentleman and remained discreetly silent about his interview hoping devoutly no one would hear of it the joy of the classics was almost equal to the fury of the moderns the latter could not deny that rollitt was a host in himself and worth a dozen quarters yet it galled them to see him quietly put in the vacant place and to hear the jubilation on every hand for rollitt was the fellow who had publicly insulted the moderns in the person of dangle and not only that but poor and shabby as he was had shown himself utterly indifferent to their indignation and contemptuous of their threats why dangle said the fellow's a pauper he can't even pay for his clubs his father's a common fellow i'm told yes and i heard said brinkman his fees up here are paid for him why he might just as well have bob in the fifteen a jolly sight better bob knows how to be civil it is a crime to be poor said fullerton i hope i shall never commit it well said clapperton ignoring this bit of sarcasm if he was well enough off to buy a cake of soap once a term it wouldn't be so bad i believe when he wants a wash he goes down to mrs wisdom and borrows a bit of hers by the way that reminds me said dangle did you fellows ever hear about mrs wisdom's boat the lout had it out the other day in the rapids and let it go over the falls and it got smashed up what exclaimed everybody do you mean said brinkman poor widow wisdom has lost her boat owing to that cad why she'll be ruined however is she to get a new one that's the extraordinary thing said dangle it was she told me about it she says that rollitt went straight away to the lake and bought her a boat that was for sale there and she's got it now down in the lower reach and it's a better one than the other what exclaimed clapperton incredulously rollitt bought a new boat bosh 
it was a second-hand one for sale cheap but it cost five pounds she showed me the receipt stuff and nonsense she was gammoning you said clapperton all right said dangle snappishly you're not obliged to believe it unless you like and there the conversation ended the day of the great match came at last the rendlesham men who had to come from a distance were not due till one o'clock and as may be imagined the interval was peculiarly trying to some of the inhabitants of fellsgarth the farce of morning school was an ordeal alike to masters and boys if gazing up at the clouds could bring down the rain a deluge should have fallen before ten a m as the hour approached the impatience rose to fever heat it was the first match of the season for the last three years the two teams had met in deadly combat and each time the match had ended in a draw with not one goal kicked on either side victory or defeat to-day would be a crisis in the history of fellsgarth woe betide the man who missed a point or blundered a kick percy and his friends put on flannels in honour of the occasion and sallied out an hour before the time to look at the ground and inspect the new goal and flag-posts which fisher major as the first act of his treasurership had ordered for the school it disgusted them somewhat to find that wally and his friends also in flannels were on the spot before them and having surveyed the new acquisitions had calmly bagged the four front central seats in the pavilion reserved by courtesy for the headmaster and his ladies since the tea at mr stratton's the juniors had abated somewhat of their immemorial feud although the relations were still occasionally subject to tension hello you kids cried wally as his brother approached how do you do pretty well this morning that's right so are we have a seat plenty of room in the second row considering that no one had yet put in an appearance this was strictly correct yet it did not please the modern juniors you'll get jolly well turned out when ringwood comes said percy come on you chaps added he to his own friends what's the use of sitting on a bench like schoolboys an hour before the time let's have a trot mind you don't dirty your white bags cried d'arcy no we might be mistaken for classic kids if we did shouted coddle ha ha whereupon and not before time the friends parted for a while when percy and company returned they found the pavilion was filling up and greatly to their delight the front row was empty the enemy had been cleared out and served them right come on you chaps said lickford don't let's get stuck in there come over to the oak tree and get up there it's the best view in the field alas when they got to the oak tree four friendly voices hailed them from among the leaves how are you modern kids there's a ripping view up here have an acorn mind your eye sorry we're full up plenty of room up the poplar tree the moderns scorned to reply and walked back sulkily to the pavilion not without parting greetings from their friends up the oak tree and squatted themselves on the steps the place was filling up now mrs stratton was there with some visitors all the little wakefields were there of course minor minimus and minimissima as they were called uttering war-whoops in honour of their house and there was a knot of rendlesham fellows talking among themselves and generally taking stock of the fellsgarth form mr stratton in civilian dress as became the umpire was the first representative of the school to show up on the grass a distant cheer from the top of the oak tree hailed his arrival and louder cheers still from the steps of the pavilion indicated that the popular master was not the private property of any faction in fellsgarth to fisher minor it was amazing how mr stratton could talk and laugh as pleasantly as he did with the umpire for the other side he felt sure he could not have done it himself suddenly it occurred to fisher minor by what connection of ideas he could not tell what an awful thing it would be if rollitt were to forget about the match the horror of the idea which had all the weight of a presentiment sent the colour from his cheeks and without a word to anybody he slid down the tree and began to run with all his might towards the school what's the row collie wobbles asked d'arcy 
but no one was in a position to answer a fusillade of acorns from the tree and derisive compliments of well run bravo short legs from the pavilion steps greeted the runner as he passed that warm corner he didn't care even the captain and his own brother whom he met going down the field of battle did not divert him he rushed panting up the stairs and into rollitt's study rollitt was sitting at the table taking observations of a crumb of bread through a microscope rollitt gasped the boy the match it's just beginning and you promised to play do come or we shall be licked rollitt took a further look at the crumb and then got up i forgot said he come on fisher minor aren't you going to put on flannels asked the boy why said rollitt roughly stalking out fisher minor wondered if the reason was that he had none but he was too full of his mission to trouble about that and keeping his prize well in sight for fear he should go astray had the satisfaction of seeing him arrive on the field of battle just as the opposing forces were taking their places and just as the classic seniors were inwardly calling themselves fools for having depended for a moment on a hopeless fellow of this sort the classic juniors felt a good deal compromised by the champion's shabby cloth trousers and flannel shirt but they cheered lustily all the same while the moderns having expressed their indignation to one another relieved their feelings by laughing but a moment after everybody forgot everything but the match the rendlesham men looked very trim and dangerous in their black and white uniform and when presently their captain led off with a magnificent place kick which flew almost into the school lines classics and moderns forgot their differences and squirmed with a common foreboding furlerton promptly returned the ball into medius race and the usual inaugural scrimmage ensued to the knowing ones who judged from little things it seemed that the present match was likely to be as even as any of its predecessors the forwards were about equally weighted and the quarter and half-backs who hovered outside seemed equally alert and light-footed presently the ball squeezed out on the school side and gave ranger the first chance of a run he used it well and with fisher major and york on his flanks got well past the rendlesham forwards amid loud cheers from the oak tree but the enemy's quarterback pinned him in a moment yet not before he had passed the ball neatly to fisher on his left fisher struggled on a few yards further with the captain and dangle backing up but had to relinquish the ball to the former before he could reach the half-backs york always wary and cool-headed had measured the forces against him and as soon as he had the ball ran back a step or two to break the ugly rush of two of the enemy who were nearest and then with a sweep distanced them and charging through their half-backs made a dash for the goal for a moment friend and foe held their breath he looked like doing it but in his detour he had given time for blackstone the rendlesham fast runner to get under way and sweep down to meet him just as he reeled out of the clutches of the half-backs next moment york was down and dangle was not there to pick up the ball this rush served pretty well to exhibit the strong and weak points of either side it was evident for instance that both ranger and york were men to be marked by the other side and that dangle on the contrary was playing slack a series of scrimmages followed in the midst of which the ball gravitated back to the centre of the field runs were attempted on either side once or twice the ball went out into touch and once or twice a drop kick sent it flying over the forwards heads but it came back inevitably so that after twenty minutes hard play it lay in almost the identical spot from which it had first been kicked off the onlookers began to feel a little depressed it was not to be a walk-over for the school at any rate indeed it seemed doubtful whether from the last and toughest of these scrimmages the ball would ever emerge again to the light of day suddenly however it became evident that the status quo was about to give way 
and that the fortunes of either side were going to take a new turn no one in the game still less outside could at first tell what had happened then it occurred to york and one or two others that rollitt who had hitherto been playing listlessly and sleepily was waking up his head high above his fellows was seen violently agitated in the middle of the scrimmage and presently it struggled forward till it came to where the ball lay a moment later the rendlesham side of the scrimmage showed signs of breaking and a moment after that rollitt quickly picking up the ball burst through both friend and foe back up dangle back up ranger shouted york look out behind cried the rendlesham captain rollitt carried that ball pretty much as he had carried dangle a day or two before almost contemptuously indifferent as to who opposed him or who got in his way the only difference was that whereas he then walked now he ran and when rollitt chose to run as fellsgarth knew even ranger the swift-footed was not in it the enemy's forwards were shaken off and their quarter-backs distanced the half-backs closed on him with a simultaneous charge that made him reel but he kept his feet better than they and staggered on with one of them hanging to his arm look out in goal shouted the rendlesham men back up you fellows cried york in his struggle with a man on his arm rollitt lost pace enough to enable blackstone to overtake and make a wild dash not at the man but the ball the onslaught was partly successful for the ball fell dangle who was close behind made an attempt to pick it up but before he could do so rollitt like a hound momentarily checked dashed back to recover it himself knocking over as he did so both dangle and blackstone he had it again and once more was off this time with only the enemy's back to intercept him the back did his best and sacrificed himself nobly for his side but he was no match for the fellsgarth giant who simply rode over him and followed by a mighty roar of cheering from the onlookers carried the ball behind the goals touching it down with almost fastidious precision exactly halfway between the poles a minute later and york with one of his beautifully neat places had sent the ball spinning over the bar as unmistakable a goal as the school had ever kicked the cheers which followed this exploit were completely lost on rollitt who having completed his run dawdled back to his fellow forwards and had not even the curiosity to watch the issue of the captain's kick as the sides changed ends dangle with a black face came up to him you knocked me over on purpose then you cad i could see it snarled he get out said rollitt shouldering the speaker aside this was too much for dangle full of rage he went to york i don't mean to stand this york rollitt shut up said the captain spread out you fellows and be ready go to your place dangle dangle sullenly obeyed i'll let you see if i'm to be insulted and made a fool of before all the school growled he catch me bothering myself any more as if to give him an opportunity of enforcing his protest the kick-off of the losing side fell close at his feet he picked it up and for a moment the sporting instinct prompted him to make a rush but he caught sight of york and rollitt both looking his way and the bad blood in him prevailed he deliberately sent the ball with a little side-kick into blackstone's hands who running forward a step sent it with a mighty drop right over the school line it almost grazed the goal-post as it passed and it was all fullerton could do to save the touchdown before the whole advance guard of the enemy were upon him the whole thing had been so wilfully done that there was no mistaking its meaning hold the ball cried york as the side ranged out for the kick-off dangle get off the field what do you mean said dangle very white what i say you'll either do that or be kicked off here clapperton interposed don't go dangle he's no right to turn you off or talk to you like that before the field because of an accident if you go i'll go too go both of you then said york the two modern boys looked for a moment as though they doubted their own ears what could york mean in the middle of a critical match like this he evidently meant what he said are you going or not said he 
it was a choice of evils to play now would be to surrender to stay where they were would render them liable to a kicking in the presence of all fellsgarth they sullenly turned on their heels and walked behind the goals most of the spectators supposed that it was a case of sprained ankle or some such damage received in the cause of the school but the acute little birds who sat in the oak tree were not to be deceived and took good care to point the moral of the incident for the public benefit wirroo cads kicked out serve em right good riddance play up you chaps the chaps needed no encouragement with two men short it was next to impossible to add to their present advantage but they contrived to stand their ground and save the school goal and when at last the welcome no side was called the cheers which greeted them proclaimed that the school had won that day one of the biggest victories on its record End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve the moderns on strike in the festivities with which the glorious victory of the school against rendlesham was celebrated york took no part the captain was very decidedly down in the mouth this was the end of his endeavour to administer rule with a perfectly even hand and give no ground for a whisper of anything like unfair play to the opposition this was what his popularity and authority were valued at for the first time in her annals fellsgarth fellows had mutinied on the field of battle and to their captain's face had it been dangle only it would have mattered less his feud with rollitt was notorious and would account for any ebullition of bad temper but when clapperton not only patronized the mutiny but joined in it things were come to a crisis which it required all york's courage and coolness to cope with it might have solaced him if he could have heard a discussion which was taking place in the rebels quarters it served them precious well right said clapperton trying to justify what to say the least of it wanted some excuse we'd stood it long enough it's bad enough said dangle to have the fifteen packed with classic fellows but when they take to attacking us before the whole field it's time something was done i am as certain as possible that rollitt deliberately knocked me over that time it was rather warm measures though said brinkman to walk off the field we might have got licked i am not at all sure if it wouldn't have been a very good thing if we had said clapperton at any rate it will be a lesson to them what it might come to nothing like scuttling a ship in mid-ocean if you want to be attended to the only awkward thing is you are apt to go down with it said fullerton do shut up and don't try to be funny said clapperton of course no one wants to wreck the clubs we shall play up hard next time and then they'll see it's worth their while to be civil to us yes said brinkman it won't do to let them say we aren't the friends of the school there is not the least fear of any one thinking that now gibed fullerton well said dangle as we are to play the return with rendlesham this day week we shall have a chance of letting them see what we can do only if that cad rollitt plays it won't be easy to be civil these patriotic young gentlemen were a good deal disconcerted next morning to find that they had been reckoning without their host the captain had posted up the fifteen to play next week the list contained the names of fullerton brinkman and two others on the modern side but omitted those of clapperton and dangle in their wildest dreams the malcontents had never reckoned on the captain taking such a step as this they knew that they were necessary to the efficiency of any team and that without them especially against rendlesham it would be almost a farce to go into the field at all at first they were disposed to laugh and sneer then to bluster then it dawned on them gradually that for once in their lives they had made a mistake they had not even the credit 
of refusing to play but had been ignominiously kicked out a council of war was held in which mutual recriminations assisted by fullerton's candid reflections on the situation occupied a considerable share of the time the result of their deliberations was that clapperton and dangle went over in no very amiable frame of mind to the captain yorke as it happened was having an uneasy conference with his own side at the time delighted as the classics were at the blow which had been struck at the mutineers the prospect of almost certain defeat next saturday made them anxious for compromise if i were you said fisher major i'd give them a chance of explaining and apologising there can be no apology said yorke you are quite right in theory said denton but wouldn't it be rather a crow for them to see that we are licked without them we mustn't be licked said the captain we held our own without them yesterday yes but we were on our own ground and had a goal to the good before they struck i think old york is quite right said ranger we may be licked and if we are they'll crow on the other hand if we let them play now they'll crow worse i think we'd better be beaten by rendlesham than by traitors shan't you let them play at all this half said fisher that depends on themselves said yorke hullo here they come said ranger the two moderns were a little disconcerted to find themselves confronted with the body of classic seniors oh you're engaged said clapperton we'll come again no we were talking about the team i suppose that's what you've come about yes said clapperton we want to know what it means really i don't see how it could have been put plainer it means that the fifteen men named are going to play on saturday look here yorke said clapperton if you think i've come over here to beg you to put dangle and me into the team you're mistaken i don't think it you know it's impossible all i can say is it's sheer spite and nothing else dangle was deliberately knocked over by that cad rollitt who is not present and may therefore be called names with safety said ranger shut up ranger there's a good fellow said the captain and dangle had a right to object continued clapperton he had no right to play into the hands of the other side said yorke how do you know i did said dangle do you mean to say you didn't said yorke i didn't come here to be catechized by you are you going to put clapperton and me in the fifteen or not that's what we came to know no certainly not said the captain and as that's all you may as well go very well sneered clapperton who was in a high temper you'll be sorry for it come on dangle there's only one thing to be done now said he when they had got back to their own side we must none of us play that will bring them to reason brinkman approved of the idea there's more sense in that said he than you two sticking out that will reduce the team to a classic fifteen and if they get licked it won't matter there's no possible chance of their making up a fifteen without us asked dangle not at all they haven't the men said clapperton brightening up the fact is we have them at our mercy and if they want us to play again they'll have to ask us properly meanwhile fairsgarth will get on splendidly said fullerton shut up don't you see it will be all the better for everybody in the long run i can't say as i do at present it may come by and by we must see that everybody backs up in this said brinkman one traitor would spoil everything that's what york said on saturday wasn't it asked fullerton innocently at least he said two traitors york will not see that what's right for one fellow is naughty for another look here fullerton said clapperton who was sensitive enough to feel the sting of all this you don't suppose we're doing this for fun do you will you promise not to play on saturday even if you are asked what if i don't said fullerton you won't find it particularly comfortable on this side of the school that's all said brinkman fullerton meditated and turned the matter over 
"I think, on the whole," said he, mimicking Clapperton, "that as this is for the highest good of the School, and as everybody is to be all the better in the long run, and as we're all going to be noble and sacrifice ourselves together, you may put me down as not playing on Saturday. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. I beg pardon. I'm not on the classic side yet." the other players named on the list consented more or less reluctantly to follow the same example after morning school therefore when the fellows looked at the notice-board they saw to their bewilderment the names of the four modern fellows struck out and the following note appended to the captain's list notice the following players protest against the exclusion of two names from the above list and decline to play on saturday viz brinkman fullerton ramshaw major and smith underneath this a juvenile hand had carefully inscribed in bold characters jolly good riddance of bad rubbish signed wheatfield w darcy ashby fisher minor fisher minor who signed this latter manifesto by proxy had hastened to carry the news of it to his brother the cads said the junior we are sure to be beaten i shall never dare to get rollitt twice running what do you mean asked the elder brother turning round oh don't tell said fisher minor i didn't mean to say anything you see i thought he wouldn't fly out so i asked him last time you what do you know of rollitt why should he play to oblige you fisher minor wishing he had not mentioned rollitt's name related somewhat apologetically the story of the adventure on the shale why said the elder brother you saved his life young un no wonder he's civil to you oh please don't tell him i told you all right but what about the boat it must have been smashed to bits what did mrs wisdom say oh rollitt was very honourable and bought her another she told me so and i've seen the new boat rollitt bought it why he's as poor as a church mouse how could he get the money i'd like to know he got it the very next day said fisher minor i suppose he had some but promise you won't say anything what's the use of making a secret of it i won't say anything unless you like but i must go to york the captain was quite prepared for the action of the moderns they've struck said he now the question is shall we play on saturday or scratch the match the unanimous verdict was in favour of playing whatever the result of course we are never sure of rollitt until we've got him said he so we may have to play without him would stratton play for us asked some one no don't let's go outside and ask masters we're in for a licking but we'll make the best fight we can so yet another notice appeared on the board before nightfall the school team on saturday will consist of the following here follow the names all of course on the classical side a meeting of the clubs is summoned for october three at four p m in hall of these two announcements the first amused the second perplexed the good young men of the modern side the new fifteen consisted half of raw outsiders who had never played in a first-class match before and were utterly unknown to fame on the football field but the summons for october three was puzzling did it mean a general row or was the captain going to resign or was an attempt to be made to expel the mutineers clapperton did not like it he had expected york would have come to terms before now and it disconcerted him to see that on the contrary the captain seemed determined to carry the thing through the only thing of course was for the moderns to abstain in a body from the meeting but could they depend on their forces to obey their leaders it was all very well to compel four players to refuse to act but to constrain one hundred and twenty boys to do the same was a less easy task it seemed to clapperton that he would do best to strike the iron while hot and for that purpose he made a descent next morning into the quarters of his fag if he could secure the juniors it would be something he found percy there alone diligently working that young gentleman had in fact been reminded in pretty forcible terms by mr forder that he had not yet handed in his latin letter of apology ordered a week ago percy had hoped if he forgot it long enough mr forder would forget it too and it had startled and grieved him very much to-day to receive notice that unless he brought his pena in an hour he would be sent up to the doctor consequently while his comrades were out enjoying themselves he was here in a shocking bad temper with a latin dictionary in front of him trying to express his contrition for having used bad language in class a week ago 
he had got a little way latin prose for a modern junior is a trifle thorny but percy had a rough and ready way with him which if it did not emulate cicero at least made his meaning tolerably clear care magisteri fordere ego sum excessive tristis ut ego usibam malam linguam in classum alteram diem ego apologizo et ego non facerebo illud iteram ego spera ut vos volantas pro denere it took him some time to arrive at this classical term for you will forgive me hanc tempus this was all very well but it only took up about six lines out of ten and he was in despair how to continue his ideas his temper and his latin had all evaporated when clapperton entered he did not even look up cut whoever you are and hang yourself said he hello percy what's the row with you don't talk to me said percy it's that beast forder where are the others i want to talk to you youngsters how do i know where every ass in the place is what do you want the tone in which the inquiry was made was not encouraging it's about the meeting next week we don't mean to attend it don't you our lot does we're going rather it's a dodge of the other side they're going to get the clubs into their own hands and we've decided none of our fellows shall go then they can't do anything can't they you don't know my young brother wally as well as i do he'll do something bless you but i rather fancy they won't have it all to themselves we'll put a spoke in their wheels look here young wheatfield said clapperton put out by the obtuseness of his fag the long and short of it is you're not to go you know what's happened our side has been snubbed and cut out of the games by those fellows and now they want to get us to come to their precious meeting to help them collar the clubs that's just why i and my chaps are going to turn up said percy we'll let them know do you hear what i say you're not to go you or any of them if you can't understand the reason i dare say you'll understand a thrashing you'll get it unless you stand out like the rest of us i say what's the latin for wrong clapperton do you hear what i say yes yes is it malice or unrectus or what are you going to do what i tell you how can i say what the chaps'll do you must tell them you're fags captain they must do what you tell them i'd jolly well like to catch them not said percy tossing his head i'd teach em i say do you think unrectus will do remember you'll get it pretty hot if you disobey in this i promise you perhaps malice is better form suggested the junior clapperton left in despair what a fearful ass i was said percy when he had gone not to make him write my impot just like me catch our lot not going to that meeting we ain't going to skulk whoo there goes the quarter too i shall never get done this brutal thing id est malus non facere quod magister dicit vos volantes litus adiri et ut felsgarthus liquibat reldeshamus ad pendembalum super saturdium durare saturday last nos astenabanus unum goalum ad nil quod non erat malum ego debeo nunc concludere ego sum vestrum fideliter per sias granum aguam percy flattered himself he knew the correct latin for his own name he had a rush to get this work of art over to mr forder in time and was considerably mortified to observe that the master did not seem at all gratified by the performance just like forder the more you laid yourself out to please him the worse he was leave it sir i'll speak to you to-morrow that means a licking said percy to himself i can see it in his eye all serene that's his way of showing his gratitude and he went back in a very bad temper to his own room where his comrades had arrived to greet him why ever can't you chaps be in the way when you're wanted prowled percy there was clapperton in here just now talking rot about the meeting next week what do you think he says we're not to go to it why not percy in his lucid manner tried to explain all gammon said lickford if we're to be stopped going to hall we shall be stopped grub next this was an argument that went home if clapperton had made it worth our while you know said cottle it might have been different i don't care much about the meeting but if i stop away for him i'll get something for it this mercenary view of the subject was new to percy but he frankly accepted it i tell you what said he 
here give us a pen we'll just draw up a few conditions if he accepts them we'll stay away if he don't he may hang himself before we sit out after much deliberation the following charter of six points was drawn up and laid on clapperton's table on the following conditions the undersigned will stop out of hall on october three namely to wit viz that is one no more fagging two don't go to bed till nine thirty three a study a piece four the prefects shall be abolished any prefect reporting to forda to be kicked five except between nine thirty p m and seven thirty a m we do as we like six that the four following classic cads get their noses pulled namely wheatfield w darcy ashby and fisher minor if these are agreed to we won't go to the meeting signed by wheatfield p m p coddle major-general lickford d d ramshaw minor f s a cash l l d etc etc end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen quarter to the front the morning of the return match with rendlesham was damp and muggy and so assorted well with the spirits of fellsgarth generally the juniors of course were cheerful everything came in the day's work for them but among the seniors on either side gloom prevailed even ranger the light-hearted was snappish as his fag discovered and denton the amiable hoped he would not for his temper's sake meet too many moderns between morning and evening the captain though he kept up his usual show of serenity was evidently worried but he had no notion of giving in no if the school was to be thrashed let them take their thrashing like men and not whine about like the other boys after all said he to ranger we may not get glory but we needn't lose it only for goodness sake let us keep our rows to ourselves and not talk about them out of doors right you are said his friend i wish i had your temper the cads and after the way you've treated them too why some of us thought you went out of your way to favour them the captain grunted and began to throw his flannels into his bag what about rollitt he asked no go he's gone off for a day's fishing the captain whistled dismally then we must play a man short there's no one else worth putting in it's like marching to one's execution he said i wish it was all over but it's only just beginning the moderns were gloomy too they had taken their course and they must stand by it now when they came to reflect it was not a particularly glorious one nor did it seem to promise much by way of compensation they were done out of football for the rest of the term they were reduced to a faction in fellsgarth and what was worse they were secretly doubtful whether they were quite as much in the right as they tried to persuade themselves they had taken their course however and must go on i suppose none of our side will go on the omnibus said brinkman why not said clapperton it will do them good to have spectators i shall go not that i care about it but just to assert my rights hurrah for self-sacrifice said fullerton if your principles will allow you to take chicken and tongue sandwiches with you i'll go too it's ten to one they'll try to prevent our going said dangle i hope they'll try when the two coaches drove up to carry the fifteen and the prefects and other privileged boys to the scene of conflict a good deal of surprise was evinced at the appearance of clapperton brinkman dangle and fullerton in ordinary costume and without bags ready to accompany the party contrary to their expectations and hopes no protest was made and as far as the classic seniors were concerned no notice was vouchsafed them this was annoying particularly as the juniors present took care to call attention to their presence look at em cried wally don't they look clever kicked out of the team serve em right shouted ashby 
who's kicked out retorted the modern fags it would take better chaps than you to kick them out don't you wish you could kick them in they know better retorted percy and company amid such embarrassing comments the four modern heroes mounted to their places the cheers of their adherents hardly made up for the chilly welcome of their travelling companions yorke seeing clapperton looking for a place politely moved up to make room and then turned his back and talked to ranger the other three were similarly cut off dangle finding himself in between fisher major and denton who talked across him brinkman on another coach was tucked in among some rowdy classic middle boys who were discussing the strike very vigorously among themselves as for fullerton he was lucky enough to get the seat beside the driver where at any rate he could count on one sympathetic soul into whose ears to pour his occasional words of wisdom just as the first coach was starting a shout was heard from across the green and corder the modern boy whose services were declined on the previous occasion equipped in an ulster and with his bag in his hand appeared signalling for the cortege to wait well what is it demanded dangle is yorke there yorke can i play to-day no you can't said dangle in a menacing undertone none of us are playing you know that i don't see why i mayn't play if i have the chance said corder i awfully want to play in the fifteen we're a man short said yorke you can play corder if you dare to come and play said dangle still in a whisper you'll find it so precious hot for yourself afterwards that you'll be sorry for it yorke says i may play persisted corder i don't see why i shouldn't cad traitor blackleg yelled percy and company as they saw their man mount the coach ha ha got one man among you who isn't a coward and a sneak and a howling kid retorted wally gee up whereat the whips cracked and the happy party drove off corder was one of those obtuse youths who can never take in more than one idea at a time his present idea was football he had come up this term with a consuming ambition to get into the fifteen and had played hard and desperately to secure his end last week when brinkman was obliged to retire he thought his chance was come and great was his mortification when he found that his nomination was not accepted by the captain still he didn't despair when he saw the vacancies caused in the team by the defection of the moderns his hopes rose again but once more they were dashed by the captain's announcement of a fifteen made up wholly of classics to-day he had not had the heart to come out and see the coaches start and was moping in his own room when some one brought in word that rollitt was not going to play after all and that the team was setting out a man short whereupon corder dashed into his ulster flung his flannels into his bag and tore out of his house just in time to secure for himself the long-coveted honour and find himself in the glorious position of playing for the school how was such a fellow likely to trouble his head about strikes and protests and organised desertion fortunately for the comfort of his journey he had to pack himself away on the floor between the feet of ridgeway and another of the team who if they kicked him at all only did it by accident or by way of encouragement and not as dangle or brinkman might have done in spite the rain was coming down pretty steadily by the time the party got to their destination and the gloom on the brows of the four modern prefects deepened as they looked up and speculated on the delights of standing for an hour on the wet grass watching their rivals play dangle said clapperton we must stop that cad quarters playing at all cost it will upset everything come and talk to him but corder perhaps with an inkling of what was in store for him had entrenched himself behind a number of other players and in close proximity to ranger who had evidently told himself off to see that the last recruit of the fifteen was not tampered with 
the signals of the two seniors were studiously not observed and when dangle getting desperate said quarter half a minute clapperton wants you ranger interposed with come on you fellows it's time we got into our flannels and effectually checkmated the manoeuvre if he doesn't get paid out for this growled clapperton i'm precious mistaken yes and the other fellows must see that he is if this sort of thing spreads we may as well cave in at once the rendlesham fellows hovered about under shelter till the last moment grumbling at the weather the grass and the dock at length the fellsgarth boys put in an appearance sides were solemnly tossed for and the order to spread out was given hello said one of the rendlesham men as he passed clapperton and dangle why aren't you playing afraid of the cold no we scratch because have you got that big man down who was so hot in the scrimmages i forget his name he's not one of the delicate ones i fancy no more are we we're not playing because hello they're waiting said the player and went off leaving the explanation still unfinished one of the last to run out was quarter you young cad growled clapperton as he passed take my advice and don't play unless come on quarter waiting shouted york quarter obeyed like lightning the match began disastrously for fellsgarth within five minutes of the kick-off a run-up by one of the rendlesham quarterbacks carried the ball right into the school lines and a touchdown resulted on a fine day like last saturday a goal would have been certain but on the wet grass the try did not come off but five minutes later a drop kick from the middle of the field by the rendlesham captain secured a magnificent goal for the home team clapperton sneered what i expected said he they'll be lucky if they don't lose a dozen york on the contrary was cheering up bad as these opening ten minutes had been he fancied his team was not going to do so badly after all the new players were working like mad in the scrimmage ranger was as quick on his feet in the wet as in the dry and quarter at half-back had been surprisingly steady before kicking off again he made one or two changes he moved ridgeway who was a heavyweight up into the forwards quarter greatly to his delight was entrusted with the goal and fisher major moved up to half-back the forwards were ordered on no account to break loose but if necessary to keep the ball among them till time was called then with his well-known on you go he backed off the ball was almost immediately locked up in a tight fierce scrimmage the boys took the captain's advice with a vengeance and held the ball among their feet doggedly neither letting it through on their side nor forcing it out on the side of the enemy at length however it could be seen filtering out sideways just where the captain was hovering outside the scrimmage let it come he whispered look out ranger next moment the ball was under his arm and before any one realized that the scrimmage was up he was off with it and among the enemy's half-backs the half-backs knew york of old and closed upon him before he could double or get round them pass shouted ranger it was beautifully done while york was falling and ranger brushing past the enemy's half-backs were not in it with the fleet fellsgarth runner nor was their back and to their own utter amazement three minutes later the school placed to their credit an easy goal then did clapperton and dangle and brinkman gnash their teeth till they ached and fullerton standing near had his gibe it was worth coming here in the rain to see that wasn't it the match was not yet over the rendlesham men startled into attention by this unexpected rebuff took care that such a misadventure should not happen again and making all the use they could of their superior weight bore down the scrimmages and forced the ball into the open once they carried it through with a splendid rush and their captain picking it up under the very feet of the boys ran it forward a few yards and took a drop kick which missed by only a few inches a little later came quarter's chance he had lived all the term for this moment if he was taken back to fellsgarth on a shutter he would not care so long as he did himself credit now he had a clear field to start with and was well out of touch before the advance guard of the enemy bore down on him then it was a sight to see him 
wriggle and dodge and twist and turn in and out among them threading them like a needle through a string of beads and slipping through their hands like an eel well played indeed quarter cried york oh what music was in the sound what would he not dare now on he went now diving under an arm now staggering round a leg now jumping like a kangaroo against an opponent the very sight of his evolution seemed to demoralize the rendlesham men they floundered and slid on the slippery grass and made wild grabs without ever reaching him it was really too ridiculous to be eluded by a raw hand like this and yet he eluded them half way down the field he ran with a roar of applause at his back and only a handful of the enemy left ahead how splendid if he could only pass them and make his record with a run from one goal to the other alas a swoop from behind greeted the proud thought two hands clawed at his shoulders and from his shoulders slipped to his waist and from his waist slid down to his ankles where for a moment they held and sent the runner tripping over on his nose in the mud with the ball spinning away a yard ahead it was all up no fisher was on the spot and at fisher's heels ridgeway the rendlesham backs flung themselves in the way but only to divert not to stop their career when corder picked himself up and rubbed the mud out of his eyes the first thing he saw was ridgeway sitting behind the enemy's line with the ball comfortably resting on his knee it was another for the school perhaps a goal alas on that ground the lawn side kick was too much even for york it shot wide and rendlesham breathed again but the long and short of it was that the match was a tie a goal and a try to each side and that to quarter belonged the credit of a big hand in the lesser point awfully well run quarter said the captain as time having been called the two walked off the field together you must play for us again after that who should say life was not worth living the very weather seemed to change for quarter the sun came out flowers sprang up at his feet birds started singing in the trees overhead what a letter he would have to write home to-morrow the captain's pat on the back sent a glow all through him who wouldn't be a fellsgarth chap after all it scarcely damped his joy to perceive that neither clapperton dangle nor brinkman shared in the general congratulations but looked more black and threatening than ever as he passed pooh what did he care for that how he enjoyed the glorious rendlesham high tea and the drive home in the rain with everybody talking and laughing and rejoicing singing songs and shouting war cries he was quite sorry when it came to an end and he had to dismount and go over alone to his own house he could hear the shouts and huzzas of the classics across the green as wakefields turned out in a body to welcome their men no one at forders turned out to welcome him the four prefects themselves had not even waited for him for the first time that day corder felt himself wishing he had a little sympathy in his jubilation it was dull when everybody over on the other side was shouting himself hoarse to hear not a cheep of congratulation from his own fellows however it didn't matter much he went to his room and changed and hoped his messmate wilson would not be long in coming for supper and a gossip wilson came presently but his face was glum and his manner frigid oh here you are old chap i'm peckish did you hear about the match we shut up said wilson you're a cad i don't want to talk to you corder put down his knife and fork and looked up in amazement this from wilson he knew clapperton was sore about it but wilson he went on eating while thinking it out and wilson ate too in silence and then rose to go are you not going to prepare to-night yes in dangle's room and corder was left alone this was too bad of wilson to-night of all nights he would go and look up selby selby he knew would be interested in the day's news for had they not practised drop kicks together for an hour a day all this term selby was in but not at all glad to see him are you busy old man asked corder i don't want you here said selby why what's the row row you're a sneak that's the row cut 
surely selby must be out of sorts to talk like that corder stood in the door for a moment on the off chance that his friend might be joking but no selby turned his back and began to read a book this was getting monotonous corder returned to his study to think it out a little more his fag cash was there looking for a paper hello youngster that you we didn't get beaten after all to-day i suppose you heard cash's reply was laconic to say the least of it he turned round and put out his tongue none of your cheek i say said corder or i'll how dare you speak to me said the junior you're a cad i'm not going to fag for a cad and he vanished corder went to bed that night sorely perplexed and his perplexity was not relieved when he rose next morning and found a paper on his table with the following genial notice any boy in forders found speaking to corder the sneak will be cut by the house by order end of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fourteen the shop opens robert no one knew his surname was a regular institution at fellsgarth pluralist and jack-of-all-trades as he was he seemed unable to make much of a hand at anything he took up he was school porter owner of the school shop keeper of the club properties and occasional school policeman and he discharged none of his functions well the masters did not regard him with much confidence the boys for the most part did not care for him the other men about the place disliked him and yet as part and parcel of fellsgarth every one put up with him as has already been hinted his management of the school shop had been a conspicuous failure both for himself and the young innocents who squandered their substance on his tarts he complained that he could make no profit and as his method for recouping himself was to supply the worst possible article at the highest possible price his young customers neglected him and aggravated his loss it was rumoured that another more questionable method of replenishing his exchequer was by laying odds on the school games which as in the case of the second rendlesham match did not always turn out in the way he expected this however was only rumour and was not to be reckoned among bob's known transgressions which were general stupidity surliness unsteadiness and an inveterate distaste for veracity such being his reputation it astonished no one on the monday following the events recorded in the last chapter to see the shutters of the shop at the watch-tower gate up and a rudely scrawled announcement this shop is closed but what did cause astonishment was a subsequent announcement inscribed in print letters this establishment will reopen on wednesday under entirely new management superior grub at greatly reduced prices no more shoe leather or flat swipes best tarts one penny each ditto ginger beer one and a half pence a bottle fresh fruit and pastry daily rally round the old shop by order speculation ran high as to who the enterprising new tradesman could be some said it was mrs wisdom others said one of the penchurch shops was going to run it as a branch others suggested that some of the seniors had a hand in it but the truth never once leaked out our nine juniors played an artful part in that day's business they mingled with the crowd in front of the notice and freely bandied about wild conjectures as to who the new manager or managers could be at the same time hinting broadly that they intended to patronize the new concern tell you what said d'arcy perhaps it's the doctor wants to turn an honest penny don't blame him either perhaps it's rollitt suggested cash amid laughter what a game 
he'll go selling tarts by the pint and ginger beer by the ounce who think of rollitt's ginger beer i asked bob if he knew who it was said wally and he said no he wished he did he'd get something out of him for good will what's that asked ashby if he'd said bad temper there might have been some of that going about anyhow said wally i rather fancy the thing myself the things can't be worse than they have been and if they're fresh every day they're bound to be better and the tarts are a halfpenny less and so's the ginger pop hurroo said coddle you can get half as much again for the same money i wish they'd open to-day after which one by one they tailed off leaving a general impression behind them that whoever else was in the secret these nine young innocent lambs were not matters had not advanced to this stage without considerable deliberation several committee meetings had been held some of which under mr stratton's presidency had been of a practical nature others without his controlling presence had ended in dust on the whole however the young merchant adventurers had exhibited a reasonable grasp of their responsibilities and an aptitude for dealing with the necessary details one point discussed was whether the shop should be open all day or only at certain times mr stratton was in favour of the latter he urged that during the off hours between eleven and twelve and in the afternoon between four and six would be ample the committee argued from personal experience that there were other hours of the day when a fellow felt in the humour for a blow-out to this mr stratton replied let him blow out by all means but not on the company's premises he could do his shopping during shop hours and blow out with his purchases at any hour of the day or night the school rules permitted they couldn't undertake to provide a banqueting hall for their customers but urged the committee if you have a shopman why not get your money's worth out of him why waste our money on a shopman at all propounded mr stratton to his astounded fellow directors why not take turns behind the counter ourselves say one of the wheatfields in cash one week and coddle and ash be the next and so on the hours proposed were not school hours and though the persons on duty might occasionally be done out of a game still it would fall on all alike and would be a little sacrifice for the common good but said percy whose hair was on end at this tremendous proposition suppose wally that is i mean wouldn't it be necessary to count the tarts before each chap went on duty and see how many there were at the end it might with you and your lot retorted wally very red in the face it'd be best to have a weighing machine handy and charge you eight pence a pound for every pound extra you weighed at the end of the day we'll neither count nor weigh said mr stratton we'll trust to every fellow's honour why if we couldn't do that do you suppose the shop would keep open a week this impressed the meeting vastly and the discussion was changed to the question of profits the boys were in favour of screwing all they could out of their customers they didn't see why if bob sold bad tarts for three halfpence they shouldn't sell good ones at least for the same price it's giving it to em both ends said they why not said the master we want the fellows to get the benefit we don't want all the profit as it is we shall make a farthing on every tart we sell we ought to sell four times as many as bob did oughtn't we quite that said they very well see how that works out and mr stratton took his chalk and worked out this sum on the blackboard twelve bad tarts at one and a half pence equals one shilling sixpence cost nine pence profit nine pence forty-eight good tarts at one penny equals four shillings cost three shillings profit one shilling you see said he if we can only increase the demand we shall easily make bob's profit and more having good tarts will increase it in one way and selling cheap will increase it another 
it's worth trying anyhow and so the deliberations went on and the boys minds gradually took on the new idea the thirty shillings mr stratton reported had been advanced and mrs stratton was appointed a sub-committee to lay it out a method of accounts was arranged the first day's stock was to be charged at the selling price to the shopman for the day at the end of the day he was to hand over to the treasurer the money he had taken and what was left of the stock which two items together ought to make up the sum of his responsibility it was felt that in a very few days the committee would ascertain pretty nearly what quantity of each article was consumed and would be able to order accordingly any deficiency was to be set down to bad management and no other reason and any shopman deficient three days running was to forfeit his right to officiate again during that term lots were solemnly drawn for the distinction of opening the shop and the choice fell on d'arcy and lickford who for the next day or two went about shaking in their shoes as the day drew nearer the venture seemed a tremendous one and mr stratton had to use all his powers of encouragement to keep his colleagues from not taking fright at the last moment it will all go swimmingly you'll see said he i will hold myself in readiness to come down and back you up if there's the least hitch but i shall be greatly disappointed if you need me the last act of the committee before commencing proceedings was to draw up a manifesto which was copied out and duly affixed to the notice-boards and the shop shutters on the morning of the opening under the distinguished patronage of mr and mrs stratton the fellsgarth shop will be opened this day from eleven to twelve and four to eight and daily sundays excepted till further notice the following prime goods at the cheap prices affixed here followed a list of the stores ready money no tick change given no more stomach ache real jam ripe fruit fresh pastry all the season's novelties nothing stale boys of fellsgarth come in your thousands no risk to man or boy no favour masters and fags treated alike all the profits for the clubs treasurer mrs stratton managing directors nine gentlemen carefully selected president mr stratton plenty for all no questions asked all are welcome come early and stay late this soul-stirring manifesto which had the hearty approval both of the president and treasurer who carefully revised the spelling threw some satisfactory light on the mystery who were the carefully selected gentlemen was still obscure although it was generally held that fellsgarth only contained nine individuals answering to that particular description what was more important was that mr and mrs stratton were at the back of the venture if so it was not a swindle and the grub was pretty sure to be right the new price list moreover was very satisfactory and on the whole the hours were approved of when the eleven o'clock bell sounded on the wednesday morning a general movement was made for the watch-tower gate where firmly entrenched behind a clean counter piled up with the good things a schoolboy holds dear demurely stood d'arcy and lickford looking very anxious and scared at judiciously selected points among the crowd their friends looked on sympathetically after the laughter which had greeted the discovery had died away an awkward pause ensued no one exactly liked to start the seniors present felt their dignity would be compromised the middle boys did not like to do what the seniors were too shy to do the juniors were afraid some one might laugh if they let off consequently for a minute or two every one stared at the two shopmen who cast down their eyes and blushed and simpered at length however the ice was broken in a very pretty way for mrs stratton on her way out of the school looked in and taking in the situation advanced to the counter and said a bottle of ginger-beer if you please lickford 
lickford who to use his own polite phrase was bossing the drinks and fruit for the day nearly tumbled down with the shock of this sudden challenge and made a wild grab at the nearest bottle within reach the eyes of fellsgarth were upon him he lost his head entirely and made herculean efforts to draw the cork without loosing the wire his contortions were terrible when he could not hold the bottle firm enough between his knees he tried gripping it between his feet then in a hot whisper he besought darcy to hang on to the end and for a time the bottle was invisible under the two then he took another amid the enthusiastic cheers of the spectators and was proceeding to release the corkscrew from the refractory vessel when mrs stratton said in her pleasant way i see you keep the new kind of bottles that have the corks wired down they are much better than the old and it's very little trouble undoing the wire this saved lickford in a moment the wire was removed and the cork burst out triumphantly even before it was pulled showering a grateful froth of fizz into the waistcoat of the operator it's beautifully well up thank you lickford how much said mrs stratton they're a shilling a dozen i mean three halfpence each said darcy we can give you change here's tuppence i'll take a halfpenny apple that will make it right won't it and amid loud cheers she departed the ice was broken a rush took place as ridgeway who was poetical said fellows may step in where angels didn't fear to tread then did darcy and lickford pant and perspire and wish they had never been born hands reached in from all sides and helped themselves to cakes and tarts and coppers showered in on them from nobody could tell where they found themselves handing change out into space and sowing sweets broadcast among the crowd the other directors meanwhile as in duty bound nobly rallied round them and added to their embarrassment walk up walk up shouted wally try our brandy balls eight a penny eight brandy balls for dalton you chaps look sharp change for a suv for clapperton beg pardon sixpence didn't know he kept such small coins hello hello stand by for my young brother percy he's just a-goin to begin fifteen jam tarts half a pound of peppermints half a dozen ginger beer bite his money hard darcy see there are no bad uns i know the chap bah i hope they've got better toffee here than that muck you make said percy come wake up cried cash i've been waiting five minutes for my cake can't have em we've run out said darcy well you must be a green one only to get such a few said a middle boy who had also built his hopes on the same delicacy very sorry said percy to the company generally you must excuse these chaps raw hands they don't know how to manage at present give em time they'll do better won't you lickford takes some time to get a notion into lickford's head but when it gets there my word it sticks get in a double lot of cakes to-morrow do you hear or i shall give you the sack despite these pleasant recriminations the business went on merrily the tuck was pronounced a great advance on anything robert had provided and rumours of its excellence penetrated into quarters which had never contributed customers to the old shop in the afternoon the crowd was less but the business more steady mr stratton dropped in for a slice of cake and mrs wakefield and the three little wakefields came to patronize the undertaking one or two fellows too sent their fags to secure extras for tea and one or two left orders for another day inquiries were made moreover for certain articles such as lemons tea-cakes etc which the shopman took a note of as worth laying in a stock of and the lack of demand for a few of the things they had suggested to the same astute young merchants that they might be dispensed with in future of course a few boys tried to interfere with the regulations by demanding tick and wanting to make bargains but they were promptly met by a non possumus 
from the directors present and finally brought to reason by being referred to mr stratton the day passed without the necessity of any appeal to the president an anxious consultation was however held in his room after closing time naturally owing to the exceptional rush the accounts were a little out but as they happened to be on the right side this was a matter for congratulation rather than distress nearly two pounds had been taken and the stock left on hand was valued at five shillings so that actually it was possible to repay half of the thirty shillings lent after the very first day mr stratton however advised that only ten shillings should be repaid this time and the other five shillings put into a reserve fund in case of need of course you can't expect to do as big a business as this every day said he it will settle down to a regular jog trot in a few days and then we shall be able to judge much better how we stand i shall be very well satisfied if we make about five shillings clear a day i think you boys have started very well began the treasurer but her husband held up his finger uh, admonishingly i should have been very disappointed with them if they had not said he it's easy enough to start the thing will be to keep it up remember he added it will be better not to brag out of doors about our profits or that sort of thing it will be time enough to talk about that when we are able to hand over a good lump sum to the clubs now it's time you went to preparation good night all i tell you what said lickford to his fellow shopman as they walked across the green we shall have to be pretty smart to-morrow if we're to get to the club meeting why said d'arcy i thought none of you modern cads were going to show up we heard you'd all funked it said wally i don't blame them said ashby they've not much to be proud of those modern chaps never mind said fisher minor fellsgarth can get on well enough without them the party came to a halt and regarded one another seriously and percy said whoever told you we weren't going to turn up told crams we're coming we'll see you don't have it all to yourselves rather my eye won't you get licked for it nice to belong to a house where you mayn't sneeze unless your senior lets you go on shut up see if you can't canvass a bit that's what you're best at that and getting it hot on the hands for cheating whereupon the troops separated the taunts of the classics made their rivals wince despite their affected contempt to-morrow was the day of the meeting and between now and then they must decide whether or not they would obey their own seniors and stay away or revolt and take the consequences the unanimous opinion was in favour of revolt unless clapperton made it uncommonly worth their while to obey they were not destined to remain long in doubt for the senior invaded their quarters that very evening just remember you youngsters said he no one is going to the meeting to-morrow from our side oh any fellow who goes will get it hot i promise him ah what about our conditions what have you done about them put them in the coal scuttle and, and i've a good mind to put all five of you there too for your impudence ah the captain turned on his heel with a final warning that settles it you chaps said percy when he had gone we go rather replied everybody End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen something wrong in the accounts fisher major sat in his study after morning class next morning the picture of boredom and perplexity lists of names receipt books cash box bills and account books were littered on the table before him between these and a cobweb on the ceiling his troubled looks travelled as he gnawed the end of his pen and passed his fingers aimlessly through his hair there was something wrong and what it was he could not for the life of him make out 
to any one familiar with fisher major's business or rather unbusiness habits there was nothing wonderful in that he was happy-go-lucky in all his dealings he could receive a subscription one day and only remember in a panic to enter it a week after his money he kept all over the place some in his desk some in the cash box some in the drawer of his inkstand he had a vague idea that he had a special reason for dividing it thus that one lot may have belonged to the school clubs another to the house clubs and another to something else but which was which it passed his wit to remember he had had his doubts of the business all along his friends had urged him to take the office and with their help he had persuaded himself its duties were simple and easily discharged he had determined he would do the thing thoroughly well he had bought these account books out of his own private purse and spent an evening in beautifully ruling them in red ink with one column for the date one for the name and three for pounds shillings and pence he had procured two letter files labelled respectively club and house into which to put his receipts and he had provided himself with a dozen elastic bands and an equal number of paper fasteners what more could a treasurer desire alas the beautiful account books got mixed up with one another the letter files remained empty and the elastic bands somehow did duty as football garters the club accounts were scrawled for the most part in pencil on the backs of envelopes awaiting a grand transcription into the books and the receipts pending a similar fortunate time were huddled away in the drawer with greek verses and letters from the people at home things had now come to a pass the captain had yesterday suggested that in view of the meeting to-day it would be well to have the accounts made up so as to be able if called upon to state exactly how they stood financially all serene said fisher i'll let you have the lot in ten minutes it was now considerably more than ten hours since the rash undertaking had been given and the accounts were considerably more confused than they had been when fisher sat down to square them the club and house accounts were hopelessly mixed some fellows appeared to have paid several times over to both funds and others not once to either worse than that fisher could not find his memorandum of what he had paid out in small disbursements since term began still worse when he did come in desperation to lump both funds together and deduct the total amount he had spent he found himself between four pounds and five pounds out of pocket that was the serious discovery which on this particular morning was preying on his spirits and making him look a picture of bewilderment i'm bothered if i can make it out said he to himself everybody's marked down as paid i remember noticing that weeks ago at that rate i ought to have twenty-five pounds for the clubs and nine pounds twelve shillings for the house yes that's right i had that there's a note of it three lots fifteen pounds seven shillings sixpence on september one seven pounds two shillings sixpence on september thirteen and twelve pounds two shillings on another day that makes the total there you are why on earth did i put them away in separate lots then i paid five pounds for the new goals and something else what was it oh that was for the house balls oh but we are lumping the two together what was it i know seventeen shillings sixpence that's five pounds seventeen shillings sixpence and something else i know came to a pound six pounds seventeen shillings sixpence take that from thirty-four pounds twelve shillings leaves twenty-seven pounds fourteen shillings sixpence and i've only got twenty-two pounds eighteen shillings sixpence where in the name of wonder has the rest gone and once more the dismal operation of adding up counting and subtracting began anew with the same or almost the same result there was a mistake of something like four pounds ten shillings whichever way you looked at it dalton who came in presently could throw no further light on the problem he added up the columns counted the money subtracted the payments and arrived at the same result 
had the difference been smaller it might have been accounted for by a few subscriptions omitted or a few payments not entered but four pounds ten shillings was too big a sum to leak away by accident and with the exception of the new goals fisher major was confident nothing had been spent approaching the figure dalton then proposed a fresh hunt through the study in case the missing sum might be hidden for safety in some corner so the room was turned upside down the bedclothes were shaken out pockets searched books turned over teapots peered into but all to no purpose the captain looked in while the search was proceeding have you got the hello what's up why said fisher major there's a discrepancy we ought to have twenty seven pounds fourteen shillings sixpence and there's about four pounds ten shillings short do you mean that's missing in the club accounts well either in that or the house clubs or in both lumped together i say i wish you'd add that up there's a good fellow the addition may be wrong but no the captain made it the same as dalton ranger and ridgeway dropped in while the audit was in progress and were promptly pounced upon to add the columns too evidently the mistake was not there they made the total precisely the same it must be in the payments then said fisher so the whole party sat down and scrutinized the hapless treasurer's bills and vouchers and after allowing him the benefit of every imaginable doubt still brought the deficit out at the same uncompromising figure let's have another look round suggested fisher so once more the study was turned topsy-turvy and every nook and cranny searched but no money was there nor any sign of it the captain looked grave it's precious awkward said he it's sure to turn up said fisher i'll go over the whole thing again and have the room searched meanwhile said ranger it's to be hoped no questions are asked by the fellows opposite not much chance i hear they are none of them going to turn up said dalton that's their lookout responded the captain much to their disgust ashby and fisher minor were summoned from the vicinity of the shop that morning to assist the treasurer in his hopeless search they did not mind turning a study upside down on their own account but they strongly objected to have to do it for any one else fisher major did not at first vouchsafe much information with regard to the missing object look round everywhere said he and see if you see anything ashby looked and said he saw a lot of things i mean money of course said the treasurer whereupon the two simultaneously made a grab at the loose cash on the table declaring they had found it first go off no not that it's some that's missing how much asked ashby never mind a pound or two are you sure it's about in the room that's what i want you to look and see you young donkey two pounds said ashby was it all in silver no it was three or four pounds about four pounds ten i don't know what it was in four pound ten that's a lot said the young brother i thought you said you were hard up so i did it's not my money but the club's what's that to do with it i want you to see if you can find it while i'm down in class whereupon they set to work they emptied the contents of every drawer in a glorious heap on the floor they shook out his socks and turned the pockets of all his coats inside out they pulled his bed about the room and shook out all his sheets they raked out his fire and prized up a loose board in the floor they emptied his basins into his bath and investigated the works of his eight-day clock but high or low they could find no money fisher's study did not get over that morning's quest in a hurry when the owner returned he wished devoutly he had never been ass enough to confide the task to a couple of raw goths like these whatever chance there may have been before of discovering any mislaid article it was now hopelessly and irredeemably gone he dismissed the two youngsters with a kick which they felt to be very ungrateful after all the trouble they had taken limp in spirits and grimy in personal appearance they crawled away to the shop to console themselves with ginger-beer and a cheese-cake hello said lickford as they arrived what have you been up to sweeping the chimneys i heard they wanted it on your side what'll you have we've been doing prime where have you been 
we have been hunting about in my senior's study for some club money that's lost about four pounds shut up said ashby nudging his companion what do you want to blab all over the place about it for how much four pounds said a voice near and looking round to their horror they saw dangle all right said ashby trying to save the situation it's bound to turn up he stuck it in a specially safe place and can't remember where look sharp with the ginger beer young lickford money down first said lickford catch me trusting any of you classic chaps with tick you've got no tin generally to begin with and then you go and lose it that's better than stealing it retorted ashby the thing is said dangle breaking in on these pleasant recriminations it wouldn't matter if it was fisher's own money that was lost but it belongs to all of us i tell you he's found it by now said ashby then turning to fisher minor he whispered you howling young ass you've done it now there'll be a regular row and your brother will have you to thank for it don't blame him said dangle it's quite right of him to tell the truth with which highly moral pronouncement the modern senior strolled away lickford was too much engrossed by a sudden influx of customers to improve the occasion and fisher minor who never enjoyed ginger beer less in his life was allowed to depart in peace to meditate on the evil of his ways and the possible hot water he had been preparing for his brother he had sense enough to reflect that he had better make a clean breast of it to his brother at once to his surprise the latter took the news that dangle had heard of the deficiency in the accounts more quietly than he had expected i do wish you'd hold your tongue out of doors about things that don't concern you said he will dangle get you into a row asked fisher minor dangle i'm not responsible to him more than to any one else the money's lost and unless i can find it or make out where the mistake comes in i shall have to stump up that's all but i say you haven't got money enough said the boy i know that you young duffer whatever will you do fisher major laughed i shan't steal it if that's any comfort to you and i shan't cook the accounts i say i wonder if rollitt could lend it you he must have some money for he paid for widow wisdom's new boat you know i heard of that i wish i saw my way to paying my debts as well as he did i say shall i ask him certainly not the best thing you can do is to shut up fisher minor felt very grateful to his brother for not thrashing him and went into afternoon school meekly though out of spirits well said d'arcy as he took his place what's the latest who are you going to get into a mess now has york been swindling anybody lately or ranger been getting tight you're bound to have some story about somebody i didn't mean it's not wicked to lose money pleaded fisher minor i never thought that's just it said wally you couldn't if you tried dangle will make a nice thing out of it thanks to you classic treasurer been and collared modern boy's money that sort of thing and they'll kick him out and stick in one of their own lot and call it triumph of honesty oh you beauty you can do things nicely when you try i wish i'd never come up here at all moaned fisher minor humph that would have been a bad go for fellsgarth said d'arcy shut up forder's looking if we're lagged we shan't get in to the meeting the dreaded misadventure did not occur and punctually at the hour our four young gentlemen trooped into hall everything was very quiet there the place was only half full the classics had turned up in force but the mutineering house was so far unrepresented presently however five juvenile figures might be seen marching arm in arm across the green keeping a sharp lookout on every side before they arrived in hall a solitary figure wearing the modern colours had made his way up to the senior's end it was corder looking very limp and haggard and with a savage flash of the eyes which told how ill coventry was agreeing with his spirits the cheers with which he was greeted do quite as much to his pluck in coming to-day as to his exploit at the match last saturday appeared to disconcert rather than please him and he took a corner seat as far as possible from the classic seniors present when however percy and company entered the hall a much livelier demonstration ensued 
cheers and compliments and pats on the back showered fast on the youthful blacklegs and tended greatly to exaggerate in their own eyes the importance of their action we shall get jolly well welted for it you fellows said percy with all the swagger of a popular martyr never mind we aren't going to be done out of hall for anybody at any rate they won't hurt you for it cried wally disparaging kids like you won't hurt we've come to see you cads don't get it all your own way said cash that's what we've come for ho ho hope you've brought your lunch you'll be kept here a day or two if you're going to wait for that when york and the other prefects arrived on the scene there were of course loud cheers but as the opposition was not there to make any counter-demonstration it was not quite as noisy as on former occasions percy did indeed attempt to get up a little opposition at this stage by calling for three cheers for the moderns but as he was left to give them by himself even his own adherents declining to be drawn into cheers for clapperton the display fell rather flat the captain's speech was short and to the point of course they knew why the meeting was called there had been mutiny at fellsgarth fellows had deliberately set themselves against his authority as captain which was a minor thing and against the success of fellsgarth in sports which was a low and shabby thing cheers he wasn't going to mention names but he meant to say this that they had much better dissolve the club right away no no than not all pull together last saturday as every one knew they had been left utterly in the lurch and but for good luck and the good play of some of the fifteen amongst whom he was glad to say was one fellow who had had the pluck to act on his own judgment of what was due to the school loud and prolonged cheers in the midst of which quarter perked up and looked pleased they had held their own with a very scratch team they couldn't expect to do as much again why not and it was not fair to the school to play matches without all their best men in the team the proposal he had to make was that unless the fellows now standing out chose to return to their allegiance to the school within a week all future matches for the term should be scratched and the club dissolved the captain's proposal caused considerable consternation ridgeway rose and said he considered the motion dealt far too leniently with the mutineers he would say drum them out of the club and reorganize without them denton asked if it would not be more honest and straightforward to summon them to the next match and if they didn't turn up give them the thrashing they deserved fisher major said he supported the captain's proposal it was nonsense their playing with scratch teams and letting it be supposed that was the best the school could do some of the fellows on strike were no doubt good players and that made it all the more discreditable of them to try to damage the school record by crippling the team they no doubt hoped that they would be begged to rejoin on their own terms rather than that he was in favour of disbanding the club and letting the fellows devote their energy to running and jumping and other sports where each fellow could distinguish himself independently of what any others chose to do hear hear ranger also supported york's motion very likely the mutineers would crow and say the club couldn't get on without them no more they could in a sense but he for one was not going to ask them to come back and would sooner break up the club and let them have the satisfaction of knowing they had injured fellsgarth amid loud cheers quarter followed he was sorry he said there was to be no more football but supposed there was nothing else they could do he was glad to see some moderns present even though they were only juniors laughter it showed that there were some fellows on the modern side that stuck by the school he fancied these youngsters could take care of themselves he was glad to hear a human voice again laughter it might be fun to some present but he could assure them it was none to him no one had spoken to him for four days he was cut by his house and had to thank even some of the juniors present for assisting to make his life in forders miserable he didn't care much so far they might make him cave in in the long run no stick out let the fellow who cried stick out come and try it his only offence had been that he had played for the school 
to do anything for the school was now considered a crime on the modern side shame anyhow he should vote for the captain's motion and though he wasn't particularly sweet on the classics as a body he was beginning to think they weren't quite as bad as his own side percy hereupon rose amid derisive cheers he didn't know why the names of him and his lot had been brought in but he just wanted to say that they were here to-day because they had a right to come and weren't going to be kept out by anybody not if they knew it rather not he and his lot thought there wasn't much to choose between anybody especially the juniors of the classic side who thought they were jolly clever but were about the biggest stuck uppest louts he order kick him out he hoped the meeting would rally round the school shop where every one was treated alike and got the best grub for the money of any school going they were going to get some ribston order time all right they shouldn't hear what he was going to say now loud cheers yorke said they all seemed to be pretty much of the same mind and he would put his motion to the vote this accordingly was done and carried without a dissentient voice End of chapter 15chapter sixteen of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter sixteen a beleaguered garrison the decision arrived at by the club meeting speedily came to the ears of the recalcitrant moderns and by no means pleased them they had expected at least that some one would propose that they should be met half-way and appealed to for the sake of the school to abandon their attitude that would have given them an opportunity of figuring in an heroic light before fellsgarth and showing how for the general good they could afford even to overlook the slight which had been put upon them but now so far from that they figured as the party who had wrecked the school clubs for the sake of a petty pique and in their absence had been quietly deposed along with every one else from office and privilege and left looking uncommonly foolish and uncommonly ridiculous yorke himself hardly realized when he made his downright motion that he was dealing the hardest blow possible at the mutiny a mutiny is all very well as long as there is some one to mutiny against but now even this luxury was denied them naturally the wrath of clapperton and his friends fell on the traitors in their own camp whose presence at the meeting had made it impossible to discredit it as entirely one-sided in its composition that quarter would go every one was prepared for he had laid up for himself yet one more rod in pickle and should punctually taste its quality but the mutiny of the juniors was a surprise no one imagined that their threats at revolt were anything more than the ordinary bluster in which these young braves notoriously dealt had they sinned in ignorance it would have mattered less but they had gone to the meeting in deliberate defiance of their captain's order and in the face of his warning as to what the consequences of disobedience would be the discipline of the house was at an end if a flagrant act of insubordination like this was to be allowed to pass unnoticed besides if allowed to spread other fellows would go over to the enemy and the moral effect of the strike would be at an end a peremptory summons was therefore dispatched to percy and his friends to appear before the prefects of their house that same evening that all inquired percy of the middle boy who brought the message we hear you you needn't stop i'll tell him you'll come said the messenger i don't mind what you tell him cut out of our room that's all we aren't particular me and my chaps 
but we draw the line at louts he says if you don't come what's to prevent him saying anything he likes look here young gamble gamble was at least two years the senior of any boy present if you don't cut your sticks they'll be cut for you so there gamble gave a general invitation to the party to come and try to tamper with his sticks and departed with a final caution as to the desirability of obeying their captain lick said percy when he had gone how much grub have we got in the room what are you talking about you aren't hungry surely after that go in at the shop have we got enough for two days the party opened their eyes and began to suspect the drift of the inquiry no but maynard owes us a loaf and spanker some butter and those kins in reynolds study half a tongue all right go out and get it all in sharp scrape up all you can what are we going to have a blockade rather you don't suppose we're going to cave in to clapperton do you but we shan't want enough for two days shall we shan't we that's all to-morrow's exit day and no school next day's sunday and next day exit doesn't end till twelve we may have to stick out three days Whew, we shall want a lot of grub said cash you young pig that's all you think about you'll have to go on jolly short rations i can promise you do you know what we're going to do no one had an idea what they were going to do do you know those four classy kids said percy my younger brother and his lot they've not been quite such cads lately as they used to be have they they've been a bit more civil said cottle i suppose that's because of the shop what about them asked ramshaw why i fancy if we ask them they might come over and back us up of course they'd have to bring their own grub and we'd kick them out if they weren't civil what do you say rather a lark said lickford all serene i'll go and see about it keep it dark whatever you do and mind you scrape up all the grub that's owing us there's no time to lose i say clapperton expects us in half an hour wire in by the end of half an hour the larder had been fairly well replenished lickford and cash had gone round on a general raid recovering by force where persuasion failed their outstanding loans and in other cases borrowing additional supplies in the same genial manner among other booty they secured a tin of pressed beef from spanker who had to be clouded on the head before he would lend it and some sardines from another boy who was thankful to find any one to take them off his hands at any price cottle and ramshaw acting on sealed orders from their leader had been round borrowing a screwdriver and screws a few yards of rope and other material of war among which was a squirt belonging to reynolds who had been pleased to swap it for a couple of greek stamps which cottle had to dispose of many were the fears lest not only should percy fail to secure the services of the classic juniors but should himself be too late to take part in the siege however much to their relief this was not so as presently he came over arm in arm with wally who carried a parcel under his arm followed at a respectful distance by darcy ashby and fisher minor the bulkiness of whose pockets gave promise of a further addition to the sinews of war by general consent the visitors slipped in not in a body but casually one by one and so escaped special observation as soon as they were all assembled percy gave the order to screw up and pile on the barricades wally who was disposed to be patronizing snuffed up somewhat at his brother's calm assumption of the command why didn't you say you wanted screws said he we've got one or two long ones that's not the way to stick it in young lickford make the hole more sideways here i'll do it for you 
i'll tell you what said d'arcy you chaps had better begin to move up the bed against the door in case they come before we're fast in fire away stick it close up and young lickford can stand on to it to put in the screw come on cash stick those parcels out of the way said ashby handing out the provender they'll be better in the cupboard mind how you put them in you've got a knife coddle said fisher minor cut these bits of wood into wedges to go under the door they'll make it pretty secure in this manner the classic auxiliaries coolly took charge of the arrangements before ever their hosts had time to realize that they had been relegated to a back seat however just now there was no time for arguing questions of precedence and authority the enemy might be upon them at any moment and they had a lot to do before their outworks could be said to be in a proper state of defence the screws in the door were driven hard home into the wainscot the wedges underneath were tightly fixed the bed with bedding complete was drawn against the entry a second line of defence was thrown up of chairs chest of drawers bookcase and washstand beyond that were stacked against the wall cricket bats stumps boxing gloves and other dangerous-looking implements for use in a last emergency at percy's suggestion and under wally's direction an additional loophole was bored in the panel of the door in flagrant forgetfulness of the rights of school property through which as well as through the ventilating holes above the enemy might be reconnoitred and operated on these preliminaries being complete and fisher minor having been perched on the table which was on the bed with his eye to the loophole the company to pass the time resolved itself into a committee on the school shop and waited anxiously for the attack percy was specially anxious for he had enlisted his four recruits on the distinct understanding there would be a row and all the blame would fall on his head if by any ill luck the evening passed off quietly already the classic juniors were beginning to get impatient and hinting that they saw no fun in the proceedings so far when fisher minor scrambled down from his perch and cried Shh! here comes somebody about time said wally taking possession of the squirt as he spoke the footsteps halted at the door and the handle turned lie low you chaps whispered percy don't let them know you're here to begin with hello who's that let me in cried gamble outside can't we're busy replied lickford we've got a committee meeting and you'd better cut cried percy do you hear replied the ambassador let me in there's plenty of room in your own study ain't there why don't you go there we don't want you here cut your sticks and learn your rotten modern lessons shouted wally who began to be tired of being a listener luckily coddle knocked over one of the chairs at this juncture which served to conceal the voice of the speaker from the ears outside all right said gamble you'll catch it clapperton sent me to tell you if you don't come to his room directly he'll come and fetch you himself there good evening cried ramshaw our love to them all at home d'arcy meanwhile had mounted the bed and by means of a pea-shooter materially assisted in the departure of the discomfited envoy now we're getting livery said wally proceeding to load his squirt out of the jug better light the candle one of you and have some light on the subject a terrible discovery ensued neither candle nor matches could be found in a quarter of an hour daylight would depart and after that well the prospect was not brilliant at any rate however there was no time to do anything but recriminate which the company industriously did until the sentinel again gave the signal to stand by look here said percy we'd better keep him jawing as long as he'll stand it and not let fly till he begins to get violent eh all serene said wally that won't be long no and he'll bring the whole kit of prefects with him what a high old time they'll be chuckled d'arcy there's one lucky thing said cash forder and his dame have gone out for the evening so we shan't hurt their feelings 
look out it's clapperton whispered the sentinel clapperton tried the door and on finding it fast gave it a kick hello who's there open the door let me in who is it that young cad gamble again cried percy with a wink the company generally no do you hear let me in say what your name is how do we know you aren't a classy cad oh ow this last interjection was in answer to a fraternal kick from behind you know who i am replied clapperton let me in very sorry corder we can't let you in clapperton says we're to cut you because you played a jolly sight too well last week it's not corder it's me clapperton go on no larks whoever you are clapperton's got something better to do than go to tea-parties in fag's rooms go and tell that to the clap oh ow i mean try it on next door i tell you what said clapperton whose temper none of the best was rapidly evaporating if you young cads don't open the door instantly i'll break it open if you do we'll tell clapperton he'll welt you for it he won't let you spoil our new paint not if he knows it good old clappy a thundering kick was the only reply which shook the plaster of the walls and nearly sent fisher minor headlong with terror off his perch this was getting serious but in percy's judgment the time was not even yet ripe for extreme measures the assailant might be given a little rope yet he took it and worked himself into a childish passion against the refractory door encouraged by the friendly gibes of the besieged go it two to one on his boots keep your temper come in stick to it one more and you'll do it and so on it was hardly likely that the spectacle of the captain of the house in a towering rage toying to kick his way into a fag's room would long be allowed to continue unheeded by the rest of the inhabitants of forders and in a very short time new voices without apprised the beleaguered garrison that the enemy was sitting down in force brinkman's voice could be heard demanding admission and presently dangles while a posse of mercenary middle boys relieved clapperton of the kicking the stout old door held out bravely and defied all their efforts presently a pause was made and dangle's voice outside was heard demanding a parley young wheatfield he said it will be wiser for you to open the door at once if you don't it will be broken open and you needn't expect to get off easy then take my advice and don't be a fool thanks awfully said percy i and my chaps are just going to sit down to tea wish you could join us whoever you are we've got as much right to have tea in our study as you have in yours that's right kick away never mind the varnish somebody tapping at the study door it's no good wasting time over young asses like them brinkman was heard to say i don't mean to go now said clapperton they shall have such a hiding all of them as they won't forget in a hurry it's funny how when we seniors strike against the school it's so noble and when these juniors strike against us it's so inexcusable said fullerton strikes always did puzzle me if instead of talking rubbish you'd go and fetch robert with a crowbar to smash open the door said clapperton you'd be more use it was getting quite dark in the room by this time but wally could be heard refilling his squirt at the jug i mean to start now said he percy came beside him all serene said he but why use water when there's ink my eye i never thought of that rather i say old man while i remember it i'll write home this week don't you fag good old Mert percy oh no it's my turn oh let me is that the ink-pot hold it tight while i get a good go at it suppose we tickle them up with the pea-shooter first suggested lickford mind how you go over the chairs cash added he as that hero in the dark got entangled in the second line of fortifications all serene wire away young ashby you better mix up some soap and coal dust in the water for use when the ink's done by this time the attack without had redoubled and cash mounting up to the loophole began to operate on the besiegers with his pea-shooter 
he had to guess where to shoot for though the gas was alight in the passage he was unable for anatomical reasons to look and shoot through the same hole at the same time however he had the satisfaction of feeling sure his fire was taking effect by the aggravated exclamations of the besiegers who vowed terrific vengeance for this fresh insult in due time the marksman fell short of ammunition and was carefully helped down from his post in the dark while wally and percy gingerly carrying the squirt ascended in his place hand up the basin said wally and get another lot of water ready i say said fisher minor who was always being seized by heroic impulses if you could let me down out of the window by the rope i'd be able to get a candle good old how now awfully good notion said wally you chaps see to that while my young brother and i work the squirt don't tell anybody what's up young fisher and get back as soon as you can so while the squirt was carefully being levelled in the face of the enemy fisher minor with the end of the rope round his waist was swinging precariously in mid-air out of the window heartily repenting until his feet touched terra firma of his rash and desperate undertaking before he was safe the great attack had been delivered through the loophole the kickers had receded from the door a pace or two in order to get up impetus for a combined onslaught and clapperton with a poker in his hand was advancing to annihilate the lock when percy who was reconnoitring from the ventilating holes gave the signal to have at them whereupon wally let fly with all his might and converted half of the enemy their captain included into ethiopians the effect was instantaneous the four-footed kick did not come off clapperton's poker fell with a clatter on the floor and a howl went up which electrified both besiegers and besieged look alive now said wally let em have the water keep it up for five minutes an almost uninterrupted flow of coloured water poured through the loophole and kept the enemy at bay but even a jugful will not last for ever and presently the squirt gave a dismal groan on the bottom of the basin almost at the same moment an ominous crack proclaimed that the good old door was giving way by degrees under the now renewed attack of the besiegers they'll have it after all said percy tell you what suppose we slip out by the window and you chaps come and have supper in our room rather a lark eh it's getting a bit slow here nice sell for them too besides they can't get at you over on our side this hospitable invitation fitted in with the humour of the company generally particularly as every moment the door gave a more doubtful sound than before in three minutes the whole party was on the grass below where fisher minor returning breathless with a candle and matches encountered them come on you chaps said wally i'd give sixpence to see how they look when they find we've gone ha ha they salved their honour with a keen sense of the humour of the situation and followed their host to cross the green in the dark not at all sorry to have a harbour of refuge in sight though very loath to admit that this rearward movement was a retreat at the door of wakefield's to their consternation they met ranger what on earth are all you youngsters up to at this hour it's all right said wally the shop committee you know we're going to talk things over in my room come on you modern kids we'll make an exception for you this once and let you into wakefield's won't we ranger but it mustn't occur again yet another peril awaited them before they were safe in port this time it was mr stratton on the stairs ah here you are all of you said he i came to look for you i want to hear how the shop is doing very well thank you sir i say mr stratton said wally with a presence of mind which moved the admiration of his friends would you mind coming to a committee meeting in my and my chap's room we can show you the things we want ordered next week if you don't mind certainly i'll come i'm delighted to find you're sticking so well to the business and so it happened that when at last percy's door succumbed and the besiegers rushed in vowing vengeance and slaughter to find the room empty 
the nine innocents were sitting prettily round the table in wally's room with mr stratton in the chair deciding that until november was out it would be premature to order oranges for the fellsgarth shop End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen hawk's pike victory has its drawbacks like everything else the brilliant retreat of the modern juniors and their auxiliaries under the enemy's fire was all very well as a strategic movement but when it came to deciding what to do next the difficulties of the situation became painfully apparent mr stratton stayed half an hour chatting over the shop affairs and then rose to go good-night boys it's time for mr forder's boys to be back in their house this unpleasant reminder had a very damping effect on the conviviality of the party generally as soon as the master had gone wally said it strikes me you modern kids are in a bit of a mess i'm afraid your bedroom will be a little untidy said fisher minor the best thing you can do is to climb back by the window suggested d'arcy i don't fancy you'll want a warming-pan to-night said ashby this was all very nice and helpful the heroes looked at one another dismally we must lump it said percy they can't do anything very bad can't they said cottle were you ever licked by brinkman no said the others all right i have been that's all this sounded alarming d'arcy said why don't you come over to our side and out that lot we could have no end of larks if you were classics instead of little modern beasts our side's as good as yours snapped lickford all serene you'd better go and join them said wally this did not advance the argument much further of course it was out of the question to go and tell tales to the classic prefects or even to their own master nor was the suggestion of sleeping that night on the classic side hailed with enthusiasm by either party on the whole d'arcy's suggestion of getting back by the window seemed the most hopeful when once back they would go straight to bed where they would be safe for a while then if they could manage to rise at the supernatural hour of six they might succeed in evading the penalties of rebellion for another day for to-morrow being exit day they would be free to roam where they liked and they had a very good idea that wherever it was they would give forder's house a very wide berth tell you what exclaimed wally slapping his brother on the back so hard as to cause him to yell loud enough to bring every prefect of fellsgarth on to the spot tell you what old chappies of course we will why ever didn't we think of it before eh think of what why we'll go up hawk's pike of course of course we will said everybody what mattered it to them that hawk's pike had defied the ordinary tourists for generations they weren't ordinary tourists or anything like you come over for us at six said wally bring the grub we left in your room it'll be a regular sell for all those chaps we'll make a day of it it seemed a magnificent solution of the problem and on the strength of it the five truants departed not without misgivings for their quarters the rope was still dangling from their window and cash whose father was in the navy was selected by general consent as the member of the party best qualified to make the first ascent he modestly tried to induce some one else to assume the honour but he was outvoted and devoutly hoping to find the coast clear of the enemy he addressed himself to the venture it was not particularly arduous for a decent climber and in a couple of minutes his companion saw him swing himself on to the ledge and disappear into the room in a moment he put out his head all clear said he the doors smashed in and all the things kicked about anyhow but there's no one about that was the main thing the company speedily followed materially assisted in their clamour by sundry knots tied in the rope by the ingenious cash and by his energetic hauling from above the programme was carried out without a hitch without waiting for the bed-bell they one and all presented themselves to the dormitory dame and requested permission to turn in pleading severe fatigue which was by no means imaginary as the reason for this unwonted haste 
so smartly was the retirement effected that no one was aware of their return to their house until half an hour later when the dormitory filled up their five noses were discernible peeping from out the sheets whatever chastisement the prefects may have had in store for them evidently could not be administered at present for a disturbance in the dormitory was a capital offence in mr forder's eyes and as the master's room was adjacent and he was known to have returned and to be within earshot the only thing possible was secretly to promise the rebels a warm time of it as soon as they woke next morning but revenge sleeps sounder than caution as five struck in the clock tower ramshaw who had had it on his mind he might oversleep himself and in consequence had been up looking at his watch every ten minutes during the night slipped finally out of bed and roused each of his partners he expected no gratitude for his good offices and was not disappointed the sleepers growled and grunted at his well-meant efforts pulled the clothes over their heads called him unfriendly names threatened him with untold vengeance and scouted all idea of danger by delay till he was almost tired of trying but by the end of three-quarters of an hour with the aid of a moist sponge and other persuasives he got them to their feet well awake to a sense of the undertaking before them they still grumbled at the cold at the darkness at the fatigue and blamed ramshaw for all three they heartily despised themselves for their promise to the classic boys last night and still more for the row with their own prefix which was the cause for all this inconvenience but as they gradually slipped on their clothes and the warm bed receded more into their background they cheered up and recovered their courage there was no difficulty in getting out the dormitory door stood open brinkman who was the prefect on duty lay snoring loud and long in the end bed mr forder's bedroom was on the safe side of a brick wall carrying their boots in their hands they slunk off to their study where they made a hasty selection from the miscellaneous provisions stored overnight and then one by one solemnly slid down the rope once on the grass in the chill dark air depression fell upon them a second time their thoughts returned to the snug beds they had left even brinkman and clapperton could not take it out of them more than this white frost and nipping air however the bell began to toll six and the thought of their companions in discomfort spurred them on to energy they crawled across the green to wakefields four ghostly figures were visible in the feeble dawn hovering under the wall got the grub it was the cheery voice of wally wheatfield at sound of which the pilgrims took comfort and were glad they had turned out after all the first thing was to get clear of fellsgarth which was easily accomplished as no one was about even had they been observed beyond the general wonder of seeing nine juniors taking a morning walk at six a m there was nothing to interfere with their liberty as soon as they got into shargle woods a brief council of war was held it's a jolly stiff climb said wally i've got a compass said ashby as if that disposed of the difficulty ashby had an ulster which just then seemed to some of his comrades a still more enviable possession how many miles asked lickford miles who ever reckoned mountains by miles it's three hours to the top that'll be nine o'clock wisely observed cash who knows the way up percy asked way up can't you see it said wally when you get to the bottom you go straight up all very well for you i can't walk up a perpendicular cliff i dare say i could come straight down if i tried submitted percy oh there are lots of paths it's as easy as pot said wally suppose we have a bit of grub now it'll be less to carry you know whereupon an attack was made on the provisions with the result that considerably less was left to carry up the meal ended a start was made in earnest and the party trailed down the valley towards the lake at an easy jog trot and came to the conclusion that ascending a pike was ridiculously simple work by the time they reached the lake and began to strike up the winding lane that led round to the rearward slopes of the great mountain an hour had passed nearly half-way there said fisher minor hoping some one would corroborate the statement oh we don't count that bit we've come anything said wally we're just starting up now oh said fisher again hoping to be confirmed then it's only two hours climb that's all you know about it wisdom used to say he could do it in three hours from the lakeside but he was a wonner to go come along wire in you chaps 
where did wisdom get killed asked percy by way of a little genial conversation i heard over the other side down the cliffs above the lake he got caught in a mist and lost his way how do you know this is the right way up asked coddle because it's as plain as a nose on your face retorted the guide it was a long dreary pull up the lower slope over the wet grass and through the bracken and fisher minor before he accomplished the first stage was heartily sick of hawk's pike one or two of his companions to tell the truth were not quite as enamoured of the expedition as they tried to appear but they kept their emotions to themselves wally was the only member of the party who was uniformly cheerful and no one not even percy exactly liked to incur his contempt by appearing to enjoy the clamour less than he come on you chaps cried the leader as he staggered to the top of the slope keep it up what a crow it will be for us when we get to the top i suppose gasped fisher minor as he threw himself on the grass we're half-way now getting on said wally i dare say on the top of that next ridge we shall be able to see the top what isn't that the top said poor fisher craning his head up towards the beetling crag above them top no that's the knob halfway down we see from the school window the stiff part begins after that really wally if he had tried to be heartless could not have succeeded better had he but expressed some hint at regret that the distance was so long or vouchsafed the least semblance of a growl at the labour involved they would have loved him as it was they durst do nothing but hate him and accept his information joyously that's nothing said lickford i feel quite fresh don't you you chaps rather they chimed in plaintively better get on said wally after a few minutes more how they loathed wally then the new slope was worse than the first for the grass was more boggy and big stones here and there jarred their tender feet besides it grieved them to see wally zigzagging steadily on ahead utterly regardless of their distress behind yet no one exactly liked to stop had any one had the courage to do so they would have gone down like a row of ninepins let no one charge these boys with chicken-heartedness on the contrary they worked up that slope like heroes all the more so that they were ready to drop and durst not for very shame there is no hero like the coward who compels himself to be brave many a man in history has become famous for an exploit that cost him far less than this climb cost the fellsgarth juniors therefore let this record at least award the credit they deserve it was some satisfaction when the knob was reached and they looked up at the black towering crags above to see that even wally seemed staggered for a moment we may as well have a rest and some grub before we tackle that lot said he what do you say the motion was carried unanimously it's eleven o'clock said cash we've been five hours already thank goodness we've broken the back of it said fisher minor i don't know so much about that said percy we shan't get up that as easily as we've done so far i fancy rather not said wally cheerfully with his mouth full of sandwich i believe it's not so bad after we get past those rocks though on to the top what cried fisher isn't that the top then bless you no we have to go down a bit when we get there and cross a bog and then the real pike begins the information was received with dead silence and the party sat grimly munching their lunch with upturned eyes which way do we go asked coddle presently i suppose up by the stream it's bound to lead up to the bog the stream in question was a torrent which fell in a series of leaps through a narrow gorge in the rocks fisher minor looked very blue i wish i'd got my strong boots said he the dismal tone in which he uttered the words startled the others i say young fisher said d'arcy you're not done yet are you fisher minor had not the pluck to say yes i'll be game after this rest i got a little blown up that last bit that's all it doesn't look awfully far now said ashby it's further than it looks come on let's be jogging said wally the new ascent which consisted chiefly in clambering from stone to stone up the rocky ravine was less exhausting than the tramp up the bog and as wally was no better at this sort of climbing than any of the rest he did not dishearten them by getting hopelessly ahead but kept with the party occasionally they had to help one another up a specially stiff ledge and this mutual accommodation was an 
additional source of comfort to the weak goers progress was very slow cash having hauled himself up on to a little platform of moss looked at his watch and was alarmed to find it was past one the huge ravine at the far head of which they could see the open sky seemed a tremendous distance yet and after that according to wally was to come the bog and the cliffs beyond on which wisdom lost his life yet none of these things was quite so bad as the rolling up of some fleecy clouds behind them which effaced the view below and seemed to be crawling up the mountain in pursuit of them cash pointed this out to wally who grunted we shall miss the view from the top said he if we ever get there said cash on they scrambled again casting every now and then a longing look upward at the grim ravine ahead and now and then an anxious glance behind at the fast overhauling clouds we're bound to get out of it up there sang out wally but almost as he spoke the light mist swept past him blotting out everything but the boulder he stood on and a rift of the dashing water at his feet the clouds had befriended fisher minor they did what he durst not do ordered the party to halt where are you shouted wally from the invisible here where are you stay there and i'll come to you slowly the party foregathered and stood huddled in the blinding mist on a flat rock it's blowing over said wally we'd better make back for the hillside and get out of this ravine till it clears up it was no easy task scrambling back down that difficult way over boulders already made slippery by the moist mist and not able to see four yards ahead the clouds poured up to meet them in column upon column growing denser and wetter every minute at last how they scarcely knew they came down to where the rush of the water ceased and the stones gave place to wet grass we must be somewhere near where we sat down last said ashby phew it's cold the thing is said percy aren't we too much out to the left there's no sign of a path that i can see this looks like one said a voice ahead which they recognized as wally's come along this way they followed as well as they could and groped about for the path then they shouted wally replied out of the mist stay there a bit it's not a path i'll yell when i've got it they waited and for five minutes listened anxiously for the signal then they thought they heard it away to the right and floundered off in pursuit but after a little they discovered that they were going uphill hadn't we better go back to where we were said cash or we may miss him it occurred to most of the party that they had missed him already still they decided to go back presently they distinctly heard what sounded like a voice below them that must be he yell they shouted and again there seemed to come a faint response all right said percy stay where you are and i'll go and fetch him up and he vanished into the mist what's the time said ashby as the party stood dismally waiting half past four it's a good job it doesn't get dark till six only an hour and a half said cottle i wish those chaps would come but though they strained their ears and eyes no sign of the missing ones came nothing but the swish of the rain and the whistle of the wind through the grass we'd better go on said d'arcy presently they'll probably get down some other way look sharp or it will be dark so they started at a fast walk down the boggy slope keep close said d'arcy after a time are you all there everybody answered for himself but not for his neighbour you there young fisher minor yes replied fisher's voice from the rear he seemed so near that they started on again but after another five minutes ashby who was last but one shouted again where are you fisher minor there was no answer wait a bit you fellows fisher minor's behind but no answer came from that direction either here's a go said ashby to himself that kid fisher's gone lame and he'll be lost if i don't wait for him so he dismally turned back shouting and whistling as he went the clouds all round grew duller and heavier in the fading light and the wind-blown rain struck keenly on the wanderer's cheek that kid said ashby to himself as he sturdily tramped through the marsh ought not to have come he's not up to it but despite all his shouting and whistling and cooing not a sound came out of the mist but the wind and the driving of the rain still ashby could not bring himself to leave the kid in the lurch even if he did not find him it would be better to ah uh, what was that he clapped his hands to his mouth and shouted against the wind with all his might his voice was flung back in his face but with it there came the feeble sound of a cooey somewhere near 
ashby sprang to it like a drowning man to a straw if it was only a lost sheep it would be some company for ten minutes he beat round shouting all the time and once or twice fancying he heard an answer then suddenly he came upon a great boulder against which leaned fisher minor whimpering and shivering here you are said ashby joyously thank god for it i gave you up for lost the others are gone on come on hang on my arm old hoss i can't i'm too fagged to go on i'm awfully sleepy ashby you go on i'll come presently ashby's reply was prompt and vigorous he took his fellow junior by the arm and began to march him down the slope as fast almost faster than his weary legs would carry him and as they started the last of the light died out of the mist and left them in blank darkness End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of cock house at fellsgarth by talbert baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen rollitt makes a record for fellsgarth the modern seniors had slept on soundly that morning secure of their prey the military operations of the preceding evening although they resulted in the night of the besieged had not tended to the glory of the besiegers indeed when the door had at last been broken in and it was discovered that the birds had flown a titter had gone round at the expense of messrs clapperton dangle and brinkman which had been particularly riling to those gentlemen when in the morning the birds were found to have flown once more the position of the seniors became positively painful fullerton as usual did not salve the wound i should say not that it matters much to me that that scores another to the rebels said he how very naughty of them not to stay and be whopped to be sure the young cads growled clapperton who had the grace to be perfectly aware that he had been made ridiculous i don't envy them when i get hold of them no more do i said fullerton with their door off its hinges it will be very draughty do shut up why don't you go and join the enemy at once if you're so fond of them said dangle well said clapperton they will keep but we must have it out with corder now it's no use simply cutting him he'll have to be taught that he can't defy the house for nothing go and tell him to come brinkman but corder's back was against the wall literally and metaphorically to brinkman's demand almost the first voice he had heard speaking to him for a week he returned a curt refusal well i'll make you come said brinkman whereupon corder retreated behind his table and invited the interloper to begin to dodge round and round a study table after a nimble boy is not a very dignified operation for a prefect particularly when the object of his chase is a prefect too and brinkman presently abandoned the quest and went off breathing threatenings and slaughter for reinforcements so did corder less sensitive than his junior fellow martyrs he marched straight across to york's study the captain was away but in the adjoining room he found fisher major and denton poring over their endless accounts you too said corder your prefects you're wanted over on the other side to stop bullying who's being bullied i am i've been cut dead for a week i'm sick of it now they're going to lick me i take my chance against them one at a time but i can't tackle three of them is it for playing in the match yes that and going to the meeting nothing else i'd go to twenty a day if i had the chance to spite them who are bullying you clapperton brinkman and dangle of course i tell you what said denton we couldn't go over we've no authority but there's nothing to prevent you staying here and letting them fetch you then we can interfere 
all serene said corder i hope they will come i say i wish you'd let me wait here and hear you fellows talk i've not had a word spoken to me for a week i can tell you it's no joke i laughed at it at first and thought it would be nice rather than otherwise but after two days you chaps it gets to be decidedly slow you begin to wonder if it isn't worth caving in but that would be such a howling come down when all you've done is to do what you had a right to do or rather what you're bound to do play up for the school and jolly well you played too said usher it was a lucky turn you know i was so awfully glad to be in the fifteen and felt i could do anything of course the lucky thing was my getting past their forwards and then and then corder bunched into a delighted account of the never-to-be-forgotten match during which the cloud passed away from his face the light came back to his eyes and the spirit into his voice what business have they to stop me said he or bully me for it none and yorke when he hears of it will report it to the doctor no don't let him do that what's the use if i can stay here it's all right an hour later about the time that the young mountaineers were beginning to look out for their second wind on the lower slope dangle came across in a vicious temper he had not come to look for corder the sight of whom in the sanctuary of a classic study took him aback that's where you're sneaking is it said he i'm not surprised not much need to sneak from you it's three against one i object to said corder but if you like to fetch clapperton and brinkman over here we can have it out comfortably now you must think yourself uncommonly important if you suppose that we're going to trouble about an ass like you said dangle i never once thought of you what have you come for then said fisher hadn't you better wait till you're invited before you come where you're not wanted i've come on club business and i've a perfect right to come you fellows i hear have taken it into your heads to dissolve the club what of that why didn't you come and vote against it if you didn't like it thank you it wasn't quite good enough what i want to know is what is the treasurer going to do with the money i suppose that's hardly going to be treated as a perquisite for him fisher major looked troubled he had dreaded this awkward question for days for the lost money was still missing you know it's nothing of the kind what are you going to do with it then that's for the club to decide if you'd come to the meeting you could have proposed something it's funny how sore you are about that precious hole and corner meeting of yours how much is there on hand you'll know presently i dare say as soon as you've hit on a dodge for getting over that little deficiency of four or five pounds eh fisher major looked up in astonishment how had the fellow heard about that dangle laughed you thought it was a snug little secret of your own didn't you you're mistaken and you're mistaken if you think we aren't going to get at the bottom of it fisher major rose to his feet look here dangle said he do you mean to insinuate that i've taken the club money i never said so or that i was going to cook the account so that it should not be known i didn't mean you were whom did you mean me said denton no i didn't say anybody said dangle beginning to feel himself in a fix all i meant was we want to know what's become of the money you don't want to know more than i do said fisher major i'd have handed over the money days ago if i could only have found it do you suspect any one said dangle suspect no no one comes here that would be likely to take it you leave it about though i've noticed that myself who's your fag as honest a man as you every bit and that's saying a good deal for you retorted fisher major hotly keep your temper whose study is that next yours that's york's no on the other side that's rollitt's 
i suppose you're going to insinuate stop a bit said dangle suddenly turning to close the door before he proceeded when did you first miss the money you're uncommonly interested in the accounts said fisher if you want to know so much it was ten days ago i'm interested because i've an idea when did you get in the subscriptions they were all in a week before the first rendlesham match the match where you fisher major stopped dangle took no notice of the broken taunt and said look here fisher there's no love lost between you and me and it doesn't affect me or me for all that i don't care to see you or the clubs robbed without giving you a friendly hint you're very kind who is the culprit the doctor no rollitt stay said he waving down the interruption i shouldn't be fool enough to say it unless i was pretty sure tell me this fisher when you go out and leave money about do you lock your door no we don't have to do that this side did you ever see rollitt in here no do you know that on the first half holiday this term rollitt nearly came to grief on the river what on earth has that to do with it everything you heard of it your young brother was with him of course and you heard that he lost widow wisdom's boat over the falls yes said fisher suddenly beginning to see the drift of the cross-examination and you heard that the very next day he bought her a new one for five pounds yes i did but whatever right have you to connect that with the missing money wait a bit you were away all that afternoon weren't you yes i wasn't i happened to come over to look for you and found you were out the only fellow i met in the house was rollitt he just got back and i met him at the door of this room there you can make what you like of it even a classic knows what twice two makes and he turned on his heel and left the room there goes a thoroughbred cad for you said denton i don't know how we came to let him go without a kicking said fisher shall i call to him to come back asked corder of course said fisher major it is a curious coincidence about rollitt but i never thought of connecting the two things together before no it's utter guesswork on dangle's part if it comes to that said corder if dangle was over here that afternoon why shouldn't he have collared it as well as rollitt he has any amount of money he's not hard up like rollitt all i can say is said denton i wish that cad had kept his suspicions to himself the object of these suspicions meanwhile blissfully unconscious of the interest with which he was being remembered at fellsgarth was utilizing his holiday in the prosecution of his favorite sport this time he did not fish from a boat nor did he affect the upper stream he tried the lower reach and not very successfully for he had never been able to replace the tackle lost on the eventful afternoon when widow wisdom's boat had gone over the falls he had his fly-book still and had come across an old reel which fitted to a makeshift rod with common twine had to do duty until he could afford a regular new turnout it was better than nothing but the fish seemed somehow to get wind of the fact that they were not being treated with proper respect and refused to have more to do than they could help with a regular-looking apparatus rollitt put up with their unreasonableness for a long time that morning and afternoon with infinite patience he tried one fly after another and either bank in turn he gave them a chance of being hooked under the falls or right down on the flats by the lake but it was no go they wouldn't be tempted at last as it was growing dusk he became conscious that it had been raining fast for half an hour and that he was wet through he looked up and saw a grim pall of wet lying over the lake and all up the side of hawk's pike of which only the lower slope was distinguishable through the mist it was not a promising evening and rollitt now he came to think of it might as well go back to fellsgarth as stand about here 
so he collected his tackle and turned homeward his path from the lake brought him across the track which leads round to the back of the mountain and he was just turning in here when he heard what sounded like a halloo on the hillside it was probably only a shepherd calling his dog but he waited to make sure yes it was a shout but it sounded more like a sheep than a man rollitt shouted back a quick response came and presently out of the mist a shadowy form emerged running down the slope hopping over the boulders and making for the lane a minute more and wally presented himself hullo is that you rollitt i thought i was lost i say have you seen the others rollitt shook his head who i made sure they'd come down i say what a go if they're lost up there a night like this rollitt looked up at the dim mountain side and nodded again i thought i was on a path you know and hallooed to them they didn't hear so i went back for them and so we've missed who said rollitt do you know my young brother percy a modern kid he was one and all our lot you know darcy and ashby and fisher minor and fisher minor said rollitt suddenly becoming interested up there yes he's the lame horse of the party not up to it what's up i say rollitt had suddenly deposited his rod under the wall and quitting the path was beginning to strike up the base of the hill go and bring guides he growled you'll get lost to a dead certainty i say can't i come too said the boy looking very miserable no fetch guides come with them quick there were no guides to be had nearer than penchurch four miles off and wally very cold and wet and hungry and footsore with a big load on his heart as he thought of percy pulled himself together with an effort and stumped off rollitt strode on up the slope in the gathering night cold and weather mattered little to him still less did danger but fisher minor mattered very much for percy or any of the rest he might probably have stayed where he was but for the one boy in fellsgarth he oared about he would cheerfully go over a precipice every now and again he stood still and shouted but in the wind and rain it was impossible to say if any one heard him or called again after an hour or more he found himself on the first ridge where for a few yards the ground is level before it rises again here he called again once or twice once there came as he thought a faint distant whistle but by no manner of calling could he get it to come again he started off in the direction from which it seemed to come calling all the way but never a voice came out of the darkness for a couple of hours he doggedly haunted the place loath to leave it while a chance remained then he gave it up and started once more up the steep slope he looked at his watch by the light of a match it was eleven o'clock he shuddered but not with the cold and went on something who could say what told him that he must go higher yet once last year in company with wisdom he had been as far as the upper bog and had wanted to go to the top but wisdom had dissuaded him now even in the darkness the ground seemed familiar and he tramped on up the swampy steep till presently he found himself near the sound of rushing water at the foot of the great ravine the stream had grown so strong since the afternoon that to shout against it was more hopeless than ever yet rollitt shouted had a voice replied he felt sure he could have heard it but none did up the steep ravine he went finding the going easier than through the spongy swamps below about half way up just where the juniors ten hours ago had decided to turn back as he looked up he saw what seemed like clear sky through a frame in the mist was it clearing after all yes the higher he got the more the mist broke up into fleeting clouds which swept aside every few moments and let in a dim glimmer of moonlight on the scene at the top of the ravine he shouted again but all was still even the wind was dying down and the rain fell with a deadened sob at his feet three o'clock wisdom had told him the day they had been up there that the top was only three-quarters of an hour beyond where he stood something still cried excelsior within him 
and without halting longer than to satisfy himself by another shout he started on how he achieved that tremendous climb he could never say the clouds had rolled off and the moonlight lit up the rocks almost like day never once did he pull up or flag in his ascent he even ceased to shout presently there loomed before him gleaming in the moonlight the cairn for the first time in its annals a fellsgarth boy had got to the top of hawk's pike but so far from elation at the glory of the achievement rollitt uttered a groan of dismay when he looked round and found no one there after all that he would find fisher minor there he had never doubted and now all this had been time lost without waiting to heed the glorious moonlight prospect over lake and hill he turned almost savagely and scrambled down the crags it was perilous work more perilous than the scramble up but rollitt did not think of danger and therefore perhaps did not meet it in half an hour he was down on the bog and in an hour after just as a faint break in the east gave warning that the night was gone he stood bruised and panting at the foot of the gorge on the second ridge he was too dispirited to shout now it had not been given to him after all to rescue his friend he would have done better if he had never there was a big boulder just ahead poised almost miraculously on its edge on the sloping hillside it looked as if a moderate blast of wind would send it headlong to the bottom but it had stood there for centuries a shelter for sheep in winter from the snow and hail what made rollitt bound now in the direction of this rock like a man shot surely not to admire a natural curiosity or to seek shelter under its wing no he had found that his quest after all had not been in vain there curled up under the overhanging rock lying one almost across the other for warmth with cheek touching cheek and ashby's coat covering both were fisher minor and his chum not dead but sleeping soundly End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nineteen quarter strikes a blow for liberty the absence of the juniors had excited no curiosity in either house till evening it was a holiday and though the rule was that even on a holiday no boy should go out of touch as it was called that is beyond a certain radius without permission it was not always enforced the modern seniors had every reason to guess the object of this prolonged absence they had promised many things to the juniors when they caught them it was not surprising while things were as warm as they were that the young rebels should give fellsgarth a wide berth as to the classic juniors no one was surprised at anything they did in reason but when callover came and all nine names were returned absent in addition to that of rollitt and a few other habitual vagrants fellows began to ask where they were has any one seen wally asked york who had just had the unusual experience of making his own tea and cooking his own eggs he's probably fooling about somewhere out of bounds with my fag said ranger he'll have to catch it fisher though he is your brother let him have it said fisher i'd do the same to your young brother if i had a chance but to change the subject i've something to tell you fellows that's rather awkward that money hasn't turned up yet that is awkward said york i wish i could help you out with it but i'm cleaned out oh that's not it of course i'm responsible and must get the governor to make it good dear old governor he'll do it but he'll pull a precious long face and go round the house lowering the gas and telling every one he must economize with two such expensive sons as me and my minor at school 
it's not that though dangle came over this morning and wanted to know what we were going to do about the accounts now we've dissolved the clubs and somehow or other he's heard of the deficiency and wants to know all about it i hope you told him said yorke of course i did but he told me a lot more than i could tell him he thinks he knows what's become of it and fisher proceeded to narrate dangle's suspicions against rollitt the captain's face grew very long as the story went on then he said i hope to goodness there's nothing in it is it a fact about widow wisdom's boat yes my young brother was with rollitt that day and told me about it as a secret but as it's out now there's no good keeping it dangle has a spite against rollitt if any one else had told you this there might have been something in it and if it had been any one but rollitt bought the boat it would have been nothing but he's so frightfully poor he'd no time to write home even if he could have got money from there and there was no one here he could borrow of why he must have gone off very first thing in the morning and bought the boat and are you quite certain you had all the money collected by that saturday asked yorke yes and what's more i'm almost certain i counted it and made it come right that's the last time it has come right the captain drummed his fingers on the table and looked very miserable i wish fisher said he i hadn't advised you to take that treasurership if we could only be quite sure there wasn't some mistake in the accounts it would be different it would be a frightful thing to suspect rollitt unless it was absolutely certain you're welcome to round on me said fisher looking quite as miserable as his chief i was a fool to take your advice i'd much sooner make the money up myself and not say a word about it to any one you can't do that now you may be sure dangle won't let it drop what shall you do asked ranger what would you do said yorke testily isn't it bad enough to be in a fix like this without being asked hopeless questions i'm sorry old man i've lost my temper and as it's not come back i vote we say no more on the subject at present the evening wore on and still the truants did not return at ten o'clock york reported their absence to mr wakefield and mr wakefield reported it to the headmaster a similar report reached him from the matron of mr forder's house with regard to the missing ones there and presently further report was made that rollitt was not in the school no one could give any account of their probable whereabouts rollitt had been seen going out with a rod early in the day and but no one had seen any of the juniors since last night when they had prematurely gone to bed in their own dormitory a consultation was held in which all sorts of conjectures were put forward the most plausible of which was that the juniors had organized an expedition to sea strand a fashionable watering-place an hour distant on the railway which both wally and lickford had separately been heard to express a desire to visit it seemed probable that they had lost the last train back and would literally not come home till morning in which case warm things were promised to be ready for my gentlemen as to rollitt his vagaries were consistent with any explanation he may have gone to penchurch in mistake for fellsgarth and curled himself up in the church porch mistaking it for his bed in any case the general impression was that nothing could be done till morning and that the juniors at least were making themselves pretty comfortable wherever they might be still fisher major felt a vague uneasiness had he been quite sure his brother was in the capable company of his fellow fags he would have been comparatively comfortable but the possibility of the feckless youngster wandering about benighted somewhere on his own account added a new weight to the burden which already lay on the spirit of the luckless treasurer of the school clubs i've a good mind to turn out and look for my miner said he to denton what could you do he's all right you couldn't do anything in the dark and on a night like this 
i'm game to turn out any hour you like in the morning if he's not come by then i bet you the four young scamps will all stroll in for call-over and wonder whatever the fuss was about there was nothing to be done and fisher lay awake all night listening to every sound and reproaching himself over and over again as one will do when everything goes wrong that he had made such a mess of everything this term about daybreak there came a ring at the school bell and half the school jumped to its feet fisher was down on the green among the first in slippers and ulster five shivering youngsters were standing inside the gate with dripping garments and chattering teeth and white faces d'arcy lickford ramshaw cottle and cash but no fisher minor where's my minor asked the senior what hasn't he turned up said d'arcy haven't wally and percy and ashby turned up we got lost on hawk's pike i'm awfully hungry i say no one's turned up do you mean to say he's out on the hill a night like this he was behind he and ashby he was a lame duck you know the others were in front were they together who young fisher minor and ashby i don't think so ashby yelled to see if we knew where he was and must have gone to look for him we made sure they'd be back long ago didn't we you chaps here the doctor and several of the prefects came on the scene the truants were ordered to the hot bath and bed at once and a council was held as to what should be done fisher major did not wait to take part in it he rushed to his room flung on his clothes and boots and started off accompanied by denton at full speed in the direction of the mountain neither spoke a word as they passed widow wisdom's denton darted in have your fire alight and some food ready some of our youngsters have been all night on the mountain we're going to look for them half way to the lake they were pulled up by a shout from across the stream it was percy wheatfield dead beat sitting on a log as white and miserable as a ghost i say have you chaps seen wally he called no we're off to look some of them have turned up can you get as far as widow wisdom's there's a roaring fire and some grub waiting there we'll see after wally percy staggered to his feet he had been wandering he could not say where all night the very mention of the words fire and food revived him get up to the school as soon as you can and get to bed you can't be any use looking for the rest there's plenty of us to do that good-bye it was half-past seven when they reached the lake and turned up the mountain path the mist had vanished and the late autumn sun was shining brightly on the hillside the distant barking of a dog above apprised them that some one was abroad already and the hopes of the searchers rose within them as they struck up the steep slope halfway up they stood and shouted but no reply came except the faraway barking of the shepherd's dogs we shall be able to see a good way all round when we get on to the ridge said denton almost as he spoke a shout close by startled them looking up they perceived emerging from behind some boulders a little procession fisher major's blood ran cold as he saw it for at the head stalked a stalwart guide who carried in his arms one small boy while in the rear followed a form which they recognized as rollitt's carrying on his back another between the two tramped a third junior hanging on to the arm of another guide what terrified fisher major more than anything was to see that the head of the boy on rollitt's back had fallen helplessly forward on the shoulder of his porter with a groan the elder brother bounded to the spot the history of years flashed through his mind as he did so he saw the people at home and heard their voices he seemed to be in the nursery hectoring it as big brothers will among the little ones amongst whom was a little boy with curly hair and a shrill piping voice he called to mind the first night of this term and the vision of his young brother breaking down with his new boy troubles next morning all this and more 
fleeted through his mind as he bounded to where rollitt stood hush said the latter almost gruffly asleep so he was it had scarcely roused him when rollitt had picked him up two hours ago from his roost under the rocking-stone and having once been perched on his preserver's back his head fell forward again and there it had lain ever since how rollitt had carried him so far resting only now and then and that in a way not to disturb his burden only those who knew the huge strength of the fellsgarth giant could understand hello said wally greeting the newcomers in a limp sleepy way have you seen my young brother percy he was yes percy's all right so are all the rest i'm all right sang out ashby from the front this chap wanted to carry me so i let him jolly glad you were to get the lift said wally you new kids oughtn't to have come twenty-four hours on the hills is nothing when you get used to here wally who had had twenty-six hours suddenly collapsed and tumbled over from sheer fatigue on the grass fisher and denton made a chair of their hands for him and so the procession went on a cart was in waiting at the foot of the slope filled with warm wraps and other restoratives and in less than two hours the whole party was safe inside the walls of fellsgarth hot baths blankets food and a little physic succeeded in a very few days in restoring the invalided truants to their sorrowing classmates fisher minor was the only member of the party about whom any serious uneasiness existed and he thanks to a wiry constitution and a rooted dislike to do what nobody else did got off with a bad cold which detained him in his house for a fortnight rollitt as might have been expected vanished to his own quarters as soon as he had deposited his precious burden into mr wakefield's charge no one heard of his having been to the top to fisher's thanks he returned a grumpy not at all and the curious inquiries of others he met by shutting his door and saying get out to any one who entered as might be expected also the martin seniors were balked after all of their promised vengeance on the rebels on the contrary while the fags were making merry on chicken and toasting their toes at the roaring fire in the sanatorium clapperton brinkman and dangle were hauled up into the presence of the headmaster and there seriously reprimanded for the damage done to one of the doors in mr forder's house and cautioned not to let such a breach of discipline happen again under a pain of severer penalties if you are unable to keep order in your own house said the doctor cuttingly your duty is to report the matter to me and i will deal with it remember that another time this incident did not tend to smooth the ruffled plumes of the discomfited heroes still less did another little rebuff which happened a few days later corder had taken advantage of the general excitement attending the escapade of the juniors to return to his own quarters and attempt once more to resume the privileges of ordinary civilized life he only partially succeeded two or three boys among whom was fullerton who were getting sick of the present state of affairs and longing for football once more had begun seriously to doubt what advantage was coming to themselves or any one else by the strike among these corder found a temporary shelter but the authority of the seniors still controlled the general public opinion of the house and the life of the boycotted boy was still only half tolerable at the first attempt at violence however corder walked across to his classic allies and took up his quarters in their study where he remained all day at bedtime he declined to return to his own house particularly when a summons to that effect was sent across by 
clapperton who by this time had a very good idea of the rebels whereabouts i'm not going over said corder but you can't stay here all night said denton what shall you do turn me out asked the fugitive no but you'd better go if you don't like the look of things out there you'd better speak to forder no i'd sooner stop said corder doggedly i'm sorry to put you fellows about after you being so kind but i'm not going over there yorke was consulted and took upon himself the responsibility of detaining the refugee for the night all right thanks said corder and turned in next morning word came from mr forder requiring that the truant should answer for his absence corder obeyed with some misgivings and explained briefly that he had been bullied and did not want to stand it mr forder who had a peculiar faculty for saddling the wrong horse was not satisfied with this explanation and chose to suspect some other corder had never been a satisfactory boy he had probably been making himself objectionable and had been glad of an excuse to break rules the master did not demand particulars he gave the culprit an imposition and ordered him to obey the rules of his house and another time if he had any grievance to come with it to him instead of taking the law into his own hands whereupon corder departed in high dudgeon it was no use holding out now he had better give in and own himself beaten it would be so much easier than resisting any longer for an hour or two he was permitted to go in and out unmolested but after morning school he was going out to solace himself with some solitary kicks at the football when just on the steps of the house brinkman pounced upon him i've got you now have i you cad said he you just come back with me i won't let go cried corder in a temporary panic wriggling himself away and escaping a few yards brinkman however was quickly after him determined this time to hold him fast corder though a senior was a small boy and had never before thought of pitting himself against the modern bully but once already this term he had come suddenly to realize that he could do better than he gave himself credit for and now that matter seemed desperate when there was no escape and his fate stared him in the face it occurred to corder he would show fight he had right on his side he had done no harm to brinkman or anybody else why shouldn't he let out and stand up for himself so to brinkman's utter amazement he was met by a blow and a defiant challenge to come on what brinkman might have done is doubtful but at that moment york and ranger strolled by hello what's this a fight said the captain rather said corder now thoroughly strung up to the point i say york will you stop and see fair play the captain hesitated a moment any other fight he would have felt it his duty to stop this fight seemed to be an exception it would probably do more good than harm yes if you like said he i'm not going to fight a little beggar like that said brinkman yes you are said ranger and i'll see fair play for you i promise you i'll make it so hot for him that he'll be sorry for it i don't care said corder if you don't fight you're a coward there at this point dangle came out here your man wants a second said ranger you'll suit him better than i the usual crowd collected minus the junior faction and who complained bitterly for a year after that they had been deliberately done out of being present by the malice of the principals one result of their absence was that the proceedings were comparatively quiet every one present knew what the quarrel was and not a few for their own sakes hoped corder would make a good fight of it dangle sneered at the whole thing and counselled his man audibly not to be too hard on the little fool 
his advice was not wanted corder for a fellow of his make and inexperience exhibited good form and persistently walked his man round the ring dodging his blows and getting in a knock for himself every now and then brinkman soon dropped the disdainful style in which he commenced proceedings and became proportionately wild and unsteady now's your chance young un he's lost his temper whispered the captain whereupon corder hardly knowing how he managed it danced his man once more round and round till he was out of breath and then slipped in with a right left left right which though they made up hardly one good blow among them were so well planted and followed one another so rapidly that brinkman lost his balance under them and fell sprawling on the ground at the same moment mr stratton came up and the crowd dispersed as if by magic what is this said the master appealing to the captain a fight sir said yorke a necessary one between corder and brinkman come and tell me about it yorke so while corder amid the jubilations of his supporters who had grown twentyfold since the beginning of the fight was being escorted to his quarters and brinkman crestfallen and bewildered was being left by his disgusted backers to help himself yorke strolled on with mr stratton and gave him as well as he could an account of the circumstances which for weeks had been leading up to this climax i think it was as well to allow it said the master but there must be no more of it you have a hard task before you to pull things together yorke but it will be work well done was it the right thing to dissolve the club sir asked yorke at the time yes but watch your chance of reviving them you must have some common interest on foot to bring the two sides together the captain walked back to his house in a brown study he had half hoped mr stratton might offer to interpose and restore the harmony of the school but no the master had left it to the captain and york's courage rose within him god helping him he would pull fellsgarth together before he left on the green he met fullerton it was long since the modern and classic seniors had nodded as they passed but in the curious perversity of things both did so now there's been a fight i hear said fullerton yes brinkman and corder corder had the best of it i'm jolly glad corder's got more pluck than you'd give him credit for yes he's had a rough time of it in your house so he has poor beggar it's rather humiliating to wait till he has licked his man before one takes his side but upon my word i'm as sick of it all as he is it is rather rough on fellows who aren't allowed to do what they've a right to do said yorke i say have you anything special on after afternoon school no why only that i wish you'd come and have tea with me fullerton laughed bribery and corruption said he anyhow i'll come End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of cock house at fellsgarth by talbot baines reed this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty fama volat the modern seniors had certainly experienced a run of bad luck since the inauguration of the strike which was to have brought their rivals down on their knees and secured for the modern side a supremacy in fellsgarth the second rendlesham match the defection of corder the mutiny of the juniors the disbanding of the clubs the row with the headmaster and finally the defeat of brinkman by his own victim might be held to be enough to chasten their spirits and induce them to ask themselves whether the game was worth the candle but such is the infatuation of wrong-headedness they still breathed vengeance on some one and this time their victim was to be rollitt 
the grudge against him had been steadily accumulating during the term his outrage on the gentle dangle was yet to be atoned for his crime of playing in the fifteen was yet unappeased his contempt of the whole crew of his enemies was not to be pardoned even his rescue of the lost juniors told against him for it had helped to turn the public feeling of the school in favour of those recalcitrant young rebels so far there had been no getting at him he would not quarrel he would not even recognise the existence of any one he did not care for but now a chance had come the more they discussed it the more morally certain was it that he was answerable for the disappearance of the money from the club funds the very reluctance of his own house to take action in the matter showed that they at least appreciated the gravity of the suspicion it was a trump card for the moderns by pushing it now they would be doing a service to the school they would pose as the champions of honesty they would be mortifying the classics even while they pretended to assist them and above all they would wipe out scores with rollitt himself in a way he could not well disregard clapperton and dangle were not superlatively clever boys but whether by chance or design they certainly hit upon an admirable method for bringing the matter to a crisis dangle took upon himself to confide his suspicions as a dead and terrible secret to wilcox a middle boy of forder's house and notorious as the most prolific gossip in fellsgarth who moreover was known to have several talking acquaintances in the other houses wilcox received dangle's communication with astonishment and oh of course he wouldn't breathe the word of it to any one not for the world it was a bad business but it was fisher major's business to see it put right and so on that night as wilcox and his friend underwood were retiring to rest under the deadliest pledge of secrecy that there was a scandal going on about the school accounts he mightn't say more except that the fellow suspected was one of the last he himself should have dreamt of although others might be less surprised that was not all next morning he sat next to calder a classic boy in hall and asked him if he could keep a secret oh yes calder could keep any amount of secrets then wilcox told him the same story that he had confided to underwood only adding that the amount in question was said to be several pounds calder hazarded the names of several boys but wilcox shrugged his shoulders at them all you'd better not ask me he said it will only get out and make trouble oh but i promise i wouldn't tell a soul said calder i can't tell you though but i'll tell you this you'd never guess the fellow had had as much in his pocket all his life what do you mean rollitt i can't tell you i say i'm not at liberty to mention names the rumour thus admirably started went on merrily before nightfall it was known in half a dozen modern studies that the club funds had been robbed of ten pounds or twelve pounds by a classic boy and that he was being shielded by his own seniors on the classic side four or five fellows whispered to one another that rollitt had been caught in the act of stealing money out of fisher major's rooms a day or two ago presently one enterprising gossip sent the story of widow wisdom's boat rolling in and out with the rumour of the stolen money encouraged by that some one else hinted that there had been deficiencies last term as well as this and in and out with the new story was started the report that last term while it had set up with a fishing tackle and book of flies worth ever so much a couple of days later the number of boys in the secret had multiplied fast and rollitt as he walked across the green to hall or class was watched and pointed out mysteriously by a score or more of curious boys of course the story grew to all sorts of curious shapes percy who was the first of the invalided juniors to appear in his usual haunts had it from ricks who had had it from banks 
who had had it from underwood who had had it from wilcox who had had it from dangle who had been present on the occasion that rollitt had met the headmaster in a lane near widow wisdom's and holding a pistol at his head had made him turn out all his pockets and relieved him of fifty pounds percy said he didn't believe it whereupon rix reduced the amount to thirty pounds percy still could not accept the story whereat rix anxious to meet his friend as far as possible substituted a walking-stick for the pistol still percy's gullet could not swallow even what was left whereupon rix suggested that it was open to doubt whether it was the doctor who was robbed or fisher major it might have been the latter still percy looked sceptical which called forth an explanation that rix did not mean to say that dangle actually witnessed the occurrence but that he knew it for a fact all the same percy shook his head still and rix feeling much injured laid the scene of the outrage in fisher's study and conceded that the money might belong to the clubs and might be only five pounds percy had the temerity once more to express doubt whereupon rix flatly declined to come down another penny in the amount or alter his story one iota with one possible exception that the money may have been taken when fisher major was not in his room percy considered the anecdote had been boiled down sufficiently for human conception and grieved rix prodigiously by saying that he knew all about it weeks ago and what did he mean by coming and telling him his wretched second-hand stories however whatever variations the rumour underwent as it passed from hand to hand it managed to retain its three most salient points all through namely that fisher major had been robbed that the money taken belonged to the club and that the suspected thief was rollitt for a week or two rollitt remained profoundly ignorant of the charges against him his unapproachable attitude was the despair both of friend and enemy yorke who would have given anything to let him have an opportunity of denying or explaining the charge was at his wit's end how to get at him dangle on the contrary who was chiefly interested in the penalties in store for the thief was equally at a loss how to bring him to bay he would see no one he shut himself in his study and fastened the door in class and hall he was practically deaf and dumb and in his solitary walks by the river it was as much as any one's comfort for the whole term was worth to accost him by one of those strange coincidences which often bring the most unlikely persons into sympathy york and dangle each decided to write what they hesitated to say york had endless difficulty over his letter he could not bring himself to believe rollitt a thief yet he could not deny that suspicions existed still less could he evade his duty as captain to see things right the latter duty he might have put off on mr wakefield or the doctor but the mere reporting to them of the circumstances would fix the suspicions on rollitt more pointedly than they were already and certainly more pointedly than york wished them to be dear rollitt he wrote i hope you will not resent my writing to tell you of a rumour which is afloat very injurious to you and one which i feel quite sure you can dispose of at once i would not write about it only i am very anxious for the sake of everybody you should deny it and so shut up others who would be glad enough if it were true a sum of money about four pounds ten shillings belonging to the club funds has been lost from fisher major's room the rumour is that you have taken it and those who accuse you make much of the coincidence that about the time when the money was said to be lost you spent a similar sum in the purchase of a new boat for widow wisdom if i didn't feel quite sure you would be able to deny the charge and explain anything about it that seems suspicious i should not have cared to write this yours truly c york 
dangle's letter was less ingenuous the secretary of the fellsgarth clubs has been requested to ask rollitt the following questions in reference to a sum of about four pounds ten shillings missing from the funds in the treasurer's hands one is it true that rollitt was seen at the door of fisher major's room on saturday afternoon september twenty one at a time when everybody else was absent from the house two is it true that immediately afterwards rollitt paid five pounds for a new boat for widow wisdom three where did that money come from four does rollitt know that he is suspected by every boy in fellsgarth of having stolen it and that now that the clubs are dissolved the treasurer will be called upon to refund the money five what is rollitt going to do does he deny it if not will he take the consequences signed for the club committee t dangle secretary fisher minor the only boy to whom a missive to the school hermit might safely be entrusted was on his way to rollitt's study with the captain's note in his hand when he was met on the stairs by cash what cheer kid said the latter where are you off to taking a letter to rollitt said fisher minor that's just what i am from dangle i say you may as well give him the two no answer ta-ta and he thrust his missive into fisher's hands it was just as easy to hand rollitt two letters as one so fisher proceeded on his errand rollitt was writing a letter which he hurriedly put aside when the messenger entered get out he said looking up but when he saw who the intruder was his tone relaxed a little fisher minor better yes thanks i had a cold but that was all i say rollitt you were an awful brick helping us down that night nonsense said rollitt pulling out his paper and going on writing here are two letters for you said the boy rollitt motioned him gruffly to lay them down on the table and depart which he did gladly rollitt went on writing it may be no breach of confidence if we allow the reader to glance over his shoulder dear mother you ask me if i am happy and how i like school i am not happy and i hate fellsgarth nobody cares about me it's no use my trying to be what i am not i am not a gentleman and i hope i never shall be if the fellows here are specimens just because i am poor they have nothing to do with me i don't complain of that i prefer it i'd much sooner be working for my living like father than wasting my time at a place like this if those ladies would give the money they spend on keeping me here to you and father it would do much more good there is only one boy i care about here and he is a little fellow who was kind to me of his own accord and doesn't fight shy of me because i've no money and live on charity i would ever so much rather come and live at home at the end of this term it would be even worse at oxford than it is here and the ladies if they want to be kind will let me leave i know you and father want me to become a grand gentleman i would a hundred times rather be what i really am and live at home with you your loving son alfred this dismal letter concluded the writer produced his books and began work heedless of the two letters on his table which lay all day where fisher minor had deposited them he went in and out to class and those who watched him saw no signs of trouble in his demeanour in the afternoon he stole up to the river with his rod and any one who had seen him land his three-pounder and leave it as he left all his fish at widow wisdom's cottage would have been puzzled by his indifferent air that evening as he was about to go to bed he discovered the letters dangle's letter which he opened first he scarcely seemed to heed the sight of the name at foot was sufficient he crumbled it up and tossed it in the corner but yorke's aroused him he read it through once or twice and his face grew grim as he did so presently he went to the corner and picked up dangle's letter and once more read it then he crumpled up both together and instead of going to bed sat in his chair and looked at the wall straight in front of him the next day those who watched him saw him go into school and out as usual except that he seemed less listless and more observant 
he glanced aside now and then at the groups of boys who stood and looked after him and his face had a cloud on it which was almost thunderous did you give my letter to rollitt said yorke to fisher minor yes yesterday and one from dangle too said the junior dangle said the captain to himself he'll think we are in collusion why ever didn't i leave it alone he felt thus still more when later on in the day dangle came over i hear you have written to rollitt for an explanation it was about time what does he reply yorke's back went up at the dictatorial tone of the inquiry if there is anything to tell you you will hear said he that means he hasn't replied i suppose i have taken care that he shall reply i have told forder all about it you've told forder you cad exclaimed yorke in a tone which made dangle thankful he was near the door yes snarled he it may be your interest to shield a thief but it's not in the interest of fellsgarth you won't take the matter up forder will i've told him you know about it and will give him all the particulars hope you'll enjoy it and he disappeared only just in time for his own comfort yorke's rage was unbounded of all the masters mr forder was the one he would least have chosen to take up an affair of this kind he was harsh unsympathetic hasty and of all persons to prime the master in the circumstances of the case dangle was the least to be trusted his temptation was to go at once to rollitt and force the matter to a conclusion before mr forder had time to interfere things were going from bad to worse would they never come right again next morning before he could decide what to do a message came from mr forder requesting him and his fellow prefects to come across to the master's room in no amiable frame of mind they obeyed as they expected clapperton brinkman dangle and fullerton were also present this is a most serious case said mr forder yorke i understand you know more about it than any one will you kindly say all you know i know nothing said the captain except that i believe the story is groundless that is unsatisfactory in a matter like this there must be nothing like sheltering the wrongdoer it's because we were afraid of that sir said clapperton that we thought it right to tell you about it of course fisher major perhaps you will tell us about the missing money fisher major briefly related his loss and the efforts he had made to discover it and what are your grounds for suspecting rollitt i don't suspect him sir or rather i should not if it were not for what dangle has said about him thereupon dangle was called upon to repeat his accusation it seems to me said the master we require two important witnesses to make the case clear i believe mrs wisdom is in the house at present will you inquire fullerton and if so tell her to come here and will you fisher major fetch your brother after a painful delay in which the rival seniors sat glaring at one another and the master made notes of the evidence so far the two witnesses were forthcoming widow wisdom had nothing to say except in praise of master rollitt and was glad enough in support of it to relate the incident of the boat and even produce the receipt which she carried about like a talisman in her pocket she had no idea that her glowing testimony would be used against her favourite or she would have bitten off her tongue sooner than give it as for fisher minor confused and abashed in the presence of so many seniors he blundered out his story of the eventful half-holiday looking in vain towards his brother to ascertain if he was doing well or ill he blabbed all he knew about rollitt the condition of his study the nature of his solitary walks the poverty of his possessions everything that could possibly confirm the suspicions against him and forgot to mention anything which might in the least avail on the other side at the close of the court-martial mr forder summed up i am afraid it is a very clear case said he it is very painful to think that a fellsgarth boy should come to such a pass the matter must be reported to the headmaster but before doing so it would be fair to see rollitt and hear what he has to say we have no right to condemn any one unheard if he is innocent it will be easy for him to prove it fisher major will you tell him to come fisher major reluctantly obeyed it was nearly half an hour before he returned and then he came alone i cannot find rollitt sir he is not in the house he was absent from morning call over and the housekeeper says he was not in his room this morning 
and that his bed was not slept in last night End of chapter twenty